Preface of Elsie's Motherhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Allison H. Elsie's Motherhood by Martha Finley. Preface. In compliance with the expressed desire of many of Elsie's friends and admirers, the story of her life is continued in this, the fifth volume of the series. When about to undertake its preparation, the suggestion was made to the author that to bring in the doings of the Ku Klux would add interest to the story, and at the same time give a truer picture of life in the South during the years 1867-68, through 68, in which its events take place. The published reports of the Congressional Committee of Investigation were resorted to as the most reliable source of information, diligently examined, and care taken not to go beyond the facts there given as regards the proceedings of the clan, the clemency and paternal acts of the government, or the kindly fraternal feelings and deeds of the people of the North toward their impoverished and suffering brethren of the South. These things have become matters of history. Vice and crime should be condemned wherever found, and naught has been set down in malice, for the author has a warm love for the South as part and parcel of the dear land of her birth. May this child of her brain give pain to none, but prove pleasant and profitable to all who peruse its pages, and especially helpful to young parents. M. F. End of Preface Recording by Allison H. Chapter One of Elsie's Motherhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Elsie's Motherhood by Martha Finley. Chapter First. Meantime, a smiling offspring rises round, and mingles both their graces. By degrees, the human blossom blows, and every day soft as it rolls along shows some new charm the father's luster and the mother's bloom thompson's seasons mamma papa too it was a glad shout of a chorus of young voices as four pairs of little feet came pattering up the avenue into the veranda then as many ruby lips were held up for the morning kiss from the children's dearly loved father they had already had their half hour with mamma, which made so sweet a beginning of each day. Yet she too must have a liberal share of the eagerly bestowed caresses, while Bruno, a great Newfoundland pet, playfellow, and guardian of the little flock, testified his delight in the scene by leaping about among them, fawning upon one another, and wagging his tail, and uttering again and again a short, joyous bark then followed a merry romp cut short by the ringing of the breakfast bell when all trooped into the house harold riding on papa's shoulder mamma following with elsie eddie and vi while dina and baby herbert in her arms brought up the rear the children had been very gay full of laughter and sweet innocent prattle but a sudden hush fell among them when seated about the table in the bright cheerful breakfast parlor little hands were meekly folded and each young head bent reverently over the plate while in a few simple words which all could understand their father gave god thanks for their food and asked his blessing upon it the inn children were never rude even in their play and their table manners were almost perfect made the constant companions of cultivated refined parents whose politeness springing from genuine unselfishness was never laid aside but shone on all occasions into the rich and poor old and young alike and governed with a wise mixture of indulgence and restraint mildness and firmness they imitated the copies set before them and were seldom other than gentle and amiable in their deportment not only toward their superiors but to equals and inferiors also they were never told that children should be seen and not heard but when no guests were present were allowed to talk in moderation a gentle word or look of reproof from mamma or papa being quite sufficient to check any tendency to boisterousness or undue loquacity i think we should celebrate this anniversary elsie remarked mr travilla stirring his coffee and gazing with fond admiration to the sweet face at the opposite end of the table yes sir 
though we are rather late in thinking of it she answered smilingly the rose deepening slightly on her cheek as delicately rounded and tinted as it had been ten years ago little elsie looked up inquiringly what is it papa i do not remember do you not ten years ago to-day there was a grand wedding at the oaks and your mamma and i were there i too asked eddie yes course eddie spoke up five-year-old violet grandpa would invite you and all of us and i believe i remember a little about it me too piped in the baby voice of harold me sat on papa's knee there was a general laugh and the two little prowlers joined in right merrily i really don't remember that part of it harold said papa while we elsie as she was often called by way of distinguishing her from mamma for whom she was named shook her curly head at him with a merry oh you dear little rogue you don't know what you're talking about and mamma remarked vi has perhaps a slight recollection of may allison's wedding but this one at the oaks must have been before i was born said elsie because you said it was ten years ago and i am only nine. Oh, mamma was it your wedding yes daughter shall we invite our friends for this evening edward yes wife suppose we make it a family party inviting only relatives connections and very intimate friends after a little more discussion it was decided that they would do so also that the children should have a full holiday and while their mother was giving orders and overseeing the necessary preparations for the entertainment papa should take them all in the roomy family carriage and drive over to the oaks roselands ashlands and pine grove to give the invitations beside these near friends only the minister and his wife were to be asked but as adelaide and her family were at this time paying a visit to roselands and lucy ross was doing the same at her old home all the younger generations except the mere babies were to be included in the invitation should all accept it would be by no means a small assemblage early hours were named for the sake of the little ones guests to come at six refreshments to be served at eight and the ian children if each would take a nap in the afternoon would be allowed to stay up till nine how delighted they were how the little eyes danced and sparkled and how eagerly they engaged to fulfill the conditions and not to fret or look cross when summoned at nine to leave the drawing-room and to be put to bed oh mamma won't you wear your wedding dress cried little elsie do dear mamma so that we all may see just how you looked when you are married elsie smiled you forget daughter that i am ten years older now and the face cannot be quite the same the years have robbed it of none of its beauty said mr travilla ah love is blind she returned with a blush and a smile as charming as those of her girlhood days and the dress is quite out of date no matter for that it would gratify me as well as the children to see you in it then it shall be worn if it fits or can be altered in season veil and all mamma pleaded elsie it's so beautiful mammy showed it to me only the other day and told me you look so so lovely and she will put the orange blossoms in your hair and on your dress as they were that night for she remembers all about it the children ready dressed for the drive were gathered in a merry group on the veranda eddie astride of bruno waiting for papa and the carriage when a horse came cantering up the avenue and mr horace dinsmore alighted and stepped into their midst oh grandpa what you turn for cried harold in a tone of disappointment we was dust doin to a light ye indeed yes grandpa it's an anniversary to-day explained vi and mamma's going to be married over again said eddie no no only to have a party and wear her wedding dress corrected elsie papa good morning cried their mother coming swiftly through the hall i'm so glad always so glad to see you i know it he said pressing a fatherly kiss on the sweet lips 
then holding her off for an instant to gaze fondly into the fair face and it is ten years to-day since i gave travilla a share in my treasure i was thinking of it as i rode over that you should celebrate this anniversary at your father's house no no dinsmore you must be our guest said travilla coming out and shaking hands cordially with his old friend we have it all arranged a family gathering and elsie to gratify us by wearing her bridal robes do you not agree with me that she would make as lovely a bride to-day as she did ten years ago quite i relinquish my plans for yours and don't let me detain you from these eager children i thank you i will go then as the invitations will be late enough with all the haste we can make the carriage was at the door, and in a trice, Grandpa and Papa had helped the little ones in. Not even baby Herbert was left behind, but seated on Mammy's lap, crowed and laughed merrily as the rest. Ah, Mamma, you come too, pleaded the voices, as their father took his place beside them. Can't Mammy and Aunt Dicey and the rest know what to do without you to tell them? Not this time, dears and you know i must make haste to try on the dress and see if it fits oh yes mamma and throwing a shower of kisses they drove off a carriage load of precious jewels elsie said looking after it as it rolled away how the ten years have added to my wealth papa she stood by his side her hand on his arm and the soft sweet eyes lifted to his were full of a content and gladness beyond the power of words to express i thank god every day for my darling's happiness he said low and tenderly and softly smoothing her shining hair ah it is very great and my father's dear love forms no small part of it but come in papa i want to consult you about one or two little matters edward and i rely very much upon your taste and judgment to rosalind's first was mr travilla's order to the coachman the old home of the dinsmores though shown the glory of its grand old trees was again a beautiful place the new house was in every respect a finer one than of its predecessor of a higher style of that architecture more conveniently arranged more tastefully and handsomely furnished lawns gardens and fields had become neat and trim in the days before the war and a double row of young thrifty trees bordered the avenue old mr dinsmore now resided there and gave a home to his two widowed and impoverished daughters mrs louise conley and mrs edna johnson and their families these two aunts loved elsie no better than in earlier years it was gall and wormwood to them to know that they owed all these comforts to her generosity nor could they forgive her that she was more wealthy beautiful lovely and beloved than themselves edna was the more bitter and outspoken of the two but even louise seldom treated her niece to anything better than the most distant and frigid politeness in a truly christian spirit elsie returned them pity and compassion because of their widowhood and straitened circumstances invited them to her house and when they came received them with kindness and cordiality her father had grown very fond of her and her children was often at ian and for his sake she occasionally visited roselands adelaide's presence had drawn her there more frequently of late the invitation mr travilla carried was to the grandfather three aunts and their children adelaide and edna were in the drawing-room when the ian carriage drew up at the door there is travilla the old scalawag how i hate him elsie too i presume exclaimed the latter glancing from the window i'll leave you to entertain them and she hastily left the room adelaide flashed an indignant look after her and hurried out to meet and welcome the callers mr travilla had alighted and was coming up the steps of the veranda how do you do i am very glad to see you cried adelaide extending her hand but where is elsie left at home for once he answered gaily but i come this morning merely 
as her ladyship's messenger but won't you come in you and your children thanks no if you will permit me just to deliver my message and go for i am in haste mrs allison accepted the invitation for herself and the children with evident pleasure engaged that her sisters would do the same then went to the carriage window for a moment's chat with the little ones each of whom held a large place in her warm heart aunt addie said elsie in an undertone mamma's going to wear her wedding dress tonight veil and all is she why that's an excellent idea but don't tell any one else that you go it will be such a nice surprise to the rest if we can keep it a secret that was a good suggestion of aunt addie's mr travilla remarked as they drove down the avenue suppose we carry it out how many of you can refrain from telling what mamma is to wear to-night how many can i trust to keep a secret all of us papa me papa me i won't tell cried the little voices in chorus yes i believe i can trust you all he answered in his bright cheery way now on to oaks solon and then to pinegrove springbrook and ashlands that will be the last place children as our hurry will then be over you shall get out of the carriage and have a little time to rest before we start home re-entering the house mrs allison went to the family sitting-room where she found both her sisters and several of the younger members of the household so they have asked for us exclaimed louise in a tone of vexation at such an unreasonable hour too well with a sigh of resignation i suppose we must show ourselves or papa will be displeased so wonderfully fond of elsie he has grown of late as well he may returned adelaide pointedly but elsie is not here nor has any one inquired for you no i presume not interrupted edna with a sneer we are not worth inquiring for indignation kept adelaide silent for a moment she was sorely tempted to administer a severe and cutting rebuke but edna was no longer a child and controlling herself she calmly delivered mr travilla's message oh delightful cousin elsie always does give such splendid parties such elegant refreshments cried virginia and isdor conley girls of ten and twelve mamma you'll never think of declining no your grandfather wouldn't like it said louise as anxious as her daughters to enjoy the entertainment yet glad to save her pride by putting her acceptance on the score of pleasing her father and you'll go too and take us mamma won't you anxiously queried molly percival who was between her cousins in age of course i'll go we all want our share of the good things and the pleasure of seeing and being seen answered edna scorning louise's subterfuge if you do dick will promise to make no trouble i'll take you along but bob and betty may stay home i'm not going to be bothered with them babies of five and three but what shall we wear lou but i do say it's real mean of them to give us so short a notice but of course elsie enjoys making me feel my changed circumstances i've no such stock of jewels silks and laces as she nor the full purse that makes it an easy matter for her to order a fresh supply at a moment's warning you have all and more than the occasion calls for remarked adelaide quietly it is to be only a family gathering end of section one Chapter Two of Elsie's Motherhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Candace Dalek, Dallas, Texas. Elsie's Motherhood by Martha Finley. Chapter Two. Though full spurn Hymen's gentle powers, we, who improve his golden hours, by sweet experience know that marriage, rightly understood, gives to the tender and the good a paradise below. Cotton. 
mr allison had fully kept his promise to sophie and ashlands was again the fine old place it had been prior to the war the family consisting of the elder mrs carrington a young man named george boyd a nephew of hers who had taken charge of the plantation sophie and her four children had now been in possession for over a year sophie still an almost inconsolable mourner for the husband of her youth lived a very retired life devoting herself to his mother and his orphan little ones mrs ross expecting to spend the fall and winter with them had brought all her children and a governess miss fisk who undertook the tuition of the little carringtons also during her stay at ashlands thus leaving the mothers more at liberty for the enjoyment of each other's society it was in the midst of school hours that the ion carriage came driving up the avenue and philip ross lifting his head from the slate over which he had been bending for the last half hour rose hastily threw down his pencil and hurried from the room paying no attention to miss fisk's query where are you going philip on her command come back instantly it is quite contrary to rules for pupils to leave the schoolroom during the hours of recitation without permission indeed he had reached the foot of the staircase before the last word had left her lips she being very slow and precise in speech and action while his movements were of the quickest what now is to be done in this emergency soliloquized the governess unconsciously thinking aloud miss gertrude ross turning to a girl of nine whose merry blue eyes were twinkling with fun follow your brother at once and inform him that i cannot permit any such act of insubordination and he must return instantly to the performance of his duties yes ma'am and gertrude vanished glad enough of the opportunity to see for herself who were the new arrivals phil she said entering the drawing-room where the guests were already seated miss fisk says you're an insubordination and must come back instantly gertrude said her mother laughing come and speak to mr travilla and your little friends why yes phil to be sure how came you here when you ought to be at your lessons because i wanted to see elsie travilla he answered nonchalantly yes but you should have asked for permission i ought to send you back but you won't ma you know that as well as i do i'll not go back a step while elsie stays well well it seems you are bound to have your own way as usual lucy answered half laughing half sighing then resumed her talk with mr travilla seeing that the little travillas had listened to this colloquy in blank amazement she felt much mortified at phil's behavior and on receiving the invitation threatened to leave him at home as a punishment but this only made matters worse he insisted that go he would and if she refused permission he should never never love her again as long as he lived and she weakly yielded lucy said her mother when the guests were gone and the children had left the room you are ruining that boy well i don't see how i can help it mamma how could i bear to lose his affection you are taking the very course to bring that about it is the weakly indulged not the wisely controlled children who lose first respect and then affection for their parents look at elsie's little family for instance where can you find children ruled with a firmer hand or more devotedly attached to their parents eddie was at that moment saying to his father papa isn't phil ross a very very naughty boy to be so saucy and disobedient to his mamma my son answered mr travilla with gentle gravity when you have corrected all eddie travilla's faults it will be time enough to attend to those of others and the child hung his head and blushed for shame it was mr and mrs horace dinsmore who did the honors at ion early in the evening receiving and welcoming each bevy of guests and replying to the oft-repeated inquiry for the master and mistress of the establishment that they would make their appearance shortly elsie's children most sweetly and becomingly dressed had gathered about aunt rosie in a corner of the drawing-room and seemed to be waiting with a sort of intense but quiet eagerness for the coming of some expected event at length every invited guest had arrived all being so thoroughly acquainted nearly all related there was an entire absence of stiffness and constraint and much lively chat had been carried on but a sudden hush fell upon the room and every eye turned toward the doors opening into the hall expecting they knew not what there were soft footfalls a slight rustle of silk and adelaide entered followed by mr travilla 
with Elsie on his arm in bridal attire. The shimmering satin, rich soft lace and orange blossoms became her well, and never, even on that memorable night ten years ago, had she looked lovelier or more bride-like, never had her husband bent a prouder, fonder look upon her fair face than now as he led her to the center of the room where they paused in front of their pastor. A low murmur of surprise and delight ran around the room, but was suddenly stilled as the venerable man rose and began to speak. Ten years ago tonight, dear friends, I united you in marriage. Edward Travilla, you then vowed to love, honor, and cherish till life's end the woman whom you now hold by the hand. Have you repented of that vow, and would you be released? Not for worlds. There has been no repentance, but my love has grown deeper and stronger day by day. And you, Elsie Dinsmore Travilla, also vowed to love, honor, and obey the man you hold by the hand. Have you repented? never sir never for one moment the accents were low sweet clear and full of pleasure i pronounce you a faithful man and wife and may god in his good providence grant you many returns of this happy anniversary old mr dinsmore stepped up kissed the bride and shook hands with the groom blessings on you for making her so happy he said in quivering tones his son followed then the others in their turn and a merry scene ensued Mama, it was so pretty, so pretty, little Elsie said, clasping her arms about her mother's neck. And now I just feel as if I'd been to your wedding. Thank you, dear Mama and Papa. Mama, you are so beautiful. I'll just marry you myself when I'm a man, remarked Eddie, giving her a hearty kiss, then gazing into her face with his great dark eyes full of love and admiration. I too, chimed in Violet. No, no, I forget. I shall be a lady myself so i'll have to marry papa no vi who can't have my papa he does my papa always objected harold climbing his father's knee what a splendid idea elsie lucy ross was saying to her friend you have made me regret for the first time not having kept my wedding dress for i believe my phil and i could go through that catechism quite as well as you and mr travilla the whole thing i suppose was quite original among us, my namesake daughter proposed the wearing of the dress and the ceremony, turning to the minister. Was your idea, Mr. Wood, was it not? Partly, Mrs. Travilla, your father, Mrs. Dinsmore, and I planned it together. Your dress is as perfect a fit as when made, but I presume you had it altered, observed Lucy, making a critical examination of her friend's toilet. No, not in the least, answered Elsie, smiling the banquet to which the guests were presently summoned though gotten up so hastily more than fulfilled the expectation of the misses conley who as well as their mother and aunt enna did it ample justice there was a good deal of gormandizing done by the spoiled children present spite of feeble protests from their parents but elsie's well-trained little ones ate contently what was given them nor even asked for the rich dainties on which others were feasting knowing that papa and mamma loved them too dearly to deny them any real good Halloa, nettie and vi why you've been overlooked said philip ross coming toward the two little ones with a plate heaped up with rich viands you've nothing but ice cream and plain sugar biscuit here take some of this pound cake and these bonbons they're delicious i tell you no no thank you mamma says pound cake is much too rich for us and would make us sick said eddie especially at night added vi and we're to have some bonbons tomorrow goodest little tots ever i saw returned philip laughing mom wanted me to let em alone but i told her i'd risk them getting sick he added with a pompous grown-up air phil you certainly are an insubordination as miss fiss said remarked his sister gertrude standing near i believe you think you're most a man, but it's a great mistake. Poor Gurr, people that live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. I heard you tell him, Ma, you didn't wear the dress she laid out for you. Elsie Travilla, allow me the pleasure of refilling your saucer. No, thank you, Phil. I've had all Mama thinks good for me. Time to go to bed, chillins, said Mammy, approaching the little group. The clock just gwine struck nine. Here, Uncle Joe, take these empty saucers promptly and without a murmur the four little folks prepared to obey the summons but cast wistful longing glances toward mamma who was gaily chatting with her guest on the other side of the room just then the clock on the mantel struck and excusing herself she came quickly toward them 
that is right dears come and say good night to papa and our friends then go with mammy and mamma will follow in a few moments what dear sweet creatures they are perfect little ladies and gentlemen remarked mrs wood after a courteous good night to all they went cheerfully away with their mammy i wish mine were half as good said mrs ross now ma don't expose us cried phil i've often heard you say mrs travilla was a far better little girl than you so of course her children ought to be better than yours some children keep their good behavior for company sneered enna and i've no doubt these little paragons have their naughty fits as well as ours it is quite true that they are not always good elsie said with patient sweetness and now i beg you will all excuse me for a few moments as they never feel quite comfortable going to bed without a last word or two with mamma before i'd make myself such a slave to my children muttered enna looking after her as she glided from the room if they couldn't be content to be put to bed by their mammies they might stay up all night i think mrs travilla is right observed the pastor the responsibilities of parents are very great god says to each one take this child and nurse it for me and i will give thee thy wages end of chapter two recording by candace Delic, dallas texas Chapter Three of Elsie's Motherhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Elsie's Motherhood by Martha Finley. Chapter Three. Delightful task to rear the tender thought, to teach the young idea how to shoot to pour the fresh instruction o'er the mind to breathe the enlivening spirit and to fix the generous purpose in the glowing breast thompson's seasons the iron little folks were allowed an extra nap the next morning their parents wisely considering plenty of sleep necessary to the healthful development of their mental and physical powers they themselves however felt no necessity for a like indulgence their guests having departed in season to admit of their retiring at the usual hour and were early in the saddle keenly enjoying a brisk canter of several miles before breakfast on their return elsie went to the nursery mr travilla to the field where his men were at work half an hour later they and their children met at the breakfast table solon came in for orders you may leave Beppo's saddle, Solon, said Mr. Travilla, and have Prince and Princess at the door also, immediately after prayers. The last named were a pair of pretty little grey ponies, belonging respectively to Eddie and his sister Elsie. They were gentle and well trained for both saddle and harness. Nearly every day the children rode them, one on each side of their father, mounted on Beppo, his beautiful bay and occasionally they drove behind them in the phaeton with their mother or some older person and one or other of the children would often be allowed to hold the reins when on a straight and level road for their father wished them to learn to both ride and drive with ease and skill little elsie's great ambition was to be like mamma in the ease and grace with which she sat her horse as well as in everything else while eddie was equally anxious to copy his father Violet and Harold ran out to the veranda to watch them mount and ride away. Papa, said Vi, shall we too have ponies and ride with you when we're as big as Elsie and Eddie? I intend you shall, little daughter, and if you and Harold will be here with your hats on, all ready to start at once when we come back, I will give you each a short ride before the ponies are put away. Oh, thank you, Papa. We will sure to be ready they answered and ran to their mother to tell her of papa's kind promise and to have their hats put on elsie who was in the sitting-room with herbert on her lap rejoiced in their joy and bade dinah prepare them at once for their ride breast their little hearts they grows handsomer every day exclaimed an elderly negress who had just come in with a basket on her arm don't say such things before them aunt sally said her mistress in a tone of gentle reproof their young hearts are only too ready to be puffed up with vanity and pride now what is your report from the quarter well missus there's lots of miseries down there dis morning 
Old Lise, she's took with a misery in her side, and Uncle Jack, he got em in his head. Old Aunt Delie's got de misery in de joints with de rheumatiz, and old Uncle Mose, he's plain in de misery in his back. Can't stand up straight, no how, and Hannah's baby got a mighty bad cold, can't hardly draw its breath. Twas took that way in de night, and Sylvie's boy tore his foot on a nail. Quite a list, said Elsie, and giving her babe to Aunt Chloe, she selected a key from a bright bunch lying in a little basket, held by a small dusky maid at her side, unlocked a closet door, and looked over her medical store. Here's a plaster for Uncle Mose to put on his back, and one for Lise's side, she said, handing each article in turn to Aunt Sally, who bestowed it in her basket. This small bottle has some drops that will do Uncle Jack's head good, and this larger one is for Aunt Delia. Tell her to rub her joints with it. There is medicine for the baby, and Hannah must give it a warm bath. If it is not better directly, we must send for the doctor. Now, here's a box of salve, excellent for cuts, burns, and bruises. Spread some on a bit of rag, and tie it on Sylvie's boy's foot. There, I think that is all. I'll be down after a while to see how they're all doing. And with some added directions concerning the use of each remedy, Aunt Sally was dismissed. Then Aunt Dicey, the housekeeper, came for her orders for the day, and such supplies from pantry and storehouse as were needed in carrying them out. In the meantime, the riding party had returned. Harold and Violet had been treated to a ride about the grounds, the one in his father's arms, Beppo stepping carefully, as if he knew he carried a tender babe, the other on one of the ponies close at Papa's side and under his watchful eye. It was a rosy, merry group Mamma found upon the veranda, chatting to each other and laughing gaily as they watched their father cantering down the avenue on his way to the fields to oversee the work going on there. They did not hear their mother's step, till she was close at hand, asking in her own sweet, gentle tones, "'My darlings, had you a pleasant time?' "'Oh, yes, Mamma, so nice!' And they gathered about her, eager to claim her ever-ready sympathy, interested in their joys no less than their sorrows. They had been taught to notice the beauties of nature, the changing clouds, the bright autumn foliage, plants and flowers, insects, birds, stones— all the handiwork of God, and the elder ones now never returned from walk or ride without something to tell of what they had seen and enjoyed. It was surprising how much they learned in this easy, pleasant way, how much they gained almost imperceptibly in manners, correctness of speech, in general information, by this habit of their parents of keeping them always with themselves, and patiently answering every proper question. They were encouraged not only to observe, but to think, to reason, and to repeat what they had learned, thus fixing it more firmly in their minds. They were not burdened with long tasks or many studies, but required to learn thoroughly such as were set them, and trained to a love for wholesome mental food, the books put into their hands being carefully chosen by their parents. Though abundantly able to employ a governess, Elsie preferred teaching her darlings herself. There was a large airy room set apart for the purpose, and furnished with every suitable appliance, books, maps, globes, pictures, an orrery, a piano, etc., etc. There were pretty rosewood desks and chairs. The floor was a mosaic of beautifully grained and polished woods. The walls, adorned with a few rare engravings, were of a delicate neutral hint, and tasteful curtains draped each window. Thither mother and children now repaired, and spent two happy hours in giving and receiving instruction. Harold had not yet quite mastered the alphabet. His task was, of course, soon done, and he was permitted to betake himself to the nursery or elsewhere, with his mammy to take care of him, or if he chose to submit to the restraint of the schoolroom, rather than leave his mamma and the others, he might do so. Violet could already read fluently in any book suited to her years, and was learning to spell, write, and sew. Eddie was somewhat further advanced, and Elsie had begun arithmetic, history, and geography. Music also, and drawing, for both of which she already shown decided talent. School over, she had a half hour of rest, then went to the piano for an hour's practice, her mamma sitting by to aid and encourage her. Mr. Travilla came in, asking, "'Where is Eddie?' "'Here, Papa. 
and the boy came running in with face all aglow with delight oh are you going to teach me how to shoot i saw you coming with that pistol in your hand and i am so glad yes his father said smiling at the eager face you will not be anxious little wife turning to her with tender loving look no my husband surely i can trust him with you his own wise careful loving father she answered with a confiding smile oh papa mayn't i go along with you and won't you teach me too cried violet who was always ready for any excitement not to-day daughter only eddie and i are going now but some time i will teach you all it is well enough for even ladies to handle a pistol on occasion and your mamma is quite a good shot vi looked disappointed but did not fret pout or ask a second time for such things were not allowed in the family by either parent mamma's good little girl the mother said drawing her caressingly to her side as mr travilla and eddie left the room i am going to walk down to the quarter this afternoon and will take you and your brother and sister with me if you care to go oh mamma thank you yes indeed i do want to go cried the little one her face growing bright as its wont may we be there when the bell rings cause i do like to see the dogs and she clapped her tiny hands with a laugh like the chiming of silver bells her sister laughed too saying oh yes mamma do let us the iron negroes were paid liberal wages and yet as kind and generously cared for as in the old days of slavery even more so for now elsie might lawfully carry out her desire to educate and elevate them to a higher standard of intelligence and morality to this end mr travilla had added to the quarter a neat schoolhouse where the children received instruction in the rudiments during the day the adults in the evening from one of their own race whose advantages had been such as to qualify him for the work there too the master and mistress themselves held a sunday school on sabbath afternoons aunt sally the nurse who instructed the women in housewifely ways and dinah taught them sewing elsie encouraging and stimulating them to effort by bestowing prizes on the most diligent and proficient eddie came in from his first lesson in the use of firearms flushed and excited mamma i did shoot he cried exultingly i shooted many times and papa says i'll make a good shot some day if i keep on trying ah did you hit the mark not quite this time mamma and the bright face clouded slightly not quite laughed mr travilla drawing his boy caressingly towards him if you please mamma do not question us too closely we expect to do better another time he really did fairly well considering his age and that it was his first lesson papa asked vi climbing his knee were you afraid eddie would shoot us if we went along i thought it safer to leave you at home papa mamma's going to take us walking down to the quarter this afternoon we're to be there when the bell rings so we can see those funny dogs ah then i think i shall meet you there and walk home with you this announcement was received with a chorus of exclamations of delight his loved companionship would double their enjoyment it always did twas a pleasant shady walk not too long for the older children and harold's mammy would carry him when he grew weary they called at the schoolroom witnessed the closing exercises then visited all the aged and ailing ones elsie inquiring tenderly concerning their miseries speaking words of sympathy and consolation and giving additional advice remedies too and some little delicacies to wet the sickly appetites these last being contained in a basket carried by a servant as they left the last cabin in the near vicinity of the post where hung the bell which summoned the men to their meals and gave notice of the hour of quitting work they saw the ringer hurrying toward it oh mamma we're just in time cried vi how nice yes said her sister mamma always knows how to make things come out right every negro family owned a cur and at the first tap of the bell they always with a united yelp rushed for the spot where they formed a ring round the post each seated on his haunches and brushing the ground with his tail with a rapid motion from side to side nose in the air eyes fixed upon the bell and throat sending out a prolonged howl as the ringing continued the din was deafening and far from musical but it was a comical sight vastly enjoyed by the young travillas who saw it only occasionally 
Mr. and Mrs. Travilla were walking slowly homeward, the children and Bruno frolicking, jumping, dancing, running on before. After a while, the two little girls grew somewhat weary, and subsided into a soberer pace. Fie, said Elsie, don't you believe Aunt Delia might get better of those miseries in her bones if she had some nice new red flannel things to wear? Yes, let's buy her some and a pretty dimpled hand went into her pocket and out came a dainty silken purse mamma's gift on her last birthday when she began to have a weekly allowance like elsie and eddie yes if mamma approves course we'll salt mamma about it first and she'll say yes she always likes us to be kind and char char charitable yes especially to jesus people and i know aunt delia's one of his how much money do you have vi I don't know mamma or papa will count when we get home I Have two dollars and fifty cents. Maybe Eddie will give some if we haven't enough Enough of what queried Eddie overhearing the last words as he and Bruno neared the others and their gambles Elsie explained asking would you like to help? Yes, and I'm going to buy some backy as he calls it for old uncle Jack mamma was duly consulted approved of their plans took them the next day to the nearest village let them select the goods themselves and help them to cut out and make the garments eddie assisted by threading needles and sewing on buttons saying that would do for a boy because he had heard papa say he had sometimes sewed on a button for himself when he was away at college to be sure the work might have been given to the seamstress but it was the desire of these parents to train their little ones to give time and effort as well as money End of chapter 3
It was no fault of his that they had been compelled to part with it, and he had paid a fair price, but envy and jealousy are ever unreasonable, and their mildest term of reproach in speaking of him was carpet-bagger. Others found fault with Mr. Leland as paying too liberal wages to the Negroes, including Mr. Horace Dinsmore and Mr. Travilla in the same charge, and hated him for his outspoken loyalty to the government, for though he showed no disposition to seek for office or meddle in any way with the politics of others, he made no secret of his views when occasion seemed to call for their expression. It was not a prudent course under existing circumstances, but accorded well with the frank and fearless nature of this man. Messrs. Dinsmore and Travilla, themselves strong unionists, though the latter was more discreet in the utterance of his sentiments, found in him a kindred spirit. Rose and Elsie were equally pleased with Mrs. Leland, and, pitying her loneliness, called frequently, inviting a return of their visits, until now the three families had become tolerably intimate. This state of things was extremely displeasing to Louise and Enna, scarcely less so to their father, but the others, convinced that they were in the path of duty in thus extending kindness and sympathy to deserving strangers, who were also of the household of faith, were not to be deterred by remonstrances of vituperation. Scalawags, a term of reproach applied by the Democrats of the South to the Republicans, who were natives of that section, was what Enna called her brother, his son-in-law and daughter, when out of hearing of her father, who, though vexed in their notice of the Lelands, was too strongly attached to his only remaining son, and too sensible of the kindness he had received at the hands of Mr. Travilla and Elsie, to permit anything of that sort. The Lelands had several young children, well-bred and of good principles, and it angered Louise and Anna that Elsie evidently preferred them to their own rude, deceitful, spoiled offspring as companions and playmates for her little ones. Elsie and her husband were very desirous to live on good terms with these near relatives, but not to the extent of sacrificing their children's morals. Therefore did not encourage a close intimacy with their Roseland's cousins, yet ever treated them politely and kindly, and made a valuable present to each on every return of his or her birthday, and on Christmas, always managing to select something specially desired by the recipient of the favour. Mr. and Mrs. Dinsmore pursued a similar course. Rosie was allowed to be as intimate as she chose at Ion, and with her aunt Sophie's children, but never visited Roselands, except with her parents or sister, nor were the Roselands' cousins ever invited to make a lengthened stay at the Oaks. One afternoon, several weeks subsequent to the events related in the last chapter, Mary and Archie Leland came over to Ion to spend an hour with their young friends. The weather was delightful, and the children preferred playing out of doors. The girls took their dolls to a summer house in the garden, while with kite, ball, and marbles the boys repaired to the avenue. "'Who are those?' asked Archie, as, looking up at the sound of approaching footsteps, he saw two boys, a good deal older than themselves, coming leisurely toward them. "'My cousins, Walt Connolly and Dick Percival,' answered Eddie. "'I wish they hadn't come. They always tease me so.' Hello cried Dick. "'What, Ed Trevilla, you play with parquet baggers? "'Eh, fie on you. I wouldn't be seen with one.' "'That's not polite, Dick. Archie's a good boy. "'Mamma and Papa say so, and I like him for a playfellow.' "'You do? Ah, that's because you're a scalawag. "'What's that?' "'What your father is, and your grandfather too. "'Then I don't care. I want to be just like my papa.' "'But it isn't nice,' put in Walter, laughing. "'A scalawag's the meanest thing alive. "'Then you shall not call papa that, nor grandpa.' "'And the child's great dark eyes flashed with anger. "'Phew! I'd like to see you hinder me. "'Look here, Ed,' and Dick pulled out a pistol. "'What do you think of that? "'Don't you wish you had one? "'Don't you wish you could shoot?' I can, returned Eddie proudly. Papa's been teaching me, and he's given me a better pistol than that. Hey, a likely story, cried the two tormentors with an incredulous laugh. Let's see it now. It's in the house, but Papa said I should never touch it, except when he gives it to me. Not till I grow a big boy. Nonsense, cried Dick. If twas there, you'd bring it out fast enough. I shan't believe a word of the story until I see the pistol. "'I'll show you if I'm not telling the truth,' exclaimed Eddie, 
flushing hotly and turning about as if to go into the house. But Archie laid a hand on his arm, and speaking for the first time since the others had joined them. "'Don't, Eddie,' he said persuasively. "'Don't disobey your father. I know you'll be sorry for it afterwards.' "'Hold your tongue, you young carpet-bagger,' said Dick. "'Run and get it, Ed.' "'No, never mind about his pistol. He can't shoot,' said Walter, mockingly. "'If he can, let him take yours and prove it.' Eddie remembered well that his father had also forbidden him to touch firearms at all, except when with him. But the boy was naturally proud and willful, and spite of all the careful training of his parents, these faults would occasionally show themselves.' He did not like to have his word doubted. He was eager to prove his skill, which he conceived to be far greater than it was, and as his cousins continued to twit and tease him, daring him to show what he could do, he was sorely tempted to disobey. They were slowly walking on farther from the house as they talked, and finally, when Dick said, Why, Ed, you couldn't hit that big tree yonder. I dare you to try it, at the same time offering him the pistol, the little fellow's sense of duty suddenly gave way, and snatching the weapon from Dick's hand, he fired, not allowing himself time, in his haste and passion, to take proper aim. In their excitement and preoccupation, none of the boys had noticed Mr. Travilla riding into the avenue a moment before, closely followed by his body-servant Ben. Almost simultaneously, with the report of the pistol, the former tumbled from his saddle and fell heavily to the ground. With a cry, Oh, Maceda's killed! Ben sprang from his horse and bent over the prostrate form, wringing his hands in fright and grief. He was his master's foster brother and devotedly attached to him. The fall, the cry, the snorting and running of the frightened horses instantly told the boys what had happened, and Eddie threw himself on the ground, screaming in an agony of grief and remorse. Oh, I've killed my father, my dear, dear father. Oh, papa, papa, what shall I do? What shall I do? Mr. Leland, coming in search of his children, the men passing the gate returning from their work, all heard and rushed to the spot. The blacks crowded about the scene of the accident, sobbing like children at the sight of their loved master and friend lying there apparently lifeless. Mr. Leland, his features working with emotion, at once assumed the direction of affairs. "'Catch the horses,' he said. "'And you, Ben, mount the fleetest and fly for the doctor. "'And you,' turning to another, "'take the other and hurry to the oaks for Mr. Dinsmore. "'Now the rest of you help me carry your master to the house. "'I will lift his head. "'There, gently, gently, my good fellows. "'I think he still breathes. "'But Mrs. Travilla,' he added, looking toward the dwelling, "'all seems quiet there. "'They have not heard, I think.' and she should be warned. I wish... I will go. I will tell Mamma. interrupted a quivering child at his side. Little Elsie had pushed her way through the crowd, and dropping on her knees on the grass, was raining kisses and tears upon the pale, unconscious face. You, poor child, Mr. Leland began in piteous tones, but she had already sprung to her feet, and was flying toward the house with the fleetness of the wind. One moment she paused in the spacious entrance hall to recover her breath, calm her features, and remove the traces of her tears. Mamma, mamma, she was saying to herself, Oh, Lord Jesus, give me the right words to speak to her. She hardly knew to which apartment to direct her steps. But hark, there was the sound of the piano and mamma's sweet voice singing a song papa had brought home only the other day, and that he liked. Ah, oh, would she ever sing again now that he... But no, not even in thought could she say that dreadful word. But she knew now that Mamma was in the music room, and earnestly repeating her silent petition for help, she hurried thither. The door was open. With swift, noiseless steps, she gained her mother's side, passing an arm about her neck and half averting her own pale, agitated face. Mamma, she said in low, tremulous tones, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble mamma jesus loves you jesus loves you he will help you to bear my daughter what is it asked the mother in a tone of forced calmness a terrible pang shooting through her heart your father eddie bye then starting up at a sound as of the feet of those who bore some heavy burden she ran to the hall 
For a moment she stood as one transfixed with grief and horror. He breathes, he lives, Mr. Leland hastened to say. Her lips moved, but no words came from them. Silently motioning them to follow her, she led the way to his room and pointed to the bed. They laid him on it, and at that instant consciousness returned. Dear wife, it is nothing, he faintly murmured, lifting his eyes to her face as she bent over him in speechless anguish. She softly pressed her lips to his brow, her heart too full for utterance. The words sent a thrill of gladness to the heart of little Elsie, who had crept in behind the men and stood near the bed silently weeping. Her father lived, and now Eddie's frantic screams seemed to ring in her ears. In her fear for her father she had scarcely noticed them before, and she must go and tell him the glad news. She was not needed here. Mamma was not conscious of her presence, and she could do nothing for the dear injured father. She stole quietly from the room. On the veranda she found Violet crying bitterly, while Mary Leland vainly tried to comfort her. "'Don't cry so, little sister,' Elsie said, going to her and taking her in her arms in a tender, motherly fashion. "'Our dear papa is not killed. I saw him open his eyes, and heard him say to Mamma, "'Dear wife, it is nothing.' Vi clung to her sister with a fresh burst of tears, but this time they were tears of joy. Oh, I'm so glad. I thought I had no papa any more. A few more soothing words and caresses, and Elsie said, Now I must go and tell poor Eddie. Do you know where he is? Hark, don't you hear him crying way off in the grounds, said Mary? I think he's just where he was. Oh, yes, yes, and Elsie hastened in the direction of the sounds. She found him lying on the grass, still crying, in broken-hearted accents, Oh, I've killed my father, my dear, dear father. What shall I do? What shall I do? Dick and Walter were gone. Like the guilty wretches they were, they had fled as soon as they saw what mischief they had caused. But Archie, too kind-hearted and noble to forsake a friend in distress, was still there. You didn't mean to do it, Eddie, he was saying, as Elsie came within hearing. No, no, burst out the half-distracted child. I wouldn't hurt my dear papa one bit for all the world, but it was because I disobeyed him. He told me never to touch firearms when he wasn't by to help me do it right. Oh, 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 I didn't think I'd ever be such a wicked boy. I've killed my father. Oh, oh. No, Eddie, no, you haven't. Papa opened his eyes and spoke to mamma, said his sister, hurrying to his side. Did he? Oh, Elsie, is he alive? "'Isn't he hurt much?' asked the child, ceasing his cries for the moment and lifting his tear-swollen face to hers. "'I don't know, Eddie, dear, but I hope not,' she said, low and tremulously, the tears rolling fast down her own cheeks, while she took out her handkerchief and gently wiped them away from his. He dropped his head again, with a bitter wailing cry, "'Oh, I'm afraid he is, and I shooted him. I shooted him.' Fortunately, Dr. Burton's residence was not far distant, and Ben, urging Beppo to his utmost speed and finding the doctor at home, had him at Mr. Travilla's bedside in a wonderfully short space of time. The doctor found the injury was not nearly so great as he had feared. The ball had struck the side of the head and glanced off, making a mere scalp wound, which, though causing insensibility for a time, would have no very serious or lasting consequences. The blood had been already sponged away and the wound closed with sticking plaster. But the fall had jarred the whole system and caused some bruises, so that altogether the patient was likely to have to keep to his bed for some days, and the doctor said must be kept quiet and as free from excitement as possible. Elsie, leaving Aunt Chloe at the bedside, followed the physician from the room. "'You need give yourself no anxiety, my dear Mrs. Travilla,' he said cheerily, taking her hand in his for a moment in his kind fatherly way for he was an old man now and had known her from her early childhood the injuries are not at all serious and there is no reason why your husband should not be about again in a week or so but how did it happen what hand fired the shot indeed i do not know have not asked she answered with an emotion of surprise at herself for the omission it seems strange that i should not but i was so taken up with grief and fear for him and anxiety to relieve his suffering, that I had room for no other thought. Can you tell us, sir? 
turning to Mr. Leland, who was standing near. I did not see the shot, he replied with some hesitation. But you know, tell me, I beg of you. It was an accident, madam, entirely an accident. There can be no question about that. But tell me all you know, she entreated, growing very pale. I see you fear to wound me, but it were far better I should know the whole truth. I suppose your little son must have been playing with a pistol, he answered, with evident reluctance. I heard him screaming, Oh, I have killed my father, my dear, dear father. Eddie, she groaned, staggering back against the wall and putting her hand over her eyes. My dear Mrs. Travilla, the gentleman exclaimed simultaneously, do not let it distress you so, since it must have been the merest accident, and the consequences are not so serious as they might have been. But he was disobeying his father, and has nearly taken his life, she moaned low and tremulously, the big tears coursing down her cheeks. Oh, my son, my son! The gentlemen looked uneasily at each other, scarcely knowing what consolation to offer, but a well-known step approached hastily, yet with caution, and the next instant Elsie was clasped in her father's arms. My darling, my poor darling, he said with emotion, as she laid her head on his breast, with a burst of almost hysterical weeping. He caressed her silently. How could he ask the question trembling on his lips? What meant this bitter weeping? His eye sought that of the physician, who promptly answered the unspoken query with the same cheering report he had just given her. Mr. Dinsmore was intensely relieved. Thank God that it is no worse, he said in low, reverent tones. Elsie, daughter, cheer up. He will soon be well again. Mr. Leland, taking leave, offered to return and watch by the sick bed that night, but Mr. Dinsmore, while joining Elsie in cordial thanks, claimed it as his privilege. Ah, oh, well, don't hesitate to call on me whenever I can be of use, said Mr. Leland, and with a kindly good evening, he and the doctor retired, Mr. Dinsmore seeing them to the door. Returning, he found Elsie still in the parlour where he had left her. She was speaking to a servant. Go, Prilla, look for the children and bring them in. It is getting late for them to be out. The girl went, and Elsie, saying to her father that Prilla had brought word that Mr. Travilla was now sleeping, begged him to sit down and talk with her for a moment. The tears fell fast as she spoke. It was long since he had seen her so moved. Dear daughter, why distress yourself thus, he said, folding her in his arms and drawing her head to a resting place upon his breast. Your husband's injuries are not very serious. Dr. Burton is not one to deceive us with false hopes. No, papa, oh, how thankful I am to know he is not in danger, but, oh, papa, papa, to think that Eddie did it. My own son should have so nearly taken his father's life. I grow sick with horror at the very thought. Yet it must have been the merest accident. The child almost idolizes his father. I had thought so. But he must have been disobeying that father's positive command, else this could not have happened. I could never have believed my son could be so disobedient, and it breaks my heart to think of it all. The best of us do not always resist temptation successfully, and doubtless in this case it has been very strong. And he is bitterly repenting. I heard him crying somewhere in the ground as I rode up the avenue, but could not then take time to go to him, not knowing how much you and Travilla might have been needing my assistance. My poor boy, he does love his father, she said, wiping her eyes. There can be no question about that, and this will be a lifelong lesson to him. Papa, you always bring me comfort, she said gratefully. And you will stay with us tonight? Yes, I could not leave you at such a time. I shall send a note to Rose to relieve her anxiety in regard to Edward's accident and let her know that she need not expect me home till morning. Well, Prilla, as the girl reappeared, what is it? Why have you not brought the children as your mistress directed? Please, sir, Massa Dinsmore, Mas Eddie won't come. He just lie on de ground and scream and cry. Oh, I killed my father, my dear, dear father. And Miss Elsie, she comforts and coaxing and pleading, but he won't pay no pretension to nobody. Elsie wept anew. My poor child. My poor little son, what am I to do with him? I will go to him. Trust him to me, Mr. Dinsmore said, leaving the room with a quick, firm step. End of chapter 4
Chapter 5 of Elsie's Motherhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Candace Delic, Dallas, Texas. Elsie's Motherhood by Martha Finley. Chapter 5 If hearty sorrow be a sufficient ransom for offense, I tender it here, I do as truly suffer, as e'er I did commit. Shakespeare Oh, Eddie, dear, do get up and come into the house, entreated his sister. I must leave you if you don't, for Prilla said Mama had sent for us, and you know we must obey. Oh, I can't, I can't go in, I can't see Mama. She will never, never love me any more. Yes, she will, Eddie. Nothing will ever make her stop loving us. And if you're really sorry for having disobeyed poor dear Papa, you'll not go on and disobey her now. But, oh, I've been such a wicked, wicked boy. Oh, Elsie, what shall I do? Jesus won't love me now, nor Mama, nor anybody. Oh, Eddie, sobbed his sister, don't talk so. Jesus does love you and will forgive you if you ask him, and so will Mamma and Papa, for they both love you, and I love you dearly, dearly. The two were alone, Archie having gone home with his father. A step drew near, and Mr. Dinsmore's voice spoke close at hand in tones sterner and more peremptory than he really meant them to be. Edward, get up from that damp grass and come into the house immediately. Do you intend to add to your poor mother's troubles by your disobedience and by making yourself sick? The child rose instantly. He was accustomed to yield to his grandfather's authority quite as readily as to that of his parents. Oh, Grandpa, please don't be hard to him. His heart's almost broken, and he wouldn't have hurt Papa on purpose for all the world, pleaded little Elsie, hastening to Mr. Dinsmore's side, taking his hand in both hers, and lifting her tear-dimmed eyes beseechingly to his face. Yes, Grandpa ought, sobbed Eddie. I've been such a wicked, wicked boy. I deserve the dreadfulest whipping that ever was, and Papa can't do it now, he cried with a fresh burst of grief and remorse. And Mama won't like to. Grandpa, it'll have to be you. Please, do it quick. "'Cause I want it over.' "'And has all this distress been for fear of punishment?' asked Mr. Dinsmore, taking the child's hand and bending down to look searchingly into his face. "'Oh, no, 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 Grandpa. I'd rather be whipped any day than to know I've hurt my dear Papa so. Grandpa, won't you do it quick?' "'No, my son. I am not fond of such business, and shall not punish you unless requested to do so by your father or mother.' The doctor hopes your father will be about again in a week or two, and he can then attend to your case himself. Oh, then he won't die? He won't die? Our dear, dear papa! cried both children in a breath. No, God has been very good to us all in causing the ball to strike, where it could do but little injury. And Edward, I hope this will be such a lesson to you all your life as will keep you from ever disobeying again. They were passing up the avenue eddie moving submissively along by his grandfather's side but with tottering steps for the dreadful excitement of the last hour had exhausted him greatly perceiving this mr dinsmore presently took him in his arms and carried him to the house low pitiful sobs and sighs were the only sounds the little fellow made till set down in the veranda but then clinging to his grandfather's hand he burst out afresh oh grandpa i can't go in i can't I can't see Mamma, for she can't love me any more. The mother heard and came quickly out. The tears were coursing down her cheeks. Her mother heart yearned over her guilty, miserable child, stooping down and stretching out her arms. Eddie, my little son, she said in tender, tremulous accents, come to mother. If my boy is truly sorry for his sin, Mamma has no reproaches for him, nothing but forgiveness and love. He threw himself upon her bosom. Mama, Mama, I'm so sorry. Oh, so sorry. I will never, never disobey Papa or you again. God helping you, my son. If you trust in your own strength, you will be sure to fall. 
yes mamma oh mamma i've been the wickedest boy i disobeyed my father and shooted him and oughtn't i to have a dreadful whipping shall grandpa do it mrs travilla lifted her full eyes inquiringly to her father's face it is all his own idea said mr dinsmore with emotion i think he has already had a worse punishment by far in his grief and remorse elsie heaved a sigh of relief i think his father would say so too it shall be decided by him when he is able eddie my son papa is too ill now to say what shall be done with you i think he does not even know of your disobedience you will have to wait for some days the suspense will be hard to bear i know but my little boy must try to be patient remembering that he has brought all this suffering on himself and in the meantime he has mamma's forgiveness and love she added folding him to her heart with a tender caress sorely the children missed their precious half hour with mamma that night and every night and morning of their papa's illness she could leave them only long enough each time to give them a few loving words and a kiss all round and they scarcely saw her through the day were not admitted to their father's room at all but they were very good lessons went on nearly as usual little elsie keeping order in the schoolroom even wilful eddie quietly submitting to her gentle sway and papa kindly attending to the recitations he rode out with them too and he aunt rosie or their mammies took them for a pleasant walk every fine day friends and neighbors were very kind and attentive none more so than the leland's archie told his father how and by whom poor eddie had been teased provoked and dared into firing the pistol mr leland told mr dinsmore the story and he repeated it to his father and sisters the old gentleman was sufficiently incensed against the two culprits to administer a severe catastation to each while elsie was thankful to learn that her son had not yielded readily to the temptation to disobedience she pitied him deeply and she noted how weary to him were these days of waiting how his gay spirits had forsaken him how anxious he was for his father's recovery how he longed for the time when he should be permitted to go to him with his confession and petition for pardon at length that time came mr travilla was so much better that dr burton said it would do him no harm to see his children and to hear all the details of his accident the others were brought in first and allowed to spend a few minutes in giving and receiving caresses their little tongues running very fast in their exuberant joy over their restored father elsie vi harold baby but where is eddie he asked looking a little anxiously at his wife not sick i hope no my dear he will be in presently she answered the tears starting to her eyes no one of them all has found it harder to be kept away from you than he but there is something he has begged me to tell you before he comes ah he said with a troubled look in his eyes a suspicion of the truth dawning upon him well darlings you may go now and mamma will let you come in again before your bedtime they withdrew and elsie told her story dwelling more particularly upon the strength of the temptation and the child's agony of grief and remorse bring him here wife mr travilla said his eyes full his voice husky with emotion there was a sound of sobs in the hall without as she opened the door come son she said taking his hand in hers papa knows it all now half eagerly half tremblingly he suffered her to lead him in papa he burst out sobbingly scarcely daring to lift his eyes from the floor i've been a very wicked bad boy i disobeyed you and and come here to me my little son how gentle and tender were the tones eddie lifted his head and with one joyous bound was in his father's arms clinging about his neck and sobbing out upon his breast his grief his joy his penitence papa papa can you forgive such a naughty disobedient boy i'm so sorry i did it i'm so glad you didn't die dear dear papa so glad you love me yet love you son i think if you knew how much you would never want to disobey again i don't papa oh i don't i ask god earnestly every day to give me a new heart and help me always to be good 
but mustn't i be punished mamma said it was for you to say and grandpa didn't whip me and he won't lest you ask him and i shall not ask him my son i fully and freely forgive you because i am sure you are very sorry and do not mean to disobey again how happy the child was that at last his father knew and had forgiven all mr Travilla improved the occasion for a short but very serious talk with him on the sin of danger and disobedience and his words so tenderly spoken made a deep and lasting impression but eddie was not yet done with the pain and mortification consequent upon his wrongdoing that afternoon the ashland ladies called bringing with them the elder children of both families while their mammas conversed in the drawing-room the little people gathered in the veranda all was harmony and good will among them till philip ross fixing his eyes on eddie said with a sneer so master ed though you told me one day you'd never talk to your mamma as i did to mine you've done a good deal worse i don't set up for a pattern good boy but i'd die before i'd shoot my father eddie's eyes sought the floor while his lips trembled and two great tears rolled down his burning cheeks phil ross cried gertrude i'm ashamed of you of course he didn't do it a purpose maybe not he didn't disobey on purpose hadn't his father but catching a reproachful entreating look from elsie's soft brown eyes he stopped short and turning away began to whistle carelessly while vi putting her small arms about eddie's neck said phil ross you should insult my brother so cause he wouldn't tend to hurt papa no not for all the world harold chiming in course my eddie wouldn't and bruno whom he was petting and stroking with his chubby hands giving a short sharp bark as if he too had a word to say in defense of his young master is that your welcome to visitors bruno queried a young man of eighteen or twenty alighting from his horse and coming up the steps into the veranda you must please excuse him for being so ill-mannered cousin cal little elsie said coming forward and offering her hand with a graceful courtesy very like her mamma's. will you walk into the drawing-room our mammas are all there presently thank you he said bending down to snatch a kiss from the sweet lips she shrank from the caress almost with aversion what's the use of being so shy with a cousin he asked laughing why molly percival likes to kiss me i think molly would not be pleased if she knew you said that remarked the little girl in a quiet tone and moving farther from him as she spoke holding a levy eh he said glancing about upon the group howdy young ladies and gentlemen Holloa, ed so you're the brave fellow that shot his father hope your grandfather dealt out justice to you in the same fashion that wall and dix did to them eddie could bear no more but burst into an agony of tears and sobs calhoun conley do you think it very manly for a big fellow like you to torment such a little one as our eddie queried elsie with rising indignation no i don't he said frankly never mind eddie i take it all back and own that the other two deserve the lion's share of the blame and punishment too come shake hands and let's make up eddie gave his hand saying in broken tones i was a naughty boy but papa has forgiven me and i don't mean ever to disobey him any more end of chapter five recording by candestelic dallas texas Chapter Six of Elsie's Motherhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Candace Stellick, Dallas, Texas. Elsie's Motherhood by Martha Finley. Chapter Six. So false is faction, and so smooth a liar as that it never had a side entire daniel by the first of december mr Travilla had entirely recovered from the ill effects of his accident which had occurred early in november and life at ion resumed its usual quiet regular but pleasant routine varied only by frequent exchange of visits with the other families of the connection and near neighbors especially the leylands 
because of the presence among them of their northern relatives this winter was made a gayer one than either of the last two which had seen little mirth or joviality among the older ones subdued as they were by recent repeated bereavements time had now somewhat assuaged their grief and only the widowed ones still wore the garb of mourning a round of family parties for old and young filled up the holidays and again just before the departure of the rosses and allisons in the early spring they were all gathered at ion for a farewell day together some of the blacks in mr leland's employ had been beaten and otherwise maltreated only the previous night by a band of armed and disguised men and the conversation naturally turned upon that occurrence so the Ku Klux outrages have begun in our neighborhood, remarked Mr. Horace Dinsmore, and went on to denounce their proceedings in unmeasured terms. The faces of several of his auditors flushed angrily. Anna shot a fierce glance at him, muttering, Scalawag, half under her breath, while his old father said testily, Horace, you speak too strongly. I haven't a doubt the rascals deserved all they got. I'm told one of them, at least, had insulted some lady, Mrs. Foster, I believe, and that the others had been robbing hen roosts and smoke houses. That may perhaps be so, but at all events every man has a right to a fair trial, replied his son, and so long as there is no difficulty in bringing such matters before the civil courts, there is no excuse for lynch law, which is apt to visit its penalties upon the innocent as well as the guilty. At this, George Boyd, who, as the nephew of the elder Mrs. Carrington and a member of the Ashlands household, had been invited with the others, spoke warmly in defense of the organization, asserting that its main object was to defend the helpless, particularly in guarding against the danger of an insurrection of the blacks. There is not the slightest fear of that, remarked Mr. Travilla. There may be some few turbulent spirits among them, but as a class they are quiet and inoffensive begging your pardon sir said boyd i find them quite the reverse demanding their wages directly they are due and not satisfied with what one chooses to give and that reminds me that you sir and mr horace dinsmore and that carpet-bagger of fairview are entirely too liberal in the wages you pay that is altogether our own affair sir returned mr dinsmore hauntingly no man or set of men shall dictate to me as to how i spend my money what do you say trevilla i take the same position shall submit to no such infringement of my liberty to do as i will with my own elsie's eyes sparkled she was proud of her husband and father rose too smiled approval sounds very fine growled boyd but i say you've got no right to put up the price of labor papa cried young horace straightening himself and casting a withering look upon boyd i hope neither you nor brother edward will ever give in to them a single inch such insolence let us change the subject said old mr dinsmore it is not an agreeable one it so happened that a few days after this mrs dinsmore travilla and leland were talking together just within the entrance to the avenue at ion when wilkins foster george boyd and calhoun conley came riding by they brought their horses to a walk as they neared the gate, and Foster called out sneeringly, Two scalawags and a carpet-bagger, fit company for each other. So we think, sir, returned Trevilla coolly, though we do not accept the epithets you so generously bestow upon us. It is an easy thing to call names. Any fool is equal to that, said Mr. Leland, in a tone of unruffled good nature true and the weapon of vituperation is generally used by those who like brains for argument or are upon the wrong side observed mr dinsmore is that remark intended to apply to me sir asked foster drawing himself up with an air of hauteur and defiance not particularly but if you wish to prove yourself skilled in the other and more manly weapon we are ready to give you the opportunity yes come in gentlemen and let us have a free and friendly discussion said mr travilla boyd and conley at once accepted the invitation but foster reining in his horse in the shade of a tree at the gate said no thank you i don't care to alight can talk from the saddle as well as anyway i call you scalawags messrs dinsmore 
and Trevilla, because though natives of the South, you have turned against her. Altogether a mistake, observed Trevilla. I deny the charge and call upon you to prove it, said Mr. Dinsmore. Easy task. You kept away and took no part in our struggle for independence. That is we, I speak for Trevilla as well as myself, had no share in the effort to overthrow the best government in the world, the hope of the downtrodden and oppressed of all the earth, a struggle which we foresaw would prove, as it has, the almost utter destruction of our beloved South. They who inaugurated succession were no true friends to her. Sir, cried Boyd with angry excitement, ours was as righteous a cause as that of our revolutionary fathers. Mr. Dinsmore shook his head. They fought against unbearable tyranny and that after having exhausted every other means of obtaining a redress of their grievances, and we have suffered no oppression at the hands of the general government. Hadn't we? interrupted Foster fiercely. Were the provisions of the fugitive slave law carried out by the North? Didn't some of the northern states pass laws in direct opposition to it? And didn't Yankee abolitionists come down here interfering with our institutions and enticing our Negroes to run away, or something worse? Those were the acts of private individuals and individual states, entirely unsanctioned by the general government, which really had always rather favored us than otherwise. But, uncle, said Conley, there would have been no secession but for the election of Lincoln, an abolition candidate. And who elected him? Who but the Democrats of the South? They made a division in the Democratic Party, purposely to enable the Republicans to elect their man that they might use his election as a pretext for secession. A long and hot discussion followed, each one present taking more or less part in it. It was first the causes of the war, then the war itself, after that the reconstruction policy of Congress, which was bitterly denounced by Foster and Boyd. Never was a conquered people treated so shamefully, cried the former. It is a thing hitherto unheard of in the history of the world that gentlemen should be put under the rule of their former slaves. Softly, softly, sir, said Leland. Surely you forget that the terms proposed by the Fourteenth Amendment substantially left the power of the state governments in your hands and enabled you to limit suffrage and office to the white race. But you rejected it and refused to take part in the preliminary steps of reorganizing your state governments so the blacks acquired the right to vote and hold office they were as a class well-meaning but ignorant and their old masters refusing to accept office at their hands or advise them in regard to their new duties they fell an easy prey to unscrupulous white men whose only care was to enrich themselves by robbing the already impoverished states through corrupt legislation. Now, sir, who was it that really put you under the rule of your former slaves, if you are there? Footnote A. See Report of Congressional Committee of Investigation. Foster attempted no reply, but merely reiterated his assertion that no conquered people had ever been so cruelly used, to which Messrs. Travilla, Dinsmore, and Leland replied with a statement of facts, i.e., that before the war was fairly over, the government began to feed, clothe, shelter, and care for the destitute of both colors, and millions were distributed in supplies, that in 1865 a bureau was organized for this purpose, and expended in relief, education, and aid to people of both colors and all conditions, thirteen millions two hundred and thirty thousand three hundred and twenty seven dollars and forty cents while millions more were given by charitable associations and citizens of the north that the government sold thousands of farm animals in the south at low rates and large quantities of clothing and supplies at merely nominal prices that there had been no executions for treason no confiscation of lands but that some estates abandoned by the owners during the war and taken possession of and cultivated by the government had been returned in better condition than they would have been in if permitted to lie idle 
that the railroads of the south were worn out by the war woodwork rotted rails and machinery worn out that the government forces as they advanced captured the lines repaired the tracks rebuilt bridges and restored and renewed the rolling stock that at the close of the war the government might have held all these lines but instead turned them over to the stockholders sold them the rolling stock at low rates and on long time and advanced millions of dollars to the southern railroads that there were debts estimated when the war began at three hundred millions of dollars due to the merchants of the north that they compounded with their southern debtors abating more than half their dues and extending time for the payment of the remainder that a bankrupt act was passed enabling those hopelessly involved to begin business anew sound institutions took the places of the old broken banks and united states currency that of confederate notes etc etc footnote b see reports of congressional committee of investigation foster attempted no denial of these facts but spoke bitterly of corruption among the state government officials resulting in ruinous taxation etc his antagonists freely admitted that there had been frauds and great extravagance yet claimed that neither party was responsible for these but members of both and persons belonging to neither who cared only for their own gains and who they asked are responsible for their success in obtaining the positions which enable them thus to rob the community footnote c see reports of congressional committee of investigation they had no vote for me said foster but i say it again we have been shamefully treated if they'd confiscated my property and cut off my head i'd have suffered less than i have as things have gone why not petition congress for those little favors possibly it may not yet be too late returned leland laughing this ended the talk foster put spurs to his horse and rode off in a rage come conley we've surely had enough of this republican discourse let us go also said boyd with a haughty wave of his hand to the others he hurried into the road and remounted but conley did not follow elsie joined the group at that moment and laying her hand on his arm said with one of her sweetest smiles don't go cal you must stay and take tea with us it is already on the table thank you i will he said with a pleased look he was one of his cousin's ardent admirers thinking her the most beautiful intelligent fascinating woman he had ever seen she extended her invitation to leland and boyd mr Javilla seconding it warmly but it was courteously declined by both and each went his way papa you will not forsake us elsie said gaily putting both hands into his and smiling up into his face her sweet soft eyes brimful of fond filial affection but you know you are at home and need no invitation yes he said returning the smile and holding the hands fast for a moment i am at home and shall stay for an hour or so end of chapter six recording by candace delic dallas texas chapter seven of elsie's motherhood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by candace stalick dallas texas elsie's motherhood by martha finley chapter seven disguise i see thou art a wickedness wherein the pregnant enemy does much shakespeare's twelfth night will you walk into the library gentlemen i have just received a package of new books which perhaps you would like to examine said mr travilla to his guest as they left the tea-table presently thank you mr dinsmore answered catching elsie's eye and perceiving that she had something for his private ear she took his arm and drew him out to her flower garden while her husband and calhoun sought the library papa i want a word with you about cal i do not like foster and boyd 
that is they seem to me to be unprincipled men a violent temper and altogether very bad associates for him and you must have noticed how intimate he is with them of late yes i regret it but have no authority to forbid the intimacy i know but papa you have great influence he is proud to be known as your nephew and don't you think you might be able to induce him to give them up for some better friend my brother for instance papa he is twenty-one now and are not his principles sufficiently fixed to enable him to lead cal and arthur doing them good instead of being injured by association with them yes you are right horace is not one to be easily led and calhoun is i am glad you have spoken and reminded me of my duty my dear father please do not think i was meaning to do that she cried blushing it would be stepping out of my place but edward and i have had several talks about cal of late and decided that we will make him very welcome here and try to do him good edward suggested too what a good and helpful friend horace might be to him if you approved and i said i would speak to you first and perhaps to my brother afterward quite right i think horace will be very willing i should be loth to have him drawn into intimacy with boyd or foster but as he likes neither their conduct nor their principles i have little fear of that they sauntered about the garden a few moments longer, then rejoined the others, who were still in the library. The children were romping with each other and Bruno on the veranda without, the merry shouts, the silvery laughter coming pleasantly in through the open windows. How happy they seem, Cousin Elsie, remarked Calhoun, turning to her. Yes, they are, she answered, smiling. You are fond of children, Cal? Yes, suppose you let me join them suppose we all do suggested mr dinsmore seeing travilla lay aside his book and listen with a pleased smile to the glad young voices with all my heart said the latter as he rose and led the way i find nothing more refreshing after the day's duties are done than a romp with my children for the next half hour they were all children together then aunt chloe and dinah came to take the little ones to bed and elsie after seeing her guests depart followed to the nursery mr dinsmore rode over to roselands with his nephew conversing all the way in a most entertaining manner making no allusion to politics or to boyd or foster calhoun was charmed and when his uncle urged him to visit the oaks more frequently observing that he had been there but once since horace's return from college and proposing that he should begin by coming to dinner the next day and staying as long as suited his convenience the invitation was accepted with alacrity and delight on returning home mr dinsmore explained his views and wishes with regard to calhoun to his wife and son who at once cordially fell in with them in doing all they could to make his visit enjoyable in fact so agreeable did he find in that his stay was prolonged to several days the morning papers one day brought news of several fresh ku klux outrages beatings shootings hanging mr dinsmore read the account aloud at the breakfast table and again made some remarks against the organization calhoun listened in silence then as mr dinsmore laid the paper down uncle he said doubtfully and with downcast troubled look don't you think the reconstruction acts form some excuse for the starting of such an organization let the facts answer returned mr dinsmore the organization existed as early as eighteen sixty six the reconstruction acts were passed in march eighteen sixty seven footnote d see reports of congressional committee of investigation ah yes sir i had forgotten the dates i've heard that reason given and another excuse is the fear of a conspiracy among the negroes to rob and murder the whites and i think you can't deny that they are thievish i don't deny cal that some individuals among them have been guilty of lawless acts particularly stealing articles of food but they are poor and ignorant 
have been kept in ignorance so long that we cannot reasonably expect in them a very strong sense of the rights of property and the duty of obedience to law yet i have never been able to discover any indications of combined lawlessness among them on the contrary they are themselves fearful of attack well sir then there were those organizations in the other the republican party the union leagues and red strings i've been told the ku klux klan was gotten up in opposition to them i presume so but union leaguers and red strings do not go about in disguise robbing beating murdering but then the carpetbaggers said calhoun waxing warm putting mischief into the negroes heads getting into office and robbing the state in the most shameless wholesale manner their excuse enough for the doings of the ku klux ah said his uncle but you forget that their organization was in existence before the robberies of the state began also that they do not trouble corruptionists and why because they are men of both parties some of them men who direct and control and might easily suppress the clan no no cal judged out of their own mouths by their words to their victims with some of whom i have conversed their ruling motives are hostily to the government to the enjoyment of the negro of the rights given him by the amendments to the constitution and by the laws which they are organized to oppose their real object is to overthrow of the state governments and the return of the negro to bondage and tell me cal do you look upon these midnight attacks of overpowering numbers of disguised men upon the weak and helpless some of them women as manly deeds is it a noble act for white men to steal from the poor ignorant black his mule his arms his crops the fruit of his hard labor footnote e see reports of congressional committee of investigation no sir returned calhoun half reluctantly his face flushing hotly no empathetically no say i cried horace jr what could be more base mean or cowardly you don't belong do you cal asked rosie suddenly he dropped his knife and fork his face fairly ablaze what what can make you think that rosie no no i don't belong to any organization that acknowledges that name a suspicion for the first time flashed upon mr dinsmore a suspicion of the truth calhoun conley was already a member of the white brotherhood the name by which the clan was known among themselves ku klux being the one given to the world at large that thus they might avail themselves of the miserable jesuitical subterfuge calhoun had just used he had been wheedled into joining it by foster and boyd who utterly deceived him in regard to its objects he had never taken part in the outrages and was now fully determined that he never would resolving that while keeping its secrets the penalty of the exposure of which was death he would quietly withdraw and attend no more of its meetings he understood the language of the searching look mr dinsmore gave him and seized the first opportunity for a word in private to vindicate himself uncle he said with frank sincerity i am not free to tell you everything as i could wish but i hope you will believe me when i assure you that i never had any share in the violent doings of the ku klux and never will mr dinsmore bent upon him a second look of keen scrutiny calmly bore it without flinching and extending his hand his uncle replied i think i understand the situation but i will trust you cal and not fear that in entertaining you here i am harboring a hypocrite and spy who may betray my family and myself into the hands of midnight assassins thanks uncle you shall never have cause to repent of your confidence the lad answered with a flush of honest pride he returned to roselands the next day and went directly to an upper room at some distance from those usually occupied by the family from whence came the busy hum of a sewing machine the door was securely fastened on the inner side but opened immediately in response to three quick sharp taps of a pencil which calhoun took from his pocket it was his mother's face that looked cautiously out upon him oh you have returned she said in an undertone well come in i'm glad to see you 
he stepped in and she locked the door again and sitting down resumed the work which it seemed had been laid aside to admit him she was making odd looking rolls of cotton cloth stuffing them with cotton wool mrs johnson the only other person present was seated before the sewing machine stitching a seam in a long garment of coarse white linen how do you do cal she said looking up for an instant to give him a nod he returned the greeting and taking a chair by mrs connolly's side uh well mother he asked quite you're just in time to tell me whether these are going to look right you know we've never seen any and have only your description to go by she held up a completed roll it looked like a horn tapering nearly to a point i think so he said but mother you needn't finish mine I shall never use it. Calhoun Conley, what do you mean? She cried, dropping the roll into her lap and gazing at him with kindling eyes. You're not going to back out of it now, exclaimed Anna, leaving her machine and approaching him in sudden and violent anger. You'd better take care, coward. They'll kill you if you turn traitor, and right they should too. I shall not turn traitor, he said quietly, but neither shall I go any farther than I have gone. I should never have joined. If Boyd and Foster hadn't deceived me as to the objects of the organization. But you have joined, Cal, and I'll not consent to your giving it up, said his mother. I don't like to vex you, mother, he answered, reddening. But, but you'll have your own way, whether it displeases me or not. A dutiful son, truly. This is Horace's work, and he's a scalawag, if he is my brother cried enna with growing passion but if i were you cal conley i'd be man enough to have an opinion of my own and stick to it exactly what i'm doing aunt enna i went into the thing blindfold i have found out what it really is a cruel cowardly lawless concern and i wash my hands of it and its doings bowing ceremoniously he unlocked the door and left the room enna sprang to it and fastened it after him if he was my son, I'd turn him out of the house. Father would hardly consent, replied her sister. And if he did, what good would it do? Horace or Travilla would take him in, of course. Well, thank heaven, Boyd and Foster are made of sterner stuff and our labors not all lost, said Enna, returning to her machine. The two ladies had been spending many hours every day in that room for a week past, no one but Calhoun being admitted to their secrets, for whether in the room or not of it, they kept the door always carefully locked. The curiosity of servants and children was strongly excited, but vain had been all their questions and coaxing, futile every attempt to solve the mystery up to the present time. But three or four days after Calhoun's return from the Oaks, the thought suggested itself to mischievous, prying Dick and his coadjutor Walter that the key of some other lock in the house might fit that of the door they so ardently desired to open. They only waited for a favorable opportunity to test the question in the temporary absence of their mothers from that part of the building, and to their great joy discovered that the key of the bedroom they shared together was the duplicate of the one which had so long kept their masculine curiosity at bay. It turned readily in the lock, and with a smothered exclamation of delight they rushed in and glanced eagerly about. At first they saw nothing in any way remarkable the familiar furniture the sewing machine the work table and baskets of their mothers a few shreds of white cotton and linen a scrap here and there of red braid littering the carpet near the machine and the low rocking chair used by mrs connolly huh nothing here to be so secret about cried walter but dick nodding his head wisely said let's look a little further what's that in the closet they ran to it, opened the door, and started back in sudden, momentary affright. "'Taint alive,' said Dick, the bolder of the two, quickly recovering himself. "'Horrid thing! I reckon I know what tis!' And he whispered a few words in his companion's ear. Walter gave a nod of acquiescence of the opinion. "'Here's another. Most finished,' pursued Dick, dragging out and examining a bundle he found lying on the closet floor. The one which had so startled them hung on the wall 
we'll have some fun out of em one of these times when it's ready eh well yes but let's put em back and hurry off now for fear somebody should come and catch us i'm afraid those folks in the drawing-room may go and our mothers come up to their work again so they might to be sure said dick rolling up the bundle and bestowing it in its former resting place we must be on the watch while or we'll miss our chance they'll be sending them out of this about as soon as they're finished yes what do you think they're for the boy scorned the rules of english grammar and refused to be fettered by them was not theirs a land of free speech for the aristocratic class to which they undoubtedly belonged cal and art of course don't you believe it art cares for nothing but his books in silver heels wasn't that a jolly birthday present dick i wish trevilla and cousin elsie would remember ours the same way reckon i do there everything's just as we found it now let's skedaddle end of chapter seven recording by candace Dulick, dallas texas Chapter 8 of Elsie's Motherhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Elsie's Motherhood by Martha Finley. Chapter 8. A horrid spectre rises to my sight, close by my side and plain and palpable in all good seeming and close circumstance as man meets man joanna bailey it was a sultry summer night silent and still not a leaf stirring hardly so much as the chirp of an insect to be heard the moon looked down from a cloudless sky upon green lawns and meadows fields and forests clothed in richest verdure gardens where bloomed lovely flowers in the greatest variety and profusion filling the air in their immediate vicinity with an almost overpowering sweetness a river flowing silently to the sea cabins where the laborer rested from his toil and lordlier dwellings where perchance the rich man tossed restlessly on his more luxurious couch mr and mrs travilla had spent the earlier part of the evening at the oaks and after their return tempted by the beauty of the night had sat conversing together in the veranda long after their usual hour of retiring now they were both sleeping soundly perhaps the only creature awake about the house or on the plantation was bungie the great watchdog who released from the chain that bound him during the day was going his rounds keeping guard over his master's property a tiny figure clothed in white stole noiselessly from the house flitted down the avenue out into the road beyond and on and on till lost to view in the distance so light was the tread of the little bare feet that bungie did not hear it nor was bruno sleeping on the veranda aroused on and on it glided the little figure now in the shadow of the trees that skirted the roadside now in the broad moonbeams where they fell unimpeded upon dew-laden grass and dusty highway alike iron had been left more than a mile behind yet farther and farther the bit feety were straying farther from home and love and safety when a grotesque hideous form suddenly emerged from a wood on the opposite side of the road seemingly of gigantic stature it wore a long white garment that enveloping it from head to foot trailed upon the ground rattling as it moved and glistening in the moonlight the head was adorned with three immense horns white striped with red a nose of proportional size red eyes and eyebrows and a wide grinning red mouth filled with horrible tusks out of which rolled a long red tongue catching sight of the small white form gliding along on the other side of the road it uttered a low exclamation of mingled wonder awe and superstitious dread but at that instant a distant sound was heard like a rumble of approaching wheels and it stepped quickly behind a tree Another minute or so and a stage came rattling down the road the hideous monster stepped boldly out from the shadow of the tree There was a sharp crack of a rifle and the driver of the stage tumbled from his high seat into the road The horses started madly forward, but someone caught the reins and presently brought them to a standstill Ku Klux 
exclaimed several voices as the trailing rattling white gown disappeared in the recesses of the wood the stage door was thrown open three or four men alighted and going to the body stooped over it touched it spoke to it asking are you badly hurt jones but there was no answer dead quite dead said one yes what shall we do with him lift him into the stage and take him to the nearest town the last speaker took hold of the head of the corpse the others assisted and in a few moments the vehicle was on its way again with its load of living and dead no one had noticed the tiny white figure which now crouched behind a clump of bushes weeping bitterly and talking to itself but in a subdued way as if fearful of being overheard where am i oh mamma papa come and help your little vi i don't know how i got here oh where are you my own mamma a burst of sobs then oh i'm so afraid and mamma can't hear me nor papa but jesus can i'll ask him to take care of me and he will the small white hands folding themselves together and the low sobbing cry went up dear jesus take care of your little vi and don't let anything hurt her but please bring papa to take me home at ion little elsie woke and missed her sister they slept together in a room opening into the nursery on one side and the bedroom of their parents on the other doors and windows stood wide open and the moon gave sufficient light for the child to see at a glance that vi was no longer by her side slipping out of bed she went softly about searching for her thinking to herself the while she's walking in her sleep again dear little pet and i'm afraid she may get hurt perhaps fall downstairs she had heard such fears expressed by her papa and mamma since of late violet had several times risen and strayed about the house in a state of somnambulism elsie passed from room to room growing more and more anxious and alarmed every moment at her continued failure to find any trace of the missing one she must have help dinah who had care of the little ones slept in the nursery going up to her bed elsie shook her gently what's the matter honey asked the girl opening her eyes and raising herself to a sitting posture where's violet i can't find her miss violet ain't she fast asleep side of you miss elsie no no she isn't there nor in any of mamma's rooms i've looked through them all dinah where is she we must find her come with me quick dinah was already out of bed and turning up the night lamp i'll go all over the house honey but spect you better wake your pa he'll want to look for miss wylet hisself elsie nodded assent and hastening to his side softly stroked his face with her hand kissed him and putting her lips close to his ear whispered half sobbingly papa papa vi's gone we can't find her he was wide awake instantly run back to your bed darling he said and don't cry papa will soon find her he succeeded in throwing on his clothes and leaving the room without rousing his wife he felt some anxiety but the idea that the child had left the house never entered his mind until a thorough search seemed to give convincing proof that she was not in it he went out upon the veranda bruno rose stretched himself and uttered a low whine bruno where's our little violet asked mr travilla stooping to pat the dog's head and showing him the child's slipper lead the way sir we must find her there was a slight tremble in his tones dinah he said turning to the girl who stood sobbing in the doorway if your mistress wakes while i'm gone tell her not to be alarmed no doubt with bruno's help i shall very soon find the child and bring her safely back see he has the scent already as the dog who had been snuffing about suddenly started off at a brisk trot down the avenue mr travilla hurried after his fatherly heart beating with mingled hope and fear on and on they went closely following in the footsteps of the little runaway the dog presently left the road that passed directly in front of ion and turned into another crossing it at right angles which was the stage route between the next town and the neighboring city it was now some ten or fifteen minutes since the stage had passed this spot bearing the dead body of the driver who had met his tragical end some quarter of a mile beyond the loud rumble of the wheels had wakened little vi and as in a flash she had seen the whole the horrible apparition in its glistening rattling robes step out from behind a tree and fire and the tumble of its victim into the dusty road then she had sunk down upon the ground overpowered with terror but the thought of the almighty friend who she had been taught was ever near and able to help 
calmed her fears somewhat she was still on her knees sobbing out her little prayer over and over again when a dark object bounded to her side and bruno's nose was thrust rather unceremoniously into her face bruno you good bruno she cried clasping her arms about his neck take me home take me home ah papa will do that now that he has found his lost darling said a loved voice as a strong arm put aside the bushes and grasped her slight form with a firm but tender hold how came my little pet here so far away from home he asked drawing her to his breast i don't know papa she sobbed nestling in his arms and clinging about his neck her wet cheek lay close to his that carriage waked me and i was way out here and that dreadful thing was over there by a tree and it shooted the man and he tumbled off on the ground oh papa hurry hurry fast and let's go home it might come back and shoot us too what thing daughter he asked soothing her with tender caresses as still holding her to his breast he walked rapidly toward home great big white thing with horns papa i think my pet has been dreaming no no papa i did see it and it fired and the man tumbled off and the horses snorted and ran so fast then they stopped and the other mans came back and i heard them say he's killed he's quite dead oh papa i'm so frightened and she clung to him with convulsive grasp sobbing almost hysterically there there darling papa has you safe in his arms thank god for taking care of my little pet he said clasping her closer and quickening his pace while bruno wagging his tail and barking joyously gambled about them now leaping up to touch his tongue to the little dusty toes now bounding on ahead and anon returning to repeat his loving caress and so at last they arrived home mr travilla had scarcely left the house ere the babe waked his mother she missed her husband at once and hearing a half smothered sob coming from the room occupied by her daughters she rose and with the babe in her arms hastened to ascertain the cause she found elsie alone crying on the bed with her face half hidden in the pillows my darling what is it asked the mother's sweet voice but where is vi oh mamma i don't know that is the reason i can't help crying said the child raising herself and putting her arms about her mother's neck as the latter sat down on the side of the bed but don't be alarmed mamma for papa has gone to find her where daughter she cannot have gone out of the house surely at this instant dinah appeared and delivered her master's message to obey his injunction not to be alarmed was quite impossible to the loving mother heart but she endeavoured to conceal her anxiety and to overcome it by casting her care on the lord the babe had fallen asleep again and laying him gently down she took elsie in her arms and comforted her with caresses and words of hope and cheer mamma said the little girl i cannot go to sleep again till papa comes back no i can see you can't nor can i so we'll pull on our dressing gowns and slippers and sit together at the window to watch for him and when we see him coming up the avenue with vi in his arms we will run to meet them so they did and the little lost one found again was welcomed by mother and sister and afterward by nurse and mammy with tender loving words caresses and tears of joy then dinah carried her to the nursery washed the soiled tired little feet changed the draggled nightgown for a fresh and clean one and with many a hug and honeyed word carried her back to bed saying as she laid her down in it now darling don't you get out of here no more till morning no i'll hold her fast and papa has locked the doors so she can't get out of these rooms said elsie throwing an arm over vi yes hold me tight tight murmured vi cuddling down close to her sister and almost immediately falling asleep for she was worn out with fatigue and excitement elsie lay awake some time longer her young heart singing for joy over her recovered treasure but at length fell asleep also with the murmur of her parents voices in her ears they were talking of violet expressing their gratitude to god that no worse consequences had resulted from her escapade and consulting together how to prevent a repetition of it mr travilla repeated to his wife the child's story of, of her awaking and what she had seen and heard oh my poor darling what a terrible fright for her elsie exclaimed but do you not think it must have been all a dream that was my first thought but on further consideration i fear it may have been another ku klux outrage i dare say the disguise worn by them may answer to her description of the horrible thing that shooted the man 
I judge so from what I have heard of it. But who could have been the victim? she asked with a shudder. I do not know, but her carriage was probably the stage. It was about the hour for it to pass. Day was already dawning, and they did not sleep again. Mr. Travilla had gone on his regular morning round over the plantation, and Elsie stole softly into the room of her little daughters. Though past their usual hour for rising, they still slept, and she meant to let them do so as long as they would. They made a lovely picture lying there, clasped in each other's arms. Her heart swelled with tender emotions, love, joy, and gratitude to him who had given these treasures, and preserved them thus far from all danger and evil. She bent over them, pressing a gentle kiss upon each round, rosy cheek. Little Elsie's brown eyes opened wide, and putting her arms about her mother's neck, Mamma, she whispered with a sweet, glad smile, was not God very good to give us back our vi? Yes, dearest, oh, so much better than we deserve. Violet started up to a sitting posture. Mamma, oh, Mamma, I did have a dreadful, dreadful dream that I was way off from you and papa, out in the night, in the woods, and I saw— She ended with a burst of frightened sobs and tears, hiding her face on the bosom of her mother, who already held her closely clasped to her beating heart. Don't think of it, darling. You are safe now in your own dear home, with papa and mamma and sister and brothers. Tender, soothing caresses accompanied the loving words. Mamma, did I dream it? asked the little child, lifting her tearful face and shuddering as she spoke. The mother was too truthful to say yes, though she would have been glad her child should think it but a dream. Perhaps some of it was, daughter, she said, though my pet did walk out in her sleep, but papa is going to manage things so that she can never do it again, and God will take care of us, my darling. The sobs grew fainter and softly sighing. Yes, mamma, she said. I asked him to send papa to bring me home, and he did. And papa came in here this morning and kissed both his girls before he went downstairs. Did you know that? Did he? Oh, I wish I'd wake to give him a good hug. I too, said Elsie. Papa loves us very much, doesn't he, mamma? Dearly, dearly, my child, you and all his little ones. Vi's tears were dried, and when her father came in, she met him with a cheerful face, quite ready for the customary romp. But days passed ere she was again her own bright, merry self, or seemed content, unless clinging close to one or the other of her parents. While the family were at the breakfast table, Uncle Joe came in with the mail, his face full of excitement and terror. "'Dem Ku Kluxes, they's getting awful dangerous, massa," he said, laying down the bag with a trembling hand. "'They's gone and shot the stage driver and killed him dead on the spot last night, sir, just over yonder, in de road t'other side of Mars Leland's place, and—' Mr. Travilla stopped him in the midst of his story, with a warning gesture, and an anxious glance from one to another of the wondering, half-frightened little faces about the table. "'Another time and place, Uncle Joe.' Yes, sir, beg a pardon, sir, Mas Deddard. And the old man, now growing quite infirm from age, hobbled away, talking to himself. Sure enough, you old fool, Joe, might a knowed you shouldn't told no such things for to chillin. Was it about my dream, papa? Vi asked with quivering lip and fast filling eyes. Never mind, little daughter, we needn't trouble about our dreams, he said cheerily, and began talking of something else in a lively strain that soon set them all to laughing. It was not until family worship was over and the children had left the room that he said to his wife, The Ku Klux were abroad last night, and I have no doubt Uncle Joe's story is quite true, and that our poor little Vi really saw the murder. Elsie gave him a startled, inquiring look. You have other proof? Yes, Leland and I met in going our rounds this morning, and he told me that he found a threatening note signed KKK tacked to his gate, and had torn it down immediately, hoping to conceal the matter from his wife, who, he says, is growing nervously fearful for his safety. Oh, what a dreadful state of things! Do these madmen realize they are ruining their country? Little they care for that, if they can but gain their ends, the subversion of the government and the return of the negro to his former state of bondage. She was standing by his side, her hand on his arm, my husband, she said in trembling tones, looking up into his face with brimming eyes, what may they not do next? I begin to fear for you and my father and brother. I think you need not, little wife, he said, drawing her head to a resting place on his shoulder, and passing his hand caressingly over her hair. 
I think they will hardly meddle with us, natives of the place, and men of wealth and influence. And, he added low and reverently, are we not all in the keeping of him without whom not one hair of our heads can fall to the ground? Yes, yes, I will trust and not be afraid, she answered, smiling sweetly through her tears. Then, catching sight through the open window of a couple of horsemen coming up the avenue, Ah, there are Papa and Horace now, she cried, running joyfully out to meet them. Have you heard of last night's doing of the Ku Klux? were the first words of Horace Jr., when the greetings had been exchanged. Run away, dears, run away to your play, Elsie said to her children, and at once they obeyed. Uncle Joe came in this morning with a story that Jones, the stage driver, had been shot by them last night in this vicinity, Mr. Travilla answered, but I stopped him in the midst of it as the children were present. Is it a fact? Only too true, replied Mr. Dinsmore. Yes, said Horace. I rode into the town before breakfast, found it full of excitement, the story on everybody's tongue, and quite a large crowd about the door of the house where the body of the murdered man lay. And is the murderer still at large? asked Elsie. Yes, and the worst of it is that no one seems to have the least idea who he is. The disguise preventing recognition, of course, said Mr. Travilla. Then the grandfather and uncle were surprised with the account of little Vi's escapade. If Violet were my child, said Mr. Dinsmore, I should consult Dr. Burton about her at once. There must be undue excitement of the brain that might be remedied by proper treatment. Elsie cast an anxious look at her husband. I shall send for the doctor immediately, he said, and summoning a servant, dispatched him at once upon the errand. Don't be alarmed, daughter, Mr. Dinsmore said. Doubtless a little care will soon set matters right with the child. Yes, I do not apprehend anything serious. If the thing is attended to in time, Mr. Travilla added cheerfully, then went on to tell of the notice affixed to Fairview Gate. They were all of the opinion that these evildoers should, if possible, be brought to justice, but the nature and extent of the organization rendered it no easy matter for the civil courts to deal with them. The order being secret, the members were known as such only among themselves, when strangers recognizing each other by secret signs. They were sworn to aid and defend a brother member under all circumstances. Were one justly accused of crime, others would come forward and prove an alibi by false swearing. Were they on the jury, they would acquit him, though perfectly cognizant of his guilt. In some places the sheriff and his deputies were members, perhaps the judge also, Thus it happened that, though one or two persons who had been heard to talk threateningly about Jones, as a carpet-bagger and Republican, who should be gotten rid of, by fair means or foul, were arrested on suspicion, they were soon set at liberty again, and his death remained unavenged. End of chapter 8this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bethany Baldwin. Elsie's Motherhood by Martha Finley. Chapter 9. I feel my sinews slackened with the fright and a cold sweat thrills down o'er all my limbs, as if I were dissolving into water. Dryden Early one evening, a few days subsequent to the tragical death of Jones, the Ion family carriage, well freighted, was bawling along the road leading toward the oaks. A heavy shower had laid the dust and cooled the air, and the ride past blooming hedgerows and fertile fields was very delightful. The parents were in a cheerful mood, the children gay and full of life and fun. "'Oh, yonder is Grandpa's carriage coming this way!' cried Eddie as they neared the crossroad which must be taken to reach Roselands in the one direction and Ashlands in the other. "'Yes, turn out here, Salon, and wait for them to come up,' said Mr. Travilla. "'On your way to the Oaks?' Mr. Dinsmore queried, as his carriage halted alongside of the other. "'Well, we will turn about and go with you.' "'No, we are going to Roselands, but we'll put off the call to another day if you are coming to Ion,' Mr. Travilla answered. "'No, the Dinsmores had not set out for Ion, but to visit Sophie at Ashlands. 
Daisy, her youngest child, was very ill. "'I wish you would go with us, Elsie,' Rose said to Mrs. Travilla. "'I know it would be a comfort to Sophie to see you.' "'Yes, we have plenty of room here,' added Mr. Dinsmore, "'and your husband and children can certainly spare you for an hour or so.' Elsie looked inquiringly at her husband. "'Yes, go, wife, if you feel inclined,' he said pleasantly. "'The children shall not lose their ride. "'I will go on to Roselands with them, make a short call, "'as I have a little business with your grandfather, then take them home.' "'And we will have their mother there probably shortly after,' said Mr. Dinsmore. "'So the exchange was made, and the carriages drove on, "'taking opposite directions when they came to the crossroad. "'Arrived at Roselands, Mr. Travilla found only the younger members of the family at home, "'the old gentleman having driven out with his daughters. "'Calhoun thought, however, that they would return shortly, "'and was hospitably urgent that the visitors should all come in "'and rest and refresh themselves. "'The younger cousins joined in the entreaty, "'and his own children, seeming desirous to accept the invitation, "'Mr. Travilla permitted them to do so. They, with Aunt Chloe and Dinah, were presently carried off to the nursery by Molly Percival and the Conley girls, while their father walked into the grounds with Calhoun and Arthur. "'Well,' whispered Dick to his cousin, drawing him aside unnoticed by the rest, who were wholly taken up with each other. "'Now's our time for some fun with those Ku Klux things. They must be about done, and I reckon we'll be packed off out of the house before long.' Walter nodded assent. They stole unobserved from the room, flew up to their own for the key, hurried to the sewing-room of their mothers, and finding there two disguises nearly completed, sufficiently so for their purpose, arrayed themselves in them, slipped unseen down a back staircase, and dashing open the nursery door, bounded with a loud whoop into the midst of its occupants. Children and nurses joined in one wild shriek of terror, and made a simultaneous rush for the doors, tumbling over each other in their haste and affright. But fortunately for them, Mr. Travilla and Calhoun had come in from the grounds, were on their way to the nursery, and entered it from the hall but a moment later than the boys did by the opposite door. Mr. Travilla instantly seized Dick, Calhoun doing the same by Walter, tore off his disguise, and picking up a riding whip lying conveniently at hand, administered a castigation that made the offender yell and roar for mercy. "'You scoundrel!' replied the gentleman, still laying on his blows. "'I have scant mercy for a great strong boy who amuses himself by frightening women and helpless little children. "'But you're not my father and have no right! Oh, oh, oh!' blubbered Dick, trying to dodge the blows and wrench himself free. "'I'll—' "'I'll sue you for assault and battery.' "'Very well. I'll give you plenty while I'm about it, "'and if you don't want a second dose, "'you will refrain from frightening my children in future.' "'It was an exciting scene, "'Walter getting almost as severe handling from Calhoun, "'nurses and children huddling together "'in the farthest corner of the room, "'baby Herbert screaming at the top of his voice, "'and the others crying and sobbing while shrieking "'in nervous terror from the hideous disguises "'lying in a heap upon the floor. "'Oh, take them away! Take them away, the horrid things!' "'screamed Virginia Conley, shuddering and hiding her face. "'Wall and Dick, you wicked wretches! "'I don't care if they have kill you!' "'Papa, Papa, please stop! "'Oh, Cal, don't whip him any more!' "'I'm sure they'll never do it again,' pleaded little Elsie amid her sobs and tears, holding Vi fast and trying to soothe and comfort her. "'There go,' said Calhoun, pushing Walter from the room. "'And if ever I catch you at such a trick again, I'll give you twice as much.' Dick, released by his captor with a light threat, hastened after his fellow delinquent, blubbering and muttering angrily as he went. Calhoun gathered up the disguises, threw them into a closet, locked the door, and put the key into his pocket. There, said he, they're out of sight and couldn't come after us if they were alive, and there's no life in them, and little else but linen and cotton. Baby Herbert ceased his cries and cuddled down on Aunt Chloe's shoulder. The other four ran to their father. 
he encircled them all in his arms soothing them with caresses and words of fatherly endearment there there my darlings dry your tears papa will take care of you nothing shall hurt you papa they're like that horrid thing that shooted the man sobbed vi clinging to him in almost frantic terror oh don't let's ever come here any more i so frightened papa i so frightened please take harold home sobbed the little fellow the others joining in the entreaty yes we will go at once said mr travilla rising vi in one arm harold in the other and motioning to the servants to follow he was about to leave the room when calhoun spoke do not go yet mr travilla i think grandpa and the ladies will be here directly thanks but i will see mr dinsmore at another time now my first duty is to these terrified little ones i am exceedingly sorry for what has occurred more mortified than i can express no need for apology conley but you must see the necessity for our abrupt departure good evening to you all calhoun followed to the carriage door helped to put the children in then addressing mr travilla i see you doubt me sir he said and not without reason i owe yet i assure you i have no property in those disguises never have worn and never will wear such a thing much less take part in the violence they are meant to protect from punishment i am glad to hear you say so cal good evening and the carriage whirled away down the avenue the rapid motion and the feeling that the objects of their fright were being left far behind seemed to soothe and reassure the children yet each sought to be as near as possible to their loved protector harold and the babe soon fell asleep and on reaching home were carried directly to bed but the older ones begged so hard to be allowed to stay with papa till mamma came home that he could not find it in his heart to refuse them the dinsmore party found sophie devoting herself to her sick child the attack had been sudden and severe and all the previous night the mother had watched by the couch of the little sufferer with an aching heart fearing she was to be taken from her but now the danger seemed nearly over a favorable change having taken place during the day daisy had fallen into a quiet slumber and leaving the nurse to watch at the bedside the mother received and conversed with her friends in an adjoining room though evidently very glad to see them she seemed after the first few moments so depressed and anxious that at length her sister remarked it and asked if there were any other cause than daisy's illness yes rose she said i must own that i am growing very timid in regard to these ku klux outrages since they have taken to beating and shooting whites as well as blacks women as well as men who shall say that we are safe i a northern woman too and without a protector i do not think they will molest a lady of your standing said mr dinsmore the widow too of a confederate officer but where is boyd that you say you are without a protector a slight shudder ran over sophie's frame boyd she said drawing her chair nearer and speaking in an undertone he is my great dread and for fear of wounding mother's feelings i have had to keep my terrors to myself i know that he is often out away from the plantation all night i have for weeks past suspected that he was a ku klux and last night or rather early this morning my suspicions were so fully confirmed that they now amount almost to certainty i had been up all night with daisy and a little before sunrise happening to be at the window i saw him stealing into the house with a bundle under his arm something white rolled up in the careless sort of way a man would do it i am not surprised said mr dinsmore he is just the sort of man one would expect to be at such work headstrong violet tempered and utterly selfish and unscrupulous yet i think you may dismiss your fears of him and feel it rather a safeguard than otherwise to have a member of the clan in your family it may be so she said musingly the cloud of care partially lifting from her brow and at all events you are not without a protector dear sister whispered rose as she bade adieu 
a father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows is god in his holy habitation elsie too had a word of sympathy and hope for her childhood's friend and with warm invitations to both the oaks and ion as soon as daisy could be moved with safety they left her greatly cheered and refreshed by their visit my heart aches for her elsie said as they drove away what a sad sad thing to be a widow yes responded rose and to have lost your husband so fighting against the land of your birth and love there was a long pause broken by a sudden half frightened exclamation from rosie papa what if we should meet the ku klux not much danger i think they are not apt to be abroad so early and we are nearing ion i presume edward has reached home before us remarked elsie i wonder how my little ones enjoyed their first visit to roselands without their mother she soon learned for she had scarcely set foot in the veranda ere they were clinging about her and pouring out the story of their terrible fright she pitied soothed and comforted them trying to dispel their fears and lead them to forgive those who had so ill used them though it cost no small effort to do so herself end of chapter nine Chapter 10 of Elsie's Motherhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Elsie's Motherhood by Martha Finley. Chapter 10. Forgive and ye shall be forgiven. Luke 6:87. Calhoun Conley was much perturbed by the occurrences of the evening. He was fond of his cousin Elsie and her children and very sorry for both her sake and theirs that they had suffered this fright he greatly respected and liked mr travilla too and would fain have stood well in his esteem had he hoped that he did and also with his uncle horace he had been so kindly treated especially of late both at ian and the oaks but now this unfortunate episode had placed him in a false position and he could hardly expect to be again trusted or believed in such were his cogitations as he sat alone in the veranda after the ian carriage had driven away what shall i do he asked himself what shall i do to recover their good opinion just then walter appeared before him looking crestfallen and angry i say cal it's bad enough for you to have thrashed me as you did without bringing mother and aunt edna and maybe grandfather too down on me about those wretched masks and things so give em up and let dick and me put em back before they get home of course put em back as fast as you can pity you hadn't let them alone said calhoun rising and with a quick step leading the way toward the nursery and he added we must see what we can do to keep the young ones from babbling else putting them back will help your case very little oh we'll never be able to do that exclaimed walter despairingly one or another of them is sure to let it out directly and there come the folks now as the rolling wheels was heard in the avenue it's of no use they'll know it all in about five minutes yes sir you and dick have got yourselves into a fine box beside all the trouble you've made for other people said calhoun angrily then laying his hand on walter's arm as he perceived that he was meditating flight no sir stay and face the music like a man and don't act cowardice to all the rest of it they heard the clatter of little feet running through the house and out upon the veranda the carriage dropped before the door, and the voices of the children pouring out the story of their fright, and the punishment of its authors, and the answering tones of their grandfather and the ladies, Mr. Dinsmore's, expressing surprise and indignation. Edna's full of compassion, and Mrs. Conley's of cold displeasure. Let go of me! They're coming this way! 
cried Walter, trying to wrench himself free. But the inexorable Calhoun only tightened his grasp and dragged him to the nursery. Dick was there, trying to pick the lock of the closet door with his pocket knife. "'What are you about, sir? No more mischief today, if you please,' exclaimed Calhoun, seizing him with a free hand, the other having enough to do to hold Walter. "'Give me that key, then,' cried Dick, vainly struggling to shake off his cousin's strong grip. The words were hardly on the boy's tongue when the door was thrown open, and Mr. Densmore and his daughters entered hastily, followed by the whole crowd of younger children. "'Give you the key, indeed. I'd like to know how you got hold of mine, and how you dared to make use of it as you have, you young villain. There, take that, and that, and that. Hold him fast, Cal, till I give him a little of what he deserves,' cried Mrs. Johnson, rushing upon her son." in a towering passion and cuffing him right and left with all her strength let me alone he roared tain't fair old travilla's half killed me already i'm glad of it you ought to be half killed and you won't get any sympathy from me i can tell you and you had a share in it too walter mrs conley was saying in freezing tones if you think he deserves anything more than you gave him cal you have my full permission to repeat the dose. Where is the cause of this unseemly disturbance? demanded Mr. Dinsmore severely. Calhoun, if you have the key of that closet, and those wretched disguises are there, produce them at once. The young man obeyed, while Edna, holding Dick fast, turned a half-frightened look upon her sister, to which the latter, standing with her arms folded, and her back braced against the wall replied with one of cold haughty indifference calhoun drew out the obnoxious articles and held them to view in a flush of mortification upon his face the children screamed and ran be quiet they can't hurt you said the grandfather stamping his foot then turning to calhoun ku klux your property and arthur's i presume you are members doubtless and he glanced from one to the other of his older grandsons in mingled anger and scorn arthur having just entered the room to ascertain the cause of the unusual commotion he flushed hotly at his grandsire's words and look i sir i a ku klux he exclaimed in a hurt indignant tone i a midnight assassin stealing upon my helpless victims under the cover of darkness in a hideous disguise no sir how could you think so ill of me what have i done to deserve it nothing my boy i take it all back said the old gentleman with a grim smile it's not like you a quiet bookish lad with nothing of the coward or bully about you but you calhoun i have no property in these sir and i should scorn to wear one or to take part in the deeds you have spoken of right i am no republican and was strong for succession as any man in the south but i am for open fair fight with mine own enemies or those of my country no underhand dealings for me no cowardly attacks in overwhelming numbers upon the weak and defenseless but if these disguises are not yours whose are they and how came they here i must beg leave to decline answering that question sir replied calhoun respectfully his mother and aunt exchanged glances ah exclaimed their father turning to edna as with a sudden recollection i think i heard you claiming some property in these scarecrows speak out are they yours no sir but I'm not ashamed to own that I helped to make them, and that if I were a man I would wear one. You? You helped make them? And who, pray, helped you? Louise? Yes, sir, Louise it was, replied Mrs. Conley, drawing herself up to her full height, and she is no more ashamed to own it than her sister. And if Calhoun was a dutiful son, 
he would be more than willing to wear one. If you were a dutiful daughter, you would never have engaged in such business in my house without my knowledge and consent, retorted her father, and I'll have no more of it, let me tell you, Madams Conley and Johnson, no aiding or abetting of these midnight raiders. And turning to a servant, he ordered her to take the hideous things into the yard and make a bonfire of them. No, no, cried Edna. Papa, do you understand that you are ordering the destruction of other men's property? It makes no difference, he answered coolly, for they are forfeit by having been brought surreptitiously into my house. Carry them out, Fanny, do you hear? Carry them out and burn them. And pray, sir, what am I supposed to say to the owners when they claim their property? Asked Edna with flashing eyes. Refer them to me, replied her father, leaving the room to see that his orders were duly executed. Calhoun and Arthur had already slipped away. Dick was about to follow, but his mother seized him again by the arm, this time shaking him violently. She must have some one on whom to vent all the rage that was consuming her. You, you bad, troublesome, wicked boy! I could shake the very life out of you, she hissed through her shut teeth, suiting the action to the word. Pretty mess you've made of it. You and Walter, your birthday coming next week, too. There'll be no presents from Ian for you. You may rest assured. I hope Mr. Travilla would send you each a handsome suit as he did last year, but of course you'll get nothing now. Well, I don't care, muttered Dick. It's your fault for making the ugly things. And freeing himself, by a sudden jerk, he darted from the room. The children and servants had trooped after Mr. Dinsmore to witness the conflagration. In Dick's sudden exit left the lady sole occupants of the apartment. I declare it's too bad, too provoking for endurance, exclaimed Edna, bursting into a flood of angry tears. What's the use taking it so hard, returned her sister. You're a perfect iceberg, retorted Edna. That accounts for my not crying over our misfortune. I presume my tears being all frozen up, returned Mrs. Conley, with an exasperating smile. Well, there is comfort in all things. We may now congratulate ourselves that Foster and Boyd did not wait for these, but supplied themselves elsewhere. There was a difference of two years in the ages of Dick Percival and Walter Conley, but they were born on the same day of the same month, and their birthday would occur in less than a week. I say, Wall, what precious fools we've been, remarked Dick, as the two were preparing to retire that night. Why didn't we remember how near it was to our birthday? Of course, as Mother says, there'll be no presents from Ian this time. No, and I wish I'd never seen the hateful things, grumbled Walter. But there's no use crying over spilt milk. No, and we'll pretend we don't care a cent. Mother shan't have the satisfaction of knowing that I do anyhow. And Dick whistled a lively tune as he pulled off his boots and tossed them into a corner. About the same time, Elsie and her husband, seated alone together in their veranda, were conversing on the same subject. Mr. Travilla introduced it. They had been regretting the effect of the fright of the evening upon their children, Vi especially, as the one predisposed to undue excitement of the brain, yet hoping it might not prove lasting. Elsie had just returned from seeing them to bed. I left them much calmed and comforted, she said, by our little talk together of God's constant watch over us, his all-powerful and protecting care and love, and by our prayer that he would have them in his keeping. He pressed her hand in silence, and presently remarked, The birthday of those boys is near at hand. They certainly deserve no remembrance from us, but how do you feel about it? Just as my noble, generous husband does, she said, looking up into his face with a proud, fond smile. Ah, how is that? Like giving them a costlier and more acceptable present than ever before. 
thus heaping coals of fire upon their heads and what shall it be whatever you think they would prefer and would not that be a pony apiece no doubt of it and i will try to procure two worth having before the day comes round talking with her little ones the next morning elsie told them of the near approach of the birthday of dick and walter spoke of the duty of forgiveness and the return of good for evil and asked who of them would like to make their cousins some nice present i should mamma said little elsie eddie looked up into his mother's face dropped his head and blushing deeply muttered i'd rather flog them like papa and cal did so would i they're naughty boys cried vi the tears starting to her eyes at the remembrance of the panic and fear their conduct had cost herself brothers and sister their mother explained that it was their papa's duty to protect his children from injury and that that was why he had flogged naughty dick but now he had forgiven them and was going to return good for evil as the bible bids us and you must forgive them too dears if you want god to forgive you she concluded for jesus says if you forgive not men their trespasses neither will your father forgive your trespasses i can't mamma i don't love them said eddie stoutly ask god to help you then my son but mamma i can't ask him with my heart cause i don't want to love them or forgive them can my boy do without god's forgiveness without jesus s love she asked drawing him to her side you feel very unhappy when mamma or papa is offended with you and can you bear your heavenly father's frown don't look so sorry dear mamma i love you ever so much he said putting his arms about her neck and kissing her again and again i cannot be happy while my dear little son indulges such sinful feelings she said softly smoothing his hair while a tear rolled down her cheek mamma how can i help it try to think kind thoughts of your cousins try to do them all the kindness you can ask god to bless them and help you to love them i want my little vi to do so too she added turning to her mamma i will i don't tend to say cross things about them any more violet answered impulsively and i'll give them the nicest present i can get with all my pocket money mamma must i give them presents asked eddie no son i do not say must you shall decide for yourself whether you ought and whether you will mamma they made me hurt my dear father no eddie no one can make us do wrong we choose for ourselves whether we will resist temptation or yield to it mamma what shall we give asked the little girls talk it over between yourselves daughters decide how much you are willing to spend on them and what your cousins would probably like best i want my children to think and choose for themselves where it is proper that they should but mamma you will advise us yes vi you may consult me and shall have the benefit of my opinion the little girls held several private consultations during the day and in the evening came with a report to their mother elsie was willing to appropriate five dollars to the purpose vi three and the gifts were to be books if mamma approved and would help them select suitable ones i think you have decided wisely she said and as it is too warm for us to drive to the city we will ask papa to order a variety sent out here and he and i will help you in making a choice eddie was standing by nothing had been said to him on the subject since his morning talk with his mother but all day he had been unusually quiet and thoughtful mamma he now said coming close to her side i've been trying to forgive them and i'm going to buy two riding whips one for dick and one for wall if you and papa like me to her smile was very sweet and tender as she commended his choice and told him his resolve had made her very happy the birthday found dick and walter in sullen discontented mood 
spite their resolved not to care for the loss of all the prospects of gifts in honor of the anniversary what's the use of getting up growled dick it's an awful bore the way we've been sent to coventry ever since we got into that scrape with the young ones i've a great mind to lie abed and pretend sick just to scare mother and pay her for her crossness maybe you might get sick in earnest suggested walter i'm going to show up anyhow and he tumbled out upon the floor for it's too hot to lie in bed hark there's pump coming down stairs hark there's pump coming up the stairs to call on us now why what's all that pump the servant rapped and pushing open the door handed a number of brown paper parcels dunno mas well replied the man grinning from ear to ear something for me in and the rest is downstairs one for each of you one what queried dick starting up with a bound placing himself at walter's side birthday present says wish you many happy returns mas wall and mas dick and hope you'd never wear no more klu klux doings but the lads were too busily engaged in opening the parcels and examining their contents to hear or heed his words two riding whips splendid ones and four books exclaimed walter and here's a note here let me read it said dick i declare wall i'm positively ashamed to have them send me anything after the way i've behaved i too but what did they say it's from travilla and cousin elsie said dick turning to the signature i'll read it out he did so it was very kind and pleasant made no allusion to their wrongdoing but congratulated them on the return of the day begged their acceptance of the accompanying gifts stating from whom each came the largest and joint present from themselves and closed with an invitation to spend the day at ian i'm more ashamed than ever aren't you wall dick said his face flushing hotly as he laid the note down yes never felt so mean in my life to think that little eddie sending us these splendid whips and the little girls these pretty books i almost wish they hadn't but where's the larger gift they say is a joint present from themselves oh that must be what pomp called the rest left downstairs come let us hurry and get down there to see what it is toilet duties were attended in hot haste and in a wonderfully short time the two were on the front veranda in eager quest of the mysterious present each boyish heart gave a wild bound of delight as their eyes fell upon the group in the avenue just before the entrance two beautiful ponies ready saddled and bridled in charge of an ian servant old mr dinsmore calhoun and arthur standing near examining and commenting upon them with evident admiration oh what beauties cried dick bounding into the midst of the group whose are they uncle joe well sir answered the old negro pulling off his hat and bowing first to one and then to the other descent hey ye by massa travilla and miss elsie for two boys about the size of you that's done never mean to fret young children no more the lads hung their heads in silence the blush of shame on their cheeks do you answer the description asked calhoun a touch of scorn in his tones yes for we'll never do it again said walter but it's too much they're too kind and he fairly broke down and turned away his head to hide the tears that would come into his eyes that's a fact assented dick nearly as much moved you don't deserve it said their grandfather severely and i'm much inclined to send them back with the request that if they're offered you again it shall not be till a year of good conduct on your part has atoned for the past oh grandpa you wouldn't be so hard so very hard cried dick imploringly stroking and patting the pony nearest him they're such beauties i think you should be ashamed to accept such gifts 
after the way you behaved said arthur so we are but wouldn't it be worse to send them back awfully rude i should say and dick turned a half saucy half beseeching look upon his grandfather the old gentleman smiled in spite of himself and consented in consideration of the boy's penitence for the past and fair promises for the future to allow them to accept the generous gifts uncle joe explained which was for dick and which for walter and springing into their saddles they were off like a shot their grandfather calling after them to be back in ten minutes if they wanted any breakfast end of chapter ten chapter eleven of elsie's motherhood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org elsie's motherhood by martha finley chapter eleventh if thine enemy hunger feed him if he thirst give him drink for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good romans twelve twenty through twenty one splendid cried dick wheeling about toward home now half a mile away we must hurry back or grandpa will be mad i say wall what do you suppose makes travilla and cousin elsie so different from us i mean all of us at roselands i don't know returned walter reflectively maybe because they're christians you know it says in the bible where to return good for evil yes and so heap coals of fire on our enemies heads and wall i feel em burn now i'd give anything not to have coaxed and teased ed into shooting that time and not to have scared him and the others with those frightful disguises so would i and we'll never do the like again dick never will we i reckon not and we must ride over to ian after breakfast and tell them so and thank em for these beauties and the other things yes didn't the note invite us to spend the day there why so it did but i forgot the sight of the ponies knocked it all out of my head so great was the delight of the lads in their new acquisitions that not even the repeated assertions of their mothers or members of the family seconded by the reproaches of their own consciences that they did not deserve it could materially dampen their joy an ungracious permission to accept the invitation to ian was granted them with the remark that calhoun and arthur who were included in it would be there to keep them in order and to report upon their conduct calhoun troubled and mortified by the suspicions which he imagined must have been entertained against him both at the oaks and ian since the escapade of dick and walter had kept himself closely at home during the past week and studiously avoided meeting either his uncle or travilla but with this invitation as the holding out of the olive branch of peace was joyfully accepted the four rode over to ian together directly after breakfast and found themselves greeted with the greatest kindness and cordiality by mr travilla elsie and the children all gathered in the veranda waiting their coming the two culprits shamefaced in view of their ill deserts yet overflowing with delight in their ponies poured out mingled thanks and apologies and promises for the future never mind my lads we will say nothing more about it mr travilla said in his kind cheery way elsie adding you are very welcome and we are sure you do not intend ever again to try to alarm our darlings or tempt them to do wrong she led the way to her beautiful summer parlor a large lofty apartment with frescoed walls and ceiling the floor a mosaic of various colored marbles a bubbling fountain in the center gold and silver fish swimming in its basin windows draped with vines and at the farther end a lovely grotto where a second fountain threw showers of spray over moss-grown rocks and pieces of exquisite statuary 
here they were presently joined by their cousin horace ices and fruits were served and the morning passed in a most agreeable manner enlivened by music conversation and a variety of quiet games mr and mrs travilla laying themselves out for the entertainment of their guest their children had been excused from lessons in honor of the day and with their sweet prattle and merry pretty ways contributed not a little to the enjoyment of their elders mr dinsmore came to dinner calhoun fancied his manner rather cool toward him while dick and walter were left in no doubt of his stern disapproval of them until their cousin elsie said a few words to him in a quiet aside after which there was a decided change for the better calhoun watched his cousin furtively as he had of late formed a habit of doing and he studied her character his respect admiration and affection grew apace he found her so utterly unselfish and sincere so patient and forbearing yet firm for the right so unaffectedly gay and happy something of this he remarked to her when for a few moments they chanced to be alone together ah she said smiling and blushing it is not love or love alone that is blind but you have been looking at me through rosy-colored spectacles as so many of my relatives and friends do but are you not really happy cousin happy ah yes indeed have i not everything to make me so the best of husbands and fathers five darling children comparative youth health wealth that enables me to prove in my own sweet experience the truth of those words of the lord jesus it is more blessed to give than to receive and the best of all she added low and reverently the soft eyes shining through glad tears his love and tender care surround me his strong arms to lean upon his blood to wash away my sins his perfect righteousness put upon me these cousin are more than all the rest and you and every one may have them if you will for his own words are ask and ye shall receive seek and ye shall find him that cometh unto me i will in no wise cast out you give me a new view of religion he said after a moment's surprised thoughtful silence i have been accustomed to look upon it as something suitable perhaps desirable for old age and certainly very necessary for a deathbed but too great a restraint upon youthful pleasures sinful pleasures must indeed be given up by those who would follow christ but they are like apples of sodom beautiful in appearance but bitter and nauseous to the taste while the joys that he gives are pure sweet abundant and satisfying godliness is profitable unto all things having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come they shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house and thou shalt make them drink the river of thy pleasures ah cal if one might safely die without the christian's faith and hope i should still want them to sweeten life's journey another thoughtful pause then the young man said frankly cousin elsie i'm afraid i'm very stupid but it's a fact that i never have been quite able to understand exactly what it is to be a christian or how to become one she considered a moment her heart going up in silent prayer for help to make the matter plain to him and for a blessing on her words for well she knew that without the influence of the holy spirit they would avail nothing to be a christian she said is to believe in the lord jesus christ receiving and resting upon him alone for salvation he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of god in him god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life do not these texts answer both your queries we have broken god's holy law but jesus the god-man has borne the penalty in our stead 
all our righteousness are as filthy rags we dare not appear before the king clothed in them but jesus offers to each of us the pure and spotless robe of his righteousness and we have only to accept it as a free gift we can have it on no other terms it is believe and be saved look and live but there is something beside for us to do surely we must live right yes true faith will bring forth the fruits of holy living but good works are the proofs and effects of our faith not the ground of true christian's hope having nothing whatever to do with our justification the entrance of arthur and young horace put an end to the conversation horace was not less devoted to his elder sister now than in childhood's days arthur distant and reserved with most people had of late learned to be frank and open with her sure and attentive hearing of sympathy and that his confidence would never be betrayed she never sneered never laughed in contempt nor ever seemed to think herself better or wiser than others her advice when asked was given with sweet simplicity and humility as of one not qualified in her own estimation to teach or desirous to usurp authority over others yet she had a clear intellect and sound judgment she opened her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue was the law of kindness there seemed a sort of magnetism about her the attraction of a loving sympathetic nature that always drew her to the young of both sexes and the large majority of older people also the three young men gathered round her hanging upon her sweet looks her words her smiles as argent lovers do upon those of their mistress somehow the conversation presently turned upon love and marriage and she lectured them half playfully half seriously upon the duties of husbands she bade them be careful in their choice remembering that it was for life and looking for worth rather than beauty or wealth then after marriage not to be afraid of spoiling the wife with too much care and thoughtfulness for her comfort and happiness or the keeping up of the little attention so pleasant to give and receive and so lavishly bestowed in the days of courtship ah elsie you are thinking of your own husband and holding him up as a model to us said horace laughingly yes she answered with a blush and a smile a tender light shining in the soft brown eyes that is true ah the world would be full of happy wives if all the husbands would copy his example he is as much of a lover now as the day he asked me to be his wife more indeed for we grow dearer and dearer to each other as the years roll on never a day passes that he does not tell me of his love by word and deed and the story is as sweet to me now as when i first heard it ah good wives make good husbands said mr travilla who had entered unobserved just in time to hear the eulogy upon him boys let each of you get a wife like mine and you cannot fail to be good husbands good husbands make good wives she retorted looking up into his face with a fond smile as he came to her side the trouble is to find such remarked horace regarding his sister with tender admiration true enough said travilla i know not of her like in all the length and breadth of the land catching sight of mr dinsmore pacing the veranda alone calhoun slipped quietly away from the rest and joined him uncle he said coloring and dropping his eyes i think you doubt me have i not reason calhoun mr dinsmore asked looking searchingly into the lad's face yes sir i own that appearances are strongly against me and i cannot disprove the tale they tell but oh if you could trust me still uncle he lifted his head and gazed fearlessly into the keen dark eyes still bent searchingly upon him mr dinsmore held out his hand and cordially grasped 
the one calhoun placed in it well my boy i will try it is far pleasanter than to doubt you but there is some one at roselands who is disposed to aid and abet klu klux in their lawless proceedings i cannot deny that said the nephew yet it would ill become me to say who it is and i think sir since grandpa has set down his foot so decidedly in opposition there will be no more of it travilla and cousin elsie have given me their confidence again and i assure you sir i am deeply grateful to you all End of chapter 11chapter twelve of elsie's motherhood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org elsie's motherhood by martha finley chapter twelfth if thou neglectest or dost unwillingly what i command i'll rack thee with old cramps fill all thy bones with aches and make thee roar thy beast shall tremble at thy din shakespeare's tempest the ian family were spending the day at the oaks it was now early in the fall of eighteen sixty eight and political excitement ran high over the coming presidential election there had been as yet no effectual check given to the lawless proceedings of the ku klux and their frequent raids and numerous deeds of violence had inaugurated a reign of terror that was a shame and reproach to our boasted civilization and free institutions many of the poorer class both blacks and whites dared not pass the night in their houses but when darkness fell fled for safety to the shelter of the nearest woods carrying their beds with them and sleeping in the open air that the ku klux klan was a political organization working in their interests of the democratic party their words to their victims left no doubt the latter were told that they were punished for belonging to the union league or for favoring the republic party or using their influence in its behalf and threatened with severe treatment if they dared vote its ticket or persuade others to do so the outrages were highly disapproved by all republicans and by most of the better class in its opposite party but many were afraid to express their opinions of the doing of the clan lest they should be visited with its terrors while for the same reason many of its victims preferred to suffer in silence rather than institute proceedings or testify against their foes it was a state of things greatly deplored by our friends of the oaks and ian and the monsieur densmore and travilla who were not of the timid sort had been making efforts to bring some of the guilty ones to justice though thus far with very little success such an errand had taken them to town on this particular day they were returning late in the afternoon and were still several miles from home when passing through a bit of woods a sudden turn of the road brought them face to face with a band of mounted men some thirty or forty in number not disguised but rough and ruffianly in appearance and armed with clubs pistols and bowie knives the encounter was evidently a surprise to both parties and reining in their steeds they regarded each other for a moment in grim silence then the leader of the band a profane drunken wretch who had been a surgeon in the confederate army scowling fiercely upon our friends and laying his hand on a pistol in his belt growled out a couple of scallywags mean dirty rascals what mischief have you been at now eh disdaining a reply to his insolence the gentlemen drew their revolvers cocked them ready for instant use and whirled their horses halfway around and backing them out of the road so that they faced it while leaving room for others to pass politely requesting them to do so not so fast returned the leader pouring out a torrent of oaths and curses we've a little account to settle with you too and no times like the present yes shoot them down 
cried a voice in the crowd. Hang them, yelled another. The blankety-blank rascals. Yes, roared a third. Pull them from their horses and string them up to the limb of that big oak yonder. Our friends faced them with dauntless air. You will do neither, said Mr. Dinsmore in a firm, quiet tone. We are well armed and shall defend ourselves to the last extremity. Travilla threw his riding whip into the road, a foot or two in front of his horse's head, saying, as he looked steadily into the leader's eyes, The first one who passes that to come nearer to us is that instant a dead man. The two were well known in the community as men of undoubted courage and determination, also as excellent marksmen. A whisper ran along the lines of their opponents. He's a dead shot, and so's Dinsmore, and they're not afraid of the devil himself. Better let him go for this time. The leader gave the word, forward, and with hisses, groans, and a variety of hideous noises, they swept along the road and passed out of sight, leaving our friends masters of the field. Cruelty and cowardice go hand in hand, observed Mr. Travilla, as they resumed their homeward way. Yes, those brave fellows prefer waging war upon sleeping unarmed men and helpless women and children to risking life and limb in fair and open fight with such as you and I, returned his companion. They are Ku Klux, you think? I am morally certain of it, though I could not bring proof to convict even that rascally Dr. Savage. They agreed not to mention the occurrence in presence of their wives, also that it would be best for Travilla to take his family home early. Mr. Dinsmore and Horace Jr. accompanied them as an escort. This they could readily do without arousing the fears of the ladies, both as they were constantly coming and going between the two places. The sun was nearing the horizon when they reached the oaks. Rose and Elsie were in the veranda, awaiting their coming in some anxiety. Oh, they cried, we are so rejoiced to see you, so thankful that you are safe. We fear that you met some of those dreadful Ku Klux. Yes, wife, we are safe, thanks to the protecting care, which is over us all in every place, Mr. Travilla said, embracing her, as though they had been long parted. Ah, yes, she sighed. How I've been forgetting today the lessons of faith and trust I have tried to impress upon Mrs. Leland. It is far easier to preach than to practice. Little feet came running in from the grounds. Little voices shouted, Papa has come! Papa and Grandpa too! And a merry scene ensued, hugging, kissing, romping, presently interrupted by the call to tea. There was nothing unusual in the manner of either gentleman, and the wives had no suspicion that they had been in peril of their lives. I think it would be well to return home early tonight, Mr. Travilla remarked to Elsie. Yes, she said, on account of the children. So the carriage was ordered at once, and shortly after leaving the table, they were on their way. Elsie, children, and nurses, in the carriage with Mr. Travilla, Mr. Dinsmore and son, all well armed as their mounted escort. Horace had been taken aside by his father and told of the afternoon's adventure, and in his indignation was almost eager for a brush with those insolent ruffians. None appeared, however. Ian was reached in safety. They tarried there an hour or more, then returned without perceiving any traces of the foe. The hush of midnight had fallen upon the oaks, Ian, Fairview, and all the surrounding region, the blinking stars and young moon hanging a golden crescent just above the horizon, looked down upon the sleeping world, yet not all asleep. For far down the road skirted yonder wood, a strange procession approaches, goblin-like figures, hideous with enormous horns, glaring eyeballs, and lolling red tongues, and mounted upon weird-looking steeds, are moving silently onward. They reach a small house hard by the roadside, 
pause before it and with a heavy riding whip the leader thunders at the door the frightened inmates startled from their sleep cry out in alarm and a man's voice asks who's there open the door commands the leader in a strange sepulchral voice i must know first who is there and what's wanted returned the other hurrying on his clothes a shot is fired and penetrating the door strikes the opposite wall open instantly or I'll break in and it will be worse for you thunders the leader and with trembling hands amid the cries of wife and children the man removes the bars draws back the bolts and looks out repeating his question what's wanted nothing this time jim white but to warn you that if you vote the republican ticket we'll call again take you to the woods and flog you within an inch of your life beware forward men and the troop sweeps onward while white closes and bars the door again and creeps back to bed ku klux says the wife shuddering jim will have to hide a nights now like the rest hush hush children they're gone now so go to sleep nothing will hurt you jim you'll mind yes yes betsy though it galls me to be ordered around like a nigger me with as white skin as any of em onward still onward sweeps the goblin train and again and again the same scene is indicated enacted the victim now a poor white and now a freedman at length they have reached fairview they pause before the gate to dismount and make off into the woods and presently reappear bearing on their shoulders a long dark object a little square of white visible on the top they pass through the gate up the avenue and silently deposit their burden at the door return to their companions and with them repair to the negro quarter dismounting they tie their horses to the fence and leaving them in charge of one of their number betake themselves to the nearest cabin surround it break open the door drag out the man carry him to a little distance and with clubs and leathern straps give him a terrible beating leaving him half dead with pain and fright they return to his cabin threaten his wife and children rob him of his gun and pass on to repeat their lawless deeds menacing some beating and shooting others not always sparing women or children the latter perhaps being hurt accidentally in the melee from the quarter at fairview they passed on to that of ian continuing there the same threats and acts of violence winding up by setting fire to the schoolhouse and burning it to the ground the bright light shining in at the open windows of her room awoke little elsie she sprang from her bed and ran to the window she could see the flames bursting from every aperture in the walls of the small building and here and there through the roof curling about the rafters sending up volumes of smoke and showers of sparks and in their lights the demon-like forms of the mischief doers some seated upon their horses and looking on others flitting to and fro in the lucrid glare while the roar and crackling of the flames and the sound of falling timbers came distinctly to her ear at the sight a panic terror seized the child she flew into the room where her parents lay sleeping but with habitual thoughtfulness for others refrained from screaming out in her fright lest she should rouse the little ones she went to her father's side put her lips to his ear and said in a low tremulous voice papa papa please wake up i'm so frightened there's a fire and the ku klux are here oh papa i'm afraid they'll come here and kill you and she ended with a burst of almost hysterical weeping rousing both father and mother what is it darling asked mr travilla starting up to a sitting posture throwing an arm about the child what has alarmed my pet while the mother exclaiming fie is she gone again sprang out upon the floor and hastily threw on a dressing gown no 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 mamma vi's safe in bed but look at the red light on the wall yonder 
it is fire and the ku klux in another moment all three were at the wall overlooking the scene the schoolhouse exclaimed mr travilla i am not surprised for the clan is greatly opposed to the education of the negro and has burned down buildings used for that purpose in other places do you see them wife those frightful-looking horned animals yes she said with a shudder following by a deep sigh and oh edward what may they not be doing to our poor people can we do anything to save them he shook his head sadly no they are out in considerable force and i could do nothing single-handedly against twenty or thirty armed men oh papa mamma i'm so frightened cried little elsie clinging to them both will they come here and hurt us i think not daughter her father said soothingly their raids have hitherto been almost entirely confined to the blacks and poor whites with now and then one of those from the north whom they style carpet-baggers be calm dearest and put your trust in the lord the mother said folding the trembling sobbing child to her breast the beloved of the lord shall dwell safely by him and the lord shall cover him all the day long not a hair of your head shall fall to the ground without your father yes sweet words said mr travilla and remember what the lord jesus said to pilate thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above a short pause in which all three gazed intently at the scene of conflagration then do you see how the walls are tottering said mr travilla and even as he spoke they tumbled together into one burning mass the flames shot up higher than before burning with a fierce heat and roar while by their lucid light the ku klux could be seen taking up their line of march again the two elsies watched in almost breathless suspense till they saw them turn in a direction to take them farther from ian thank god they are not coming here ejaculated mrs travilla in low reverent grateful tones hark mamma papa i hear cries and screams cried little elsie oh it must be some of the poor women and children coming up from the quarter as the child spoke there came a quick sharp tap that seemed to tell of fright and excitement at the outer door of the suite of apartments and an old servant hardly waiting for permission to enter thrust in his head saying in low tremulous tones mars ittered de people's all comin up from de quarter and knockin and cryin to get in dere's been awful times down dere de ku klux yes yes jack i know but be quiet or you'll wake the children open the hall door and let the poor things in of course said mr travilla i'll be down in a moment plenty room on de back veranda mars edward and tween dat in de kitchen very well they'll be safe there but if they don't feel so let them into the hall yes sir the head was withdrawn the door closed and jack's shuffling feet could be heard descending the stairs mr and mrs travilla having each completed a hasty toilet were about to go down but little elsie clung to her mother mamma mamma don't go and leave me please let me go too my darling you'll be quite safe here and it is much earlier than your usual hour for rising but day is breaking mamma and i could not sleep any more besides maybe i could help to comfort them i think she could said her father and mamma gave consent at once they found the back veranda the kitchen and the space between filled with an excited crowd of blacks old and young talking gesticulating, crying moaning and groaning de ku klux de ku klux was on every tongue tell you what darkies one was saying dis debbils why two o dem stop before my do and say you black rascal give us some water quick now for we shoot you through de head den i hand up a gourdful bout a quarter minute you and de first snatch it and pour it right down his throat and hand the gourd back quick as a flash then he turned round and ride off while i filled the cord for another 
and he do just the same. Tell you what, dey's devils. Did you see de horns and the big red tongues wagon? There was a murmur of assent, and a shudder ran through the throng. But Mr. Travilla's voice was heard in cheerful, reassuring tones. No, boys, they are men, though they do the work of devils. I have seen their disguise, and under that long red tongue, which is made of flannel, and moved by the wearer's real tongue, there is a leather bag inside of the disguise, and into it they pour the water, not down their throats. That's so, Moss Edward, cried several, drawing in a long breath of relief. Yes, that is so, boys. And they've been threatening and abusing you tonight? Yes, sir, that's the ebb, cried a score of voices and one after another showed his wounds and told a piteous tale elsie and her namesake daughter swept over their losses and sufferings the medicine closet was unlocked and its stores liberally drawn upon for materials to dress their wounds both master and mistresses attending to them with their own hands and at the same time speaking soothing comforting words and promising to help repair the damage to their property and make good their losses also to bring their enemies to justice if that might be possible it was broad daylight ere the work was finished the veranda was nearly empty now the people slowly returning to their homes mr travilla having assured them the danger was past for the present when elsie caught sight of a woman whom she had not observed until that moment the poor creature had dropped down upon a bench at the kitchen door her right arm hung useless at her side with the left she held the bloody corpse of a puny infant to her breast and the eyes she lifted to the face of her mistress were full of a mute tearless agony elsie's overflowed at the piteous sight oh my poor minerva she said what is this that they have done to you and poor little ben oh 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 miss elsie the klu kluxes they shot through the door and de balls went flying all round and and one hit me on de arm and killed my baby she sobbed oh 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 de doctor mend de arm but de baby he he gone for ever the sobs burst forth with renewed violence while she hugged the still form closer and rocked herself to and fro in her grief gone to heaven my poor minerva to be safe and happy with the dear lord jesus her mistress said in quivering tones the tears rolling fast down her own cheeks and he never have no more miseries honey said aunt dicey drawing near no klu klux come into the garden of the lord to scare him or hurt him bless his little heart wish we are all there safe and happy like he let me wash off the blood and dress him clean for the grave said aunt sally the nurse of the quarter gently taking the child while mr travilla and elsie bound up the wounded arm speaking soothingly to the sufferer and promising the doctor's aid as soon as he could be procured aunt sally sat near attending to the last offices for the tiny corpse little elsie looking on with big tears coursing down her cheeks presently going to her mother's side she whispered a few words in her ear yes dear you may go down to the bureau drawer and choose it for yourself was the prompt reply and the child ran into the house returning directly with a baby's slip of fine white muslin delicately embroidered put this on him aunt sally she said mamma gave me leave to give it then going to the bereaved mother and clasping the dusky toil-worn hand with her soft white fingers don't cry minerva she said you know poor little ben was always sick and now he's well and happy and if you love jesus you will go to be with him some day evidently much gratified by the honor done her dead babe minerva sobbed out her thanks for that and the dressing of her wounded arm and dropping a curtsy followed aunt sally as she bore the little corpse into aunt dicey's cabin close by the scanty furniture of minerva's own 
had been completely demolished by the desperadoes and her husband terribly beaten he and one or two others had not come up with the crowd presumably from inability to do so and mr travilla now mounted his horse and went in search of them they had been left by their assailants in the woods where one uncle mose dreadfully crippled by rheumatism still lay on the ground half dead with bruises cuts and pistol shot wounds another had crawled into his cabin and fainted upon its threshold while a third lay weltering in his gore some yards distant from his mr travilla had them all carried into their houses and made comfortable as circumstances would permit and a messenger was dispatched in all haste for dr barton the family at fairview had slept through the night undisturbed by the vicinity or acts of the raiders mr leland's first intimation of their visit was received as he opened the front door at his usual early hour for beginning his morning round of the plantation he almost started back at the sight of a rude pine coffin directly before him but recovering himself instantly stooped to read a label affixed to the lid beware odious carpet-bagger this is your third and last warning leave the country within ten days or your carcass fills this he read it deliberately through carefully weighing each word not a muscle of his face moving not a tremor agitated his nerves turning to his overseer who at that moment appeared before him bring me a hatchet he said in stern calm tones and be quick park i would not have your mistress see this on any account stepping upon the lid as he spoke he broke it in with a crash finishing his work when the hatchet came by quickly chopping and splinting the coffin up into kindling wood there he said bidding the man to gather the fragments and carry them to the kitchen they will not put me into that at all events what mischief have they been at in the quarter i wonder he added springing into the saddle devil bad work sir most killed two of de boys scared the rest to death said park hastily obeying the order to gather up the bits of wood just gwan tell ye sir when ye told me go for the hatchet indeed hellish work follow me park as quickly as you can and mind not a word of this pointing to the demolished coffin to any one putting spurs into his horse he galloped off into the direction of the quarter but presently catching sight of the still smoking embers of the ian schoolhouse he drew rein for an instant with a sudden exclamation of surprise and regret the wretches what will they do next burn our houses about our ears and sighing he pursued his way indignant anger and tender pity and compassion filled his breast by turns on reaching the quarter and discovering the state of things there worse even than park's report had made it he rode from cabin to cabin inquiring into the condition of the inmates and speaking words of pity and of hope finding several badly bruised and cut and others suffering from gunshot wounds he sent to the house for lint salve and bandages and directed a lad to run to the stables saddle a horse and go immediately for dr barton the doctor over to an now sir returned the boy devil's door last night too sir run over to ian then and ask the doctor to come here when he is through there said mr leland mr travilla came with the doctor and the two planters compared notes in regard to damages mr leland also telling the story of the coffin laid at his door what do you intend doing asked mr travilla inclination says stay and brave it out but i have not fully decided i have invested all my means in this enterprise and have a wife and family of helpless little ones to support that makes it hard indeed yet i fear your life is in great danger but come what may leland i stand your friend if you should be attacked fly to ian 
you will find an open door a hearty welcome and such a protection as i am able to give i think we could conceal you that it would be a matter of difficulty for your foes to find you a thousand thanks god bless you for your kindness sir exclaimed leland with emotion warmly grasping the hand held out to him and the two parted each wending his homeward way End of chapter 12chapter thirteen of elsie's motherhood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org elsie's motherhood by martha finley chapter thirteenth humble love and proud reason keeps the door of heaven love finds admission where proud science fails young Elsie was on the veranda looking for her husband's return to breakfast, for it was already past the usual hour. All alone, little wife? he asked, as he dismounted and came to the steps. Not now, she answered, putting her arms about his neck and looking up at him with her own fond, beautiful smile. But your face is sad, my husband. What news? Sad enough, my little friend poor old uncle mose has been so barbarously handled that he cannot live through the day dr barton says and two others are suffering very much elsie's eyes were full does uncle mose know it she asked yes i told him as tenderly as i could and asked if he was ready to go yes marsland yes mars Elward he said with a triumphant smile for i's got fast hold upon jesus elsie's head was laid on her husband's shoulder the bright drops were coming fast down her cheeks i have sent word to mr wood he went on the poor fellow is anxious to see him and you also yes yes i will go down directly after prayers she said then he told her of the coffin laid at the door of fairview and the threatening words on its lid. She heard it with a shudder. Oh, poor Mr. Leland! Edward, don't you think it would be wise in him to leave for the present? Perhaps so. I fear they will really attempt his life if he stays. But all his means being invested in their view makes it very hard. Where are our children? They went back to the deck of the corpse of Baby Ben with flowers. Ah, here they come, the darlings, as little feet came pattering through the hall. They hastened to their father for their usual morning kiss, and hung about him with tender, loving caresses. But their mother was subdued, and V and Harold told, with a sort of wondering awe, of the poor little dead baby, so still and cold. Are you going out, mamma? asked little Elsie an hour later as mrs travilla appeared dressed in walking costume in the midst of the group of children and nurses gathered under a tree on the shady side of the house yes daughter i am going down to the quarter to see poor uncle mose who is very ill i want you to be mother to the little ones while i am away oh mamma mayn't we go with you cried eddie and v in a breath harold chimed in and me too mamma me too no dears not to-day but some other time you shall the mother answered giving each a good-bye kiss mamma stay with us i's afraid the cooks get to said harold coaxingly clinging about her neck with his chubby arms while the big tears gathered in his great eyes no dear they don't come in the daytime and god will take care of me Papa is down at the quarter, too, and Uncle Joe and Mammy will go with me. And with another tender caress, she gently released herself from the hold and turned away. The children gazed wistfully after her graceful figure as it disappeared among the trees, Uncle Joe holding a great umbrella over her to shield her from the sun, while Mammy and Aunt Sally followed, each with a basket on her arm. Uncle Mose was rapidly nearing that bourne 
whence no traveller returns as his mistress laid her soft white hands on his she felt the chill of death was there you're almost home uncle mose she said bending over him her sweet face full of tender sympathy yes my dear young missus as in de valley he answered speaking slowly with difficulty but bless de lord it's not dark is jesus with you yes missus he is my strength and my song de river's deep and he'll never let me sink de pain in dis old body's dreadful but i never have no more bless de lord do your good works give you this comfortable assurance that you're going to heaven uncle mose bless your heart honey i ain't done none but the blessed lord jesus covers me all with his goodness and god the father accepts me for his sake yes that is it he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of god in him there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded those the words of the good book now will you please sing the twenty-third song and then ask the lord jesus keep hold fast the old nigger till jordan am passed and the gate into the city the request was granted the sweet voice that had thrilled the hearts of many of the rich and noble of earth freely poured forth its richest strains to soothe the dying throes of agony of the poor old negro then kneeling by the humble couch in a few simple touching words she commended the departing spirit to the almighty love and care of him who had shed his blood to redeem it earnestly pleading that the dying one might be enabled to cast himself wholly on jesus and in doing so be granted a speedy and abundant entrance into his kingdom and glory the fervent amen of uncle mose joined in with hers then low and feebly he added de good lord bless you my dear young missus a shadow had fallen on elsie as she arose from her knees she turned her head to find her father standing at her side he drew her to him and pressed his lips tenderly to her forehead you must go now the heat of the sun is already too great for you to be out with safety the low quiet tone was one of authority as of old he was only waiting for her good-bye to uncle mose and then to speak a few kindly words of farewell himself then led her out and placed her in his carriage which stood at the door mr travilla rode up that instant that's right he said little wife i am loath to have you exposed to the heat of the sultry day and you edward can you not come home now she asked not yet wife there are several matters i must attend to first and i want to speak to mr wood who i see is just coming he kissed his hand to her with the gallantry of the days of their courtship and cantered off while the carriage rolled on its way toward the mansion daughter if you must visit the quarter during the sultry weather can you not choose an earlier hour asked mr dinsmore i think i can after this papa and she went on to explain how her time had been taken up before breakfast that morning do you know about mr leland she asked in conclusion yes their next outrage will i fear be an attack upon him then upon you and edward she said her cheeks growing very pale and her eyes filling papa i am becoming very anxious I would have you without carefulness he answered taking her hand in his they can have no power at all against us except it be given them from above my child god reigns and if god be for us who can be against us yes papa and with david let us say in the shadow of thy wings will i make my refuge till these calamities be overpassed mr densmore was still with his daughter when mr travilla returned with the news that uncle mose's sufferings were over and it had been arranged that he and baby ben should be buried that evening at dusk 
the children begged to be permitted to attend the double funeral but their parents judged it best to deny them fearing an onslaught by the ku klux of which there was certainly a possibility i have been talking with leland mr Treville remarked aside to his friend and he proposes that we accompany the procession as a mounted guard good said mr dinsmore horace and i will join you and let us all go armed to the teeth certainly and i accept your offering with thanks some of the boys themselves are pretty fair marksmen but they were all robbed of their arms last night let us surprise them again edward exclaimed elsie with energy and have them practice shooting at mark her husband assented with a smile you are growing warlike in your feelings he said yes i believe in the privilege and duty of self-defense toward the evening mr densmore rode back to the oaks returning to ian with his son shortly before the appointed hour for the obsequies elsie saw them and her husband ride away in the direction of the quarter not without some fluttering of the heart and with a silent prayer for their safety retired with her children for the observatory at the top of the house from whence a few view might be obtained of the whole route from the cabin of uncle mose to the somewhat distant place of the sepulchre the spot chosen for that purpose in accommodation to the superstitious feelings of the blacks which led them to prefer to lay their dead at a distance from their own habitations the children watched with deep interest as the procession formed each man carrying a blazing pine knot passing down the one street of the quarter and wound its slow way along the road that skirted two sides of the plantation then halfway up a little hill where it gathered in a circle about the open grave twilight was past thick clouds hid the moon and torches shone like stars in the darkness mamma what they doing now asked harold listen perhaps you may hear something she answered and as they almost held their breath to hear a wild sweet negro melody came floating upon the still night air they're singing whispered vi singing canaan cause uncle mose and little baby ben got safely there no one spoke again till the strains had ceased with the ending of the hymn now mr wood is talking i suppose remarked eddie in a subdued tone telling them we must all die and which is the way to get to heaven else praying said vi mamma what is die asked harold leaning on her lap if we love jesus darling it is going home to be with him and oh so happy but baby ben die and me saw him in aunt dicey's house that was only his body son the soul that part that thinks and loves and feels has gone away to heaven and after a while god will take the body there too for obvious reasons the service at the grave were made very short and in another moment they could see the line of torches drawing rapidly nearer till it reached the quarter and broke into fragments we will go down now elsie said taking harold's hand papa grandpa and uncle horace will be here in a moment mamma whispered her namesake daughter how good god was to keep them safe from the ku klux yes dearest let us thank him with all our hearts End of chapter 13Chapter 14 of Elsie's Motherhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Elsie's Motherhood by Martha Finley. The more bold, the bustling, and the bad, pressed to usurp the reins of power, the more behooves its virtue with indignant zeal to check their combination thompson the spirit of resistance was now fully aroused within the breasts of our friends of ian and the oaks mr travillas was a type of the american character he would bear along his injuries vexations encroachments upon his rights but when once the end of his forbearance was reached woe to the aggressor 
for he would find himself opposed by a man of great resources unconquerable determination and undaunted courage his measures were taken quietly but with promptness and energy he had been seeking proofs of the identity of the raiders and found them in the case of one of the party whose gait had been recognized by several his voice by one or two while the mark of his bloody hand laid upon the clothing of one of the women as he roughly pushed her out of his way seemed to furnish the strongest circumstantial evidence against him george boyd's right hand had been maimed in a peculiar manner during the war and this bloody mark upon the woman's night-dress was its exact imprint already mr travilla had procured his arrest and had him imprisoned for trial in the county jail yet this was but a small part of the day's work lumber had been ordered and men engaged for the rebuilding of the schoolhouse merchandise also to replace the furniture and clothing destroyed and arms for every man at the quarter capable of using them all this elsie knew and approved as did her father and brother for mrs cardington's sake they deeply regretted that boyd was implicated in the outrage but all agreed that justice must have its course the question had been mooted in both families whether any or all of them should leave the south until restoration should render it a safe abiding place for honest peaceable folk but unanimously decided in the negative the gentlemen scorned to fly from the desperadoes and resigned to their despotic rule over poor dependents in the land of their love nay they would stay and defend both to the uttermost of their power and the wives upheld their husbands in their determination and refused to leave them to meet the peril alone returning from the burial of uncle mose mr densmore and horace spent an hour at ian before riding back to the oaks the three gentlemen were in the library earnestly discussing the state of affairs when elsie coming down from seeing her little one settled for the night heard the sound of wheels in the avenue and stepping to the door saw the ashlands carriage just drawing up in front of it the vehicle had scarcely come to a standstill ere its doors was thrown hastily open and the elder mrs carrington alighted elsie sprang to meet her with outstretched arms and the exclamation my dear old friend though her heart beat quickly her cheek crimsoned and tears filled her eyes the old lady speechless with grief fell upon her neck and wept there silently for a moment then low and gasping in a voice broken with sobs i have to come ask about george she said can it oh can it be that he has done this dreadful thing and shuddered she hid her face on elsie's shoulder her slight frame shaken with the sobs she vainly strove to suppress dear mrs cardington i am so sorry so very sorry to think it said elsie in a voice full of tears my heart aches for you who love him so you who have been sorely afflicted may the lord give you strength to bear up under this new trial he will he does my sister's son oh tis sad tis heart-breaking but the proofs what are they elsie named them first drawing her friend to a seat where she supported her with her arm yes yes his voice his gait are both peculiar and his hand let me see that that garment leading her into a private room and seating her comfortably there elsie had it brought and laid before her mrs carrington gave it one glance and motioned it away with a look and gesture of horror dropping her face into her hands and groaned aloud elsie kneeling by her side clasped her arms about her and wept with her a slayer of the weak and helpless a murderer a midnight assassin groaned the half-distracted aunt may there not possibly be some mistake let us give him the benefit of the doubt whispered elsie alas there seems scarcely room for doubt sighed mrs carrington then with a determined effort to recover her composure 
but don't think dear elsie that i blame you or your husband can i see him and your father if he is here yes they are both here and will rejoice if they can be any comfort or service to you ah i hear papa's voice in the hall asking for me and stepping to the door she called to him and her husband please come in here she said mrs carrington wishes to see you both you are here alone at this late hour my dear madame mr densmore exclaimed taking the old lady's hand in a cordial grasp your courage surprises me ah my good friend they who have little to lose need not have so much to do with fear she answered that was what i told sophie who would have had me defer my call till to-morrow my dear madame you are surely right in thinking that no one would molest you a lady whom all classes unite in loving and honoring mr travilla said greeting her with almost filial respect and affection she bowed in acknowledgment do not think for a moment that i have come to upbraid you gentlemen justice demands that those who break the laws suffer the penalty and i have nothing to say against it though the criminal be my own flesh and blood but i want to hear all about this sad affair they told her briefly all they knew she listened with calm though sad demeanor thank you she said when they had finished that george is guilty i dare hardly doubt and i am far from upholding him in his wickedness as you all know i was strong for ascension and i am no republican now but i say perish the cause that can be upheld only by such measures as these i would have every member in this wicked dreadful conspiracy brought to punishment they are ruining their country but their deeds are not chargeable upon the secessionist of the war time as a class that is certainly true madame we are fully convinced of that mrs carrington the gentleman replied she rose to take leave mr travilla requested her to delay a little till his horse could be brought to the door and he would see her home no no travilla said mr densmore horse and i will do that if mrs carrington will accept our escort many thanks to you both gentlemen she said but i assure you i am not in the least afraid and i would be putting you to unnecessary trouble on the contrary my dear madame it would be a pleasure and as our horses are already at the door we need not delay you a moment said mr dinsmore it will not take us so very far out of our way either and i should like to have a word with sophie upon that mrs carrington gratefully accepted his offer and the three went away together convinced of his guilt mrs carrington made no effort to obtain the release of her nephew but several of his confederates having perjured themselves to prove an alibi in his favor he was soon at large again he showed his face no more at oaks or ian and upon occasion of an accidental meeting with travilla or either of the densmores regarding him with dark scowling looks sometimes adding a muttered word or two of anger and defiance in the meantime damages had been repaired in the quarters at fairview and ian and the men at the latter secretly supplied with arms also the rebuilding of the schoolhouse was going rapidly forward a threatening notice was presently served upon mr travilla ordering him to desist from the attempt as the teaching of the blacks would not be allowed by the ku klux he however paid no attention to the insolent demand and work went on as before mr leland had succeeded in keeping the affair of the coffin from his wife thus saving her from much anxiety and distress to leave just at this time would be a great pecuniary loss and he had decided to remain but he had laid his plans carefully for either resistance or escape in case of an attack a couple of large powerful and very fine watch-dogs were added to his establishment and a brace of loaded pistols and a bowie knife were always within reach of his hand one night the family were aroused by the furious barking of the dogs 
instantly mr leland was out upon the floor hastily throwing on his clothes while his wife with a frightened cry the ku klux ran to the window yes it is they are surrounding the house oh robert fly for your life she cried in the wildest terror oh god save my poor husband from these cruel foes she added dropping upon her knees and lifting hands and eyes to heaven he will marry never fear wife mr leland said almost cheerfully snatching up his weapons as he spoke pray on is the best thing you can do to help me you must fly she said you can't fight twenty men and i think there are at least that many i'll slip out the back door then and make for the woods he answered rushing from the room children and servants were screaming with affright the ruffians thundered at the door calling loudly upon mr leland to come out and threatening to break it down if he did not immediately appear summoning all her courage the wife went again to the window and called to them asking what was wanted leland tell him to come out here at once or it will be the worse for him returned the leader in a feigned unnatural voice he is not here she said he better show himself at once returned the ruffian he will not escape by refusing to do so we'll search every corner till we find him that will be as god pleases she said in a calm firm tone her courage rising with the emergency she was answered with a yell of rage and a repeated order to come down and open the door i shall do no such thing she said and what is more i shall shoot down the first man that sets foot on the stairs it was a sudden resolution that had come to her encouraged by mrs travilla's precept and example she had been for months industriously training herself in the use of firearms and kept her loaded revolver at hand and now she would create a diversion in her husband's favor keeping the raiders at bay at the front of the building while he escaped at the back they believed him to be in the upper story if she could prevent it they should not learn their mistake till he had time to gain the woods and distant pursuit the door could not much longer withstand the heavy blows dealt it already there were sounds as if it were about to give way archie she said turning to her son and speaking very rapidly those men are here to kill your father you must help me to prevent them from coming up to hunt him the rest of you children stop that loud crying which won't do any good kneel down and pray 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 to god to help your father to get away from them archie throw this black cloak around you here are two loaded pistols i will take one you the other we will station ourselves on the landing at the head of the first flight of stairs it is darker in their house than out of doors and they will not be able to see us but as the door falls and they rush in we can see them in their white gowns and against the light come they hurried to the landing now we must not be in too great haste she whispered in his ear keep cool take sure aim and fire low the words had scarcely left her lips when the door fell with a crash and with a yell like an indian war-whoop several disguised men rushed into the hall and hastily advanced toward the stairway but an instant the foremost set foot upon it two shots were fired from above evidently not without effect for with an oath he staggered back and fell into the arms of his comrades he was borne away by two of them while the others returned the fire at random for they could not see their adversaries the balls whisked past mrs leland and her son but they stood their ground bravely and as two of their assailants attempted to ascend the stairs fired again and again driving them back for a moment at the same time sounds of conflict came from the rear of the dwelling an exchange of shots whoops and yells the hurried tramp of many feet and the yelping barking and howling of the dogs and instantly the hall was cleared every man there hastened to join this new struggle apparently satisfied that their intended victim was endeavoring to make his escape in that direction seeing this mrs leland and her son ran to a window overlooking the new scene of contest their hearts beating between hope and fear mr leland had slipped cautiously out the back of the door and revolver in hand stepped into the yard 
but only to find himself surrounded by his foes. They attempted to seize him, but eluded their grasp. He fired right and left, several shots in succession, the others returning his fire and following in hot pursuit. There was no moon that night, and the darkness and a simple suit of black were favorable to Leland for while the long white gowns of the Ku Klux not only tremelled their movements, but rendered each an easy target for his shot, they could take but uncertain aim at him, and on gaining the woods, he was soon lost to their view in the deepened gloom of its recesses. But the balls had been falling about him like hailstones, and as the sounds of pursuit grew fainter, he found himself bleeding profusely from a wound in the leg, he dropped behind a fallen tree and partially staunched the wound with some leaves which he bound on with a handkerchief fortunately left in his coat pocket on retiring that night this was scarcely accomplished when sounds of approaching footsteps and voices told him the danger was not yet over he crouched close in his hiding-place and hardly dared breathe as they passed and repassed some almost stepping on him but he remained undiscovered and at length they abandoned the search and returned to the vicinity of the house gathered up their wounded and went away yet leland felt it was not safe for him to venture back to his home that they might return at any moment but to remain where he was with his wound undressed was almost certain death he resolved to accept mr travilla's offered hospitality if his strength would carry him so far and was rising to make the attempt when the cracking of a dead branch told him some living thing was near and he fell back again listening intently for the coming footsteps robert robert called a low tremulous voice oh mary is it you he responded in low but joyous accents and the next moment his wife's arms were about his neck her tears warm upon his cheek while archie stood sobbing beside them thank god thank god that you are alive she said but are you unhurt no i am bleeding fast from a wound in my leg leland answered faintly i've brought lint and bandages she said let me bind it up as well as i can in the dark daren't we strike a light asked archie no my son it might bring them on us again and we must speak low too yes father but oh what will you do you can't come back home again no i must go on to ian at once while well, i can do so under the cover of darkness travilla has offered to hide me there archie my brave boy i can trust you with this secret father they shall kill me before i tell it i trust you will not be tried so far leland said with emotion i would not save my life at the sacrifice of yours i leave your mother in your care my boy be dutiful and affectionate to her, and be kind to your little brother and sisters. Mary, dear, you and Archie will have to manage the plantation in my absence. And he went on to give some more directions. I will do my best, she said tearfully. And as we have been for months, past frequent visitors at Ian, I can surely go to see you there occasionally without exciting suspicion. Yes, I think so father said archie you can never walk to ian let me bring my pony and help you to mount him then i will lead him to ian and bring him back again that is a bright thought we will do so if you can saddle him in the dark and bring him here very quickly i will try father the boy hastened away in the direction of the stables he returned sooner than they dared to hope with the pony saddled and bridled husband and wife bade a mournful adieu mr leland mounted with his son's assistance and silently they threaded their way through the woods to ian hoo, hoo, hoo. the cry came in loud and clear through the open windows of the bedroom of the master and mistress of ian and startled them both from their slumbers hoo, hoo, hoo. it came again and with a light laugh elsie said ah it is only an owl but to my sleeping ear it sounded like some human cry of distress but edward he had sprung from the bed and was hurrying on his clothes i doubt it is not 
little wife he said it is the signal of distress leland and i had agreed upon and he may be in sore need of aid let me go with you she cried tremulously hastening to don a dressing gown and slippers shall i strike a light no not till we go down below where the shutters are closed there is no knowing what foe may be lurking near seizing his revolvers he left the room as he spoke she followed close behind a pistol in one hand and a lamp and match-box in the other silently they groped their way over the stairs through the halls and corridors till they reached a side door which mr travilla cautiously unbarred who is there he asked scarcely above his breath i sir and mr leland stepped in and fell fainting to the floor elsie had set a lamp upon the table and laid her pistol beside it while her husband carefully secured the door again she struck a light and brought it near together they stooped over the prostrate form he is not dead she asked with a shudder no no only a faint but see he is wounded your keys wife here she said taking from her pocket with a rare presence of mind she had thrust them ere leaving her room they hastened to apply restoratives and bind up the wound more thoroughly than mrs leland had been able to do it restored to consciousness leland gave a brief account of the affair refreshed himself with food and drink set before him by elsie's fair hands and then was conducted by mr travilla to an upper room in a wing of the building dated back to the old days of indian warfare it was distant from the apartments in use by the family and had a large closet entered by a concealed door in the wainscoting here i think you will be safe remarked his host no one but my wife and myself yet knows of your coming and it shall be kept a secret from all but aunt chloe and uncle joe two tried and faithful servants except dr barton he is safe and he will be needed to extract the ball yes and my wife and boy in the dinsmores added leland with a faint smile travilla my good friend i can never thank you enough for this kindness tut man tis nothing are we not told to lay down our lives for the brethren let me help you to bed i fear that leg will keep you there for some days i fear so indeed but i am sincerely thankful to have gotten off so well replied leland accepting the offered assistance a most comfortable nay luxurious prison zell he remarked cheerfully glancing about the elegant and tasteful furniture surely the lions have fallen to me in pleasant places mr travilla smiled we will do what we can to make amends for the loss of liberty it cannot be far from daybreak now i will remove the light throw open the shutters and leave you to rest you must of course be anxious about your family i will ride over to fairview and bring you the news of them within the hour. End of chapter 14to see you here before me shakespeare's othello sir you are very welcome to our house shakespeare day had fully dawned when mr travilla re-entered his sleeping apartment to find elsie in bed again but lying there with wide open eyes how very quiet you came in careful not to disturb me i suppose my good kind husband she said greeting him with a loving look and smile as he drew near her couch yes he answered bending over her fondly stroking her hair i hoped you were taking another nap no i feel as if i should never be sleepy again i'm thinking of poor mrs leland how troubled anxious and distressed she must feel yes i shall ride over there directly and take me with you gladly if you'd like to go you will do her more good than i i doubt it but perhaps both together may be better than either one alone did she act bravely yes she's a noble woman they spent some moments in consulting together 
how to make their guest comfortable and at the same time effectually conceal his presence in the house they rejoiced in the fact that no one but themselves his own son excepted and had been cognizant of his arrival and elsie agreed with her husband that it should be kept secret from the children servants also save chloe and uncle joe whose services would be needed and who would be trusted not to divulge the matter mammy will manage about his meals i know said elsie and dr barton's visits may be supposed to be paid to violet the darling how glad and thankful i am that she seems to be losing her inclination to sleepwalking and i said her husband thankful to god for his blessing on the means used and to barton who is certainly an excellent physician their talk ended husband and wife separated to their different dressing-rooms elsie rang for her maid and aunt chloe appeared in answer to the summons aunt chloe was no longer young or even elderly but had attained to a healthy and vigorous old age and still so delighted in her old pleasant task of busying herself about the person of her young mistress that she would only occasionally resign it to other hands she was a household dignitary head tirewoman and head nurse and much looked up to by the younger servants she came in quietly and dropped a curtsy and said good morning miss elsie i hopes you's well honey but you's up so mighty early ah mammy i'm glad it's you for i have something to tell you yes i'm quite well thank you elsie answered then while making a rapid toilet went on to relate the occurrences of the last few hours winding up by putting the wounded guest in charge of aunt chloe and her husband the old faithful creature accepted the trust with evident pride in the confidence reposed in her this child and uncle joe'll take care of him honey never fear she said carefully adjusting the folds of her mistress's riding habit i'll nurse him to the best of my ability and the good lord'll soon make him well i hope and you and uncle joe will be careful not to let any other servants know that he's here that we will darling for sure the sun was just peeping above the horizon as mr and mrs travilla drew rein before the main entrance to the fairview mansion mrs leland came out to welcome them she was looking pale and worn yet met them with a smile and the words of grateful appreciation of all their kindness then with the quick tears springing to her eyes asked anxiously after her husband's welfare i think he is safe and will do well mr travilla said it seems only to be a flesh wound and that will soon heal with proper treatment and good nursing i shall go from here to dr barton's calling for my wife upon my return but first what can i do for you ah i see your door is quite demolished we must have it replaced with a new and stronger one before night yes that is the most pressing need just now said mrs leland come in and look there is really no other damage except a few bullet holes in the walls and these blood stains on the matting she said with a slight shudder and i am thankful to have escaped so well they stepped into the hall their talk so far had been on the veranda and gazed with interest upon the marks of the night's conflict mrs leland meanwhile giving a graphic account of it a servant was diligently at work cleaning the matting and had nearly obliterated the stains left by the wounded Ku Klux. And you shot him, Mrs. Leland? Elsie said inquiringly. Archie and I, or perhaps both of us, Mrs. Leland answered, leading the way to the parlor. They sat there a few moments, conversing still upon the same theme. You will hardly dare to stay here at night now, Elsie remarked. Yes, where else? I should feel very little safer from the Ku Klux in the woods, and the malaria might rob us of health and even life. Come to Ian, said both her visitors in a breath. You will be most welcome. A thousand thanks, she said with emotion. I do not doubt my welcome, yet fear to give a clue to my husband's hiding place. There might be a danger of that, Mr. Travilla said thoughtfully. But what better place, my dear madame? can you do stay here and put my trust in the lord 
He will take care of me and my helpless little ones. I have been thinking of one of our noble pioneer women of the West, whose husband was killed by the Indians, leaving her alone in the wilderness with six small children, no white person within several miles. Her friends urged her to leave the dangerous spot, but she said, No, this farm is all I have for my own and my children's support, and I must stay here. God will protect and help us. And he did. The Indians, though they knew she was alone, never attacked her. She lay sometimes all night with a broad axe in her hands, ready to defend her babes. But though she could see the savages come into her yard and light their pipes at her brushwood fire, they never approached the house. Elsie's eyes kindled with enthusiastic admiration, then filled with tears. Dear, brave Christian woman, and you will emulate her courage and faith. I shall try. The hearts of the Ku Klux of today are no less in his hands than those of the Indians of that day or this. That is certainly true, and he never fails those who put their trust in him. Mr. Travilla said, rising. Now, wife, I will leave you here while I go for Barton. Oh, stay a moment, Edward, she exclaimed. A thought has struck me. It is not usual for you to go to the doctor yourself. Might it excite suspicion? And can you not trust Uncle Joe as your messenger? Your plan is best, he said with a pleased smile. Let us then hasten home and dispatch him on the errand at once. Dr. Barton found the wound not dangerous, extracted the ball with little difficulty, and left the patient doing well. The attack on Fairview and the disappearance of its owners caused considerable excitement in the neighborhood. There was a good deal of speculation as to what had become of him. Some thought it probable that he had hidden in the woods and died there of his wounds. Others that he had gone north to stay until the reign of terror should be over. No one perhaps suspected the truth. Yet the wrath of the Ku Klux was excited against the Travillas and the Dinsmores of the Oaks by the kindness they showed to Leland's wife and children, and threatening notices were sent ordering them to desist from giving aid and comfort to the Carperbaggers' family. They, however, paid no heed to the insolent demand, but exerted themselves to discover who were the men wounded in the raid, for that more than one had been hurt was evidenced by the bloody tracks in and around the house at Fairview. In this they were not successful, doubtless because the men were from a distance. It being the custom of the organization so to arrange matters that thus they might the more readily escape recognition. The Ian children were at play in the front veranda one morning shortly after breakfast, when a strange gentleman came riding leisurely up the avenue. Harold was the first to notice his approach. Mammy, Mammy, see who's dumbin'? That one de Kluxes? He asked, running in a fright to Aunt Chloe, who sat in the midst with the babe on her lap. Speck not, honey, don't be afraid, she said soothingly, putting her arm about the little trembler. The girls were dressing their dolls, Eddie and Bruno racing back and forth, in and out, having a grand romp. But at Harold's question, Eddie suddenly stood still with an imperative, Down, Bruno, down, sir, be quiet now, and turned to look at the stranger. The gentleman, now close at hand, reined in his horse, lifted his hat, and with a winning smile said, Good morning, my little lads and lasses. Is your mother in? No, sir, she and papa have gone out riding, replied Eddie, returning the bow and smile. Elsie laid aside her doll and stepped forward said with a graceful little curtsy, Good morning, sir. Will you dismount and come in? Papa and Mamma will be here in a few minutes. Aha! Um, hmm, aha! Yes, my little lady, I will do so. Thank you, returned the gentleman, giving his horse into the care of a servant, summoned by Eddie. Will you walk into the drawing-room, sir? Elsie asked. No, thank you, he replied, seating himself among them and sending a glance of keen interest from one to the other. One look into the pleasant, genial face banished Harold's fears, and when the stranger held out his hand, saying, I'm your mamma's cousin, won't you come and sit on my knee? The child went to him at once, while the others gathered eagerly about. Mamma's cousin! Then she'll be very glad to see you, said Elsie, 
but she never told us about you observed eddie aha aha um hm aha but did she ever tell you about any of her mother's kin no sir said elsie i asked her once and she said she didn't know anything about them she wished she did aha aha um ha aha well she soon will child you look very like a picture of your great-grandmother that hangs in my house in edinburgh a bonny lass she must have been when it was taken yes sir and she's the picture of mamma remarked eddie everybody says so aha aha hum mm, aha has you got any little boys and girls at your house asked harold yes my man a quiver full of them are they good do they love jesus asked Vi. please tell us about them if you'd like to sir said elsie with a sweet gentle gravity Vi, dear you know we mustn't tease no i didn't mean to tease Vi answered blushing please excuse me sir and don't tell it unless you want to no no it will give me pleasure my dear i enjoy talking of my darlings especially now when they are so far away he seemed about to begin when elsie blushing deeply said excuse me sir i have been very remiss in my hospitalities it is early and perhaps you have not breakfasted yes thank you my dear i took breakfast at the village hotel where i arrived last night but you will take a cup of coffee and some fruit her sentence was broken off for at that instant a lady and gentleman came yelping up the avenue and the little ones hailed them with a joyous shout mamma and papa another moment and mr travilla had dismounted gallantly assisted his wife to do the same and together they stepped into the veranda both bowed politely to the stranger and the children running to them cried mamma mamma it's your cousin from scotland she turned inquiringly to him a flush of pleasure on her face he had risen from his seat and was coming toward her with outstretched hand and earnest admiring gaze my name is ronald lilburn your maternal grandmother and mine were sisters he said and your grandmother's marriage was displeasing to her father and all intercourse between her and the rest of the family was broken off in obedience to his stern command and thus they lost sight of each other i have brought you proofs of but elsie's hand was already laid in his while glad tears sprang to her eyes you shall show us them at another time if you will but i could never doubt such a face as yours and cannot tell you how glad i am to have at last found a relative on my mother's side of the house cousin you are welcome welcome to ian and she turned to her husband yes he said offering his hand with the greatest cordiality welcome indeed and not more so to my little wife than to myself thanks to you both he said with a bow and a smile cousin with an earnest look at his hostess you are very like a picture i have of your grandmother but with a glance at the wide-eyed little ones looking on and listening in wonder and surprise can it be that you are the mother of all these yourself scarcely more than a baron in appearance elsie laughed lightly ah cousin you have not examined me closely yet i have been a baron for many years how glad papa will be edward to see a relative of my mother's no doubt of it wife we must send him word immediately mr lilburn had no reason to complain of his reception he was treated with the utmost hospitality and his coming made the occasion of general rejoicing in the household refreshments were promptly set before him a handsome suite of apartments appropriated to his use and a manservant directed to attend upon his person a note was sent to oakes inviting the whole family to ian the children were given a holiday and elsie her husband and father spent the morning in conversation with their guest and examining family records miniatures and photographs which he had brought with him the day passed most agreeably to all the new-found relatives were mutually pleased and interested in each other mr lilburn was evidently a gentleman of intelligence polish and refinement seemed to be an earnest christian too and in easy circumstances the little folks made friends with him at once 
as children are apt to be quick at reading character the older ones felt this to be a confirmation of the good opinion he had already won from them End of chapter fifteen Chapter Sixteen of Elsie's Motherhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Elsie's Motherhood by Martha Finley. Chapter Sixteenth. I know that there are angry spirits and turbulent mutterers of stifled treason who lurk in narrow places and walk out muffled to whisper curses to the night disbanded soldiers discontented ruffians and desperate libertines who lurk in taverns byron a bright warm day some hours after sunrise a man of rather gentlemanly appearance well though not handsomely dressed is riding leisurely along the public highway he wears a broad-brimmed straw hat as a protection from the sun and a linen duster somewhat soiled by the dust of travel. He has a shrewd, though not unkindly, face, and a keen grey eye whose quick glances seem to take in everything within its range of vision. It is a lonely bit of road he is travelling, and he moves with caution, evidently on the alert for any appearance of danger. Presently he perceives another solitary horseman approaching from the opposite direction, and at the sight lays his hand on the pistols in his belt concealed by the duster to make sure that they are ready for instant use but at the same time keeping steadily on his way the newcomer is a slender boy of eighteen or twenty not at all dangerous looking as the two near each other each lifts his hat with a courteous good morning sir the lad at the same time carelessly sliding his right hand down the left lapel of his coat the movement, slight as it was, had not escaped the watchful grey eyes, and instantly their owner replied by sliding his hand in the same manner down the right lapel of his coat. The lad then ran his fingers lightly through his hair, and the other imitated his action. The lad opened his coat, and seemed to be searching for a pin. The man opened his, took out a pin, and handed it to him with a polite bow. "'Thanks.' all right sir i perceive you are one of us said the boys drawing a paper from his pocket and presenting it to the man miller's woods and touching his hat he galloped away there was a twinkle in the grey eyes as they shot one swift glance after him then the paper was opened and examined with minute care on it was a half moon with several dates written in different places about it and that was all yet its new possessor regarded it with great satisfaction and after a careful scrutiny bestowed it safely in his breast pocket i'll be on hand without fail he said in a low confidential tone perhaps addressing his horse as there was no one else within hearing to-night they're late serving my notice but better late than never for me though perhaps not for themselves he added with a grim smile well my preparations won't take long dress suits all ready he kept on his way at the old leisurely pace presently came in sight of fairview passed it then iron diligently using his eyes as he went made a circuit of several miles and returned to the town which he had left some hours previously dismounting at the village tavern he gave his horse into the care of the hostler and joined a group of idlers about the barroom door they were talking politics and one appealed to him for his opinion don't ask me he said with a deprecatory gesture i'm no party man and never meddle with politics on the fence eh just the place for a coward and a sneak returned his interlocutor contemptuously the other half drew his bowie knife and thrusting it back again said good-humouredly i'll let that pass green you've taken a drop too much and are not quite compass mentis just now be quiet will you green spoke up one of his companions you know well enough snell's no coward why didn't he risk his life the other day to save your boy from drowning yes i'd forgot i take that back snell will you have a glass thank you no it's too hot and your wife and babies need the money green the words were half drowned in the clang of the dinner bell and the group scattered snell and most of the others hurrying into the dining-room in answer to the welcome call 
After dinner, Snell sauntered out in the direction of the stable, passed with a seemingly careless glance in at the door, and strolled onward, but in that momentary glimpse had noted the exact position of his horse. About ten o'clock that night he stole quietly out again, made his way unobserved to the stable, saddled and bridled his steed, all in the dark, mounted and rode away, passing through the village streets at a very moderate pace, but breaking into a round trot as soon as he had fairly reached the open country. He pressed on for several miles, but slackened his speed as he neared the forest known as Miller's Woods. For the last mile or more he had heard, both in front and rear, the thumping of horses' hoofs, and occasionally a word or two spoken in an undertone by gruff voices. He was anxious to avoid an encounter with their owners, and on reaching the outskirts of the wood, suddenly left the road, and springing to the ground, took his horse by the bridle, and led him along for some rods under the trees, then, fastening him securely, opened a bundle he had brought with him, and speedily arrayed himself in the hideous Ku Klux disguise. He stood a moment intently listening, the same sound still coming from the road, evidently many men were travelling it that night, and Snell reflected with grave concern, though without a shadow of fear, that if seen and recognised by any one of them, his life would speedily pay the forfeit of his temerity, for spite of his acquaintance with their secret signs, he was not a member of the order. He was, in fact, a detective in pursuit of evidence to convict the perpetrators of the outrages which had been so frequent of late in that vicinity. Making sure that his arms were in readiness for instant use, he hastened on his way, threading the mazes of the wood with firm, quick, but light step. He had proceeded but a short distance, when he came upon a sentinel who halted him. Snell slapped his hands together twice, quick and loud. The sentinel answered in the same manner, and permitted him to pass. The same thing was repeated twice, and then a few steps brought him into the midst of the assembled clan, for it was a general meeting of all the camps in the county which together composed the clan. Snell glided, silently and unquestioned, to a place among the others, the disguise and the fact of his having passed the sentinels lulling all suspicion. Most of those present were in disguise, but some were not, and several of these the officer recognised as men whom he knew by name and by sight, among them Green and George Boyd. A good deal of business was transacted, several raids were decided upon, the victims named, the punishment to be meted out to each prescribed, and the men to execute each order appointed. One member after another would mention the name of some individual who had become obnoxious to him personally, or to the clan, saying that he ought to be punished, and the matter would be at once taken up, the arrangements made to carry out his suggestion. Boyd mentioned the name of Edward Travilla, owner of Iron, cursing him bitterly as a scalawag, a friend of carpet-baggers, and of the education and elevation of the Negroes. Right, his case shall receive prompt attention, said the chief. Let it be a severe whipping administered to-morrow night between the hours of twelve and two, proposed Green, and the motion was put to vote, and carried without a dissenting voice. And let me have a hand in it, cried Boyd fiercely. You belong to the neighbourhood and might be recognised, objected the chief. I'll risk it. I owe him a sound flogging or something worse, returned Boyd. We all do, for he'd have every mother's son of us sent to jail or hanged if he could, growled another voice on Snell's right, while from a mask on the left there came in sepulchral tones the words, It had better be hands off with you then, man, the speaker pointing significantly to Boyd's maimed member. It shall, cried he, but I flatter myself this right hand, mutilated though it be, can lay on the lash as vigorously as yours, sir. After a little more discussion, Boyd's wish was granted, his fellow raiders were named, and presently the meeting was closed, and the members began to disperse. Snell thought he had escaped suspicion thus far, but his heart leaped into his mouth as a man whom he had heard addressed as Jim Blake suddenly clapped his hand on his shoulder, exclaiming, Aha! I know you, old chap. You do? Who am I, then? queried the spy in a feigned, unnatural voice, steady and cool, spite of the terrible danger that menaced him. Who? How, Williams, no disguise could hide you from me. 
Snell drew a breath of relief. Ha-ha, Jim, I didn't think you were so cute. He returned in his vain voice and glided away presently, disappearing, as the others were doing, in the deeper shadows of the wood. He thought it not prudent to go directly to the spot where he had left his horse, but reached it by a circuitous route, doffing his disguise by rolling it into a bundle as he went. He paused a moment to recover breath and listen. All was darkness and silence. The conspirators had left the vicinity. Satisfied of this, he led his horse into the road, mounted, and rode back to the town. There everyone seemed to be asleep except in a drinking saloon, whence came sounds of drunken revelry and the bar-room of the tavern where he put up. A light was burning there, but he avoided it, attended to his horse himself, returning it to the precise spot where he had found it, then slipped stealthily up to his room, and without undressing, threw himself upon the bed, and almost immediately fell into a profound slumber. End of chapter 16Chapter 17 of Elsie's Motherhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Elena May. Chapter 17 of Elsie's Motherhood. Abate the edge of traitors, gracious Lord, that would reduce these bloody lands again, and make poor England weep in streams of blood. Shakespeare. The sun had just risen above the treetops, as Solon led Beppo, ready saddled and bridled for his master's use, from the stables to the front of the mansion. A moment later, Mr. Travilla came out, gave some orders to the servant, and was about to mount, when his attention was attracted by the approach of a man on horseback, who came cantering briskly up the avenue. "'Good morning,' he said, as the stranger drew near. "'Solon, you may hitch Beppo and go to your work.' "'Good morning, Mr. Traveller, sir,' returned the horseman, lifting his hat and bowing respectfully, as Solon obeyed the order in regard to Beppo, and, with a backward glance of curiosity, disappeared round the corner of the building. "'You bring news, Martin?' said Mr. Traveller, stepping nearer to the stranger and looking earnestly into his face. "'Yes, sir, and very bad, I'm sorry to say, unless—' and he bent low over his saddle-bow and spoke in an undertone unless you can defend yourself against a band of thirty-five or forty ruffians. "'Fasten your horse to that post yonder, and come with me to my private room,' said Travilla, in calm tones. Martin, alias Snell, immediately complied with the request, and as soon as he found himself closeted with Mr. Travilla, proceeded to give him a full account of his last night's adventure. "'I assure you, sir,' he concluded, I look upon it as a piece of rare good fortune that I came upon that lad yesterday, and that he mistook me for one of the clan. Otherwise, you'd have had no warning. It was a kind providence, Martin, returned Mr. Traveller, with grave earnestness. If God be for us, who can be against us? Nobody, sir, and that's the most Christian way of looking at the thing, no doubt. But, if I may ask, what will you do? Fight or fly? How do you know I shall do either? Mr. Traveller asked with a slight twinkle in his eye. "'Because you're not the man to tamely submit to such an outrage.' "'No. As my wife says, I believe in the duty and privilege of self-defense, and for her sake and my children's, even more than my own, I shall attempt it. I am extremely obliged to you, Martin.' "'Not at all, sir. It was all in the way of business, and in the interests of humanity, law, and order. No, no, sir. Thank you. I am not to be paid for doing my duty,' he added hastily putting back a check, which his host had filled out and now handed to him. "'I think you may take it without scruple,' said Mr. Traveller. "'It is not a bribe, but simply a slight expression of my appreciation of an invaluable service you have already rendered me.' "'Still, I'd rather not, thank you, sir,' returned the detective, rising to go. "'Good morning. I hope I shall hear tomorrow that the raiders have got the worst of it.' Left alone, Mr. Traveller sat for a moment in deep thought. Then, hearing Mr. Lilburn's voice in the hall, stepped out and exchanged with him the usual morning salutations. "'So you are not off yet?' remarked the guest. "'No, but I am about to ride over to the Oaks. Will you give me the pleasure of your company?' "'With all my heart.' Elsie descended the stairs. "'Wife,' 
said Mr. Traveller, turning to her. "'Your cousin and I are going to ride over to the Oaks immediately. "'Will you go with us?' "'Yes, thank you,' she answered rightly, as she stepped to the floor. "'Then, catching sight of her husband's face, and seeing something unusual there. "'What is it, Edward?' she asked, gliding swiftly to his side, and laying her hand upon his arm, while the soft eyes met his with a loving, anxious look. He could scarce refrain from touching the sweet lips with his own. "'My little friend, my brave true wife,' he said, with a tender sadness in his tone. "'I will conceal nothing from you. I have just learned through a detective that the Ku Klux will make a raid upon Ion tonight, between twelve and two, and my errand to the Oaks is to consult with your father about the best means of defense, unless your voice is for instant flight for ourselves, our children, and guests.' Her cheek paled, but her eye did not quail, and her tones were calm and firm as she answered. It is a question for you and Papa to decide. I am ready for whatever you think best. Bravo! cried her cousin, who had listened in surprise to Mr. Traveller's communication. There is no coward blood in my kinswoman's vein. She is worthy of her descent from the old wigs of Scotland, eh, Traveller? Worthy of anything good and great, returned her husband with a proud, fond glance at the sweet foot. "'Worthy of anything good and great,' returned her husband, with a proud, fond glance at the sweet face and graceful form by his side. "'Aha! Mm-hmm! So I think. And say, if they are really about to ta attack you, those cowardly ruffians. Well, sir, my voice is for war. I'd like to help you give them their deserts. "'It would seem cowardly to run away.' and leave our wounded friend and helpless dependents at their mercy elsie exclaimed her eye kindling and her cheek flushing while she drew up her slender figure to its full height our beautiful land too given up to anarchy and ruin this dear sunny south that i love so well her voice trembled with the last words and tears gathered in her eyes yes that is it said her husband we must stay and battle for her liberties, and the rights guaranteed by her laws to all her citizens. Horses were ordered, Elsie returned to her apartments to don a riding habit, and in a few minutes the three were on their way to the Oaks. The vote there was also unanimous in favor of the policy of resistance. Mr. Dinsmore and Horace Jr. at once offered their services, and Arthur Conley, who happened to be spending a few days at his uncle's just at that time, did the same. I was brought up a secessionist, and my sympathies are still with the Democratic Party, he said. But these Ku Klux outrages I cannot tolerate. Especially, he added, looking at Elsie with an affectionate smile, when they are directed against the home and husband, if not the person, of my sweet cousin. You are to me a kinsman born, a clansman true, Art, she said, thanking him with one of her sweetest smiles. That's right, old fellow, cried Horace, slapping his cousin on the shoulder. We shall muster pretty strong. Papa, Brother Edward, Mr. Lilburn, you and I. Six able-bodied men within the fortress, with plenty of the best small arms and ammunition. All of us fair shots, too. Some excellent marksmen. We ought to do considerable execution among our assailants. And, God being on our side, said Mr. Lilburn, reverently, we may have strong hope of being able to beat them back. Yes, the race is not always to the swift, nor the battle to the strong remarked Mr. Dinsmore. Some trust in chariots, and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. And if we do so truly, fully, he will take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for our help, added Mr. Travla. The plan of defense was next discussed, but was not fully decided upon. It was agreed that could be done most readily upon the spot, and accordingly Mr. Dinsmore and the two young men should ride over to Ion shortly after breakfast to view the ground and consult again with the other two why not return with us and breakfast at ion asked elsie why not stay and breakfast with us said rose certainly said her husband take off your hat daughter and sit down to your father's table as of old ah oh, my little ones i know they are watching now for mamma and wondering at her long delay then i shall not detain but rather speed you on your way he said leading out and assisting her to mount her horse the children had thought Mamma's ride a long one that morning, and they wondered at Papa's unusual silence and abstraction. He quite forgot to romp with them, but indeed there was scarcely time, 
as he did not come in from the fields till the breakfast bell had begun to ring grace had just been said and every one was sitting silent quietly waiting to be helped the children were all at the table for cousin ronald who had been with them for a week was now considered quite one of the family mr traveller took up the carving knife and fork with the intent to use them upon a chicken that lay in a dish before him but the instant he touched it with the fork a loud squawk made everybody start and harold nearly tumbled from his chair why they forgot to kill it he cried breathlessly but its head's off said eddie gazing into the dish in wide-eyed astonishment aha mm -hmm. is that the way you american fellows behave at table asked cousin ronald gravely but with a slight twinkle in his eye pushing back his chair a little while keeping his eyes steadily fixed upon the ill-mannered bird as if fearful that its next escapade might be to fly into his face a singular breed they must be elsie and her husband began to recover from their momentary surprise and bewilderment and exchanged laughing glances while the latter turning to his guest said capitally done cousin wouldn't have disgraced signor blitz himself nor any of his guild but i had no suspicion that ventriloquism was one of your many accomplishments what part shall i help you to the leg if you please who knows but i may have use for more than two to-night a gleam of intelligence lighted up little elsie's face oh i understand it now she said with a low silvery laugh cousin is a ventriloquist what's that asked vi oh i know cried eddie cousin ronald don't you have a great deal of fun doing it well my boy perhaps more than i ought seeing it's very apt to be at other folks expense the guest mamma and elsie having been helped it was now vi's turn to play, claim papa's attention what shall i send you daughter he asked oh nothing papa please no no i can't eat live things she said half shuddering it is not alive my child violet looked utterly bewildered she had never known her father to say anything that was not perfectly true yet how could she disbelieve the evidence of her own senses papa could it hollow so loud when it was dead she asked deprecatingly it did not my little darling twas i said cousin ronald preventing papa's reply the chick seemed to make the noise but it was really i papa and mamma both confirmed this statement and the puzzled child consented to partake of the mysterious fowl minna standing with her basket of keys at the back of her mistress's chair tom and prilla waiting at the table had been as much startled and mystified by the chicken's sudden outcry as by herself and seized with superstitious fears almost turned pale with terror mr lilburn's assertion and the concurrent assurance of her master and mistress relieved their fright but they were still full of astonishment and gazed at the guests with wonder and awe of course the story was told in the kitchen and created much curiosity and excitement there the, this excitement however was soon lost in greater when the news of the unexpected attack from the ku klux circulated among them an hour or two later it could not be kept from the children but they were calmed and soothed by mamma's assurance god will take care of us my darlings and help papa and grandpa and the rest to drive the bad men away mamma said vi we little ones can't fight but if we pray a good deal to god will that help yes daughter for the Bible tells us that God is the hearer and answerer of prayer. Elsie herself seemed entirely free from agitation and alarm. Full of hope and courage, she inspired those about her with the same feelings. The domestic machinery moved on in its quiet, regular fashion. The kitchen department, it is true, was the scene of much earnest talk, but the words were spoken with bated breath, and many an anxious glance from door and windows as if the speakers feared the vicinity of some lurking foe aunt dicey was overseeing the making of a huge kettle of soft soap tis like this year's a long time comin she said giving the liquid a vigorous stir then lifting her paddle and holding it over the kettle to see if it dripped off in the desired ropey condition but there this old sin no business growlin bout that ya yeah, ya yeah. and dropping the paddle she put her hands on her hips rolled up her eyes and fairly shook with half-suppressed laughter what you larfin at aunt dicey pears you's mighty tickled bout suffin remarked the cook looking up in wonder and curiosity from the eggs she was beating 
"'What's the fun, Aunt Dicey?' asked Uncle Joe, who sat in the doorway, busily engaged in cleaning a gun. "'Why, don't you see, darkies? The soap they ain't gwine to come till about the time the clucks has come round here. Then this child give them a very warm deception. Yah, yah, yah! A powerful hot one, observed the cook, joining in the laugh. But they won't mind it. They's covered up, you know. Thank no difference, remarked Uncle Joe. The gowns and masks, they's nothing but cotton cloth, and the soap will permeate right true and scald the rascal's skins. That's so, and take the skin off, too. Uncle Joe stopped work amused a moment, scratching his head and gazing into vacancy. Clar to goodness, that's a splendid idea, Aunt Dicey, he burst out at length, and let's have a kettle of boiling light to tote up the stairs in the house, about the time we see the clucks is coming up the road. Then Aunt Chloe and Prilla can't spits it out of the windows, a dip a full at a time. Can you get em ready for then? That I can, she replied with energy. This consecrated light don't take no time to fix. I'll have it ready, show as you live. Meanwhile, the party from the Oaks had arrived according to appointment, and, with Mr. Travilla and his guest, were busy with their arrangements for the coming conflict, when, quite unexpectedly, old Mr. Dinsmore and Calhoun Conley appeared upon the scene. "'We've broken in upon a conference, I think,' remarked the old gentleman, glancing from one to another, and noticing that the entrance of himself and his grandson seemed to have thrown a slight constraint over them. "'Rest assured, sir, that you are most welcome,' replied Mr. Travla. "'We were conferring together on a matter of importance, "'but one which I am satisfied need not be concealed from you or Cal. "'I have had certain information that the Ku Klux—' "'Stay!' cried Calhoun, springing to his feet, "'a burning flush rising to every hair. "'Don't, I beg of you, cousin, say another word in my presence. "'I—I I know I'm liable to be misunderstood. "'A wrong construction put upon my conduct,' he continued. "'glancing in an agony of shame and entreaty "'from one astonished face to another. "'But I beg you will judge me leniently "'and never, never doubt my loyalty to you all.' "'And bowing courteously to the company, "'he hastily left the room, "'and hurrying out of the house, "'mounted his horse and galloped swiftly down the avenue. "'For a moment those left behind "'looked at each other in dumb surprise. "'Then old Mr. Dinsmore broke the silence "'by a muttered exclamation. "'Has the boy gone daft?' "'I think I understand it, sir,' said his son. "'Poor Cal has been deceived and cajoled into joining that organization, "'under a misapprehension of its deeds and aims, "'but having learned how base, cruel, and insurrectionary they are, "'has ceased to act with them, or rather has never acted with them, "'yet is bound by oath to keep their secrets and do nothing against them. "'Would be periling his life by taking part against them,' added Mr. Chavla. "'I think he has done the very best he could under the circumstances.' He then went on with his communication to the old gentleman, who received it with a storm of wrath and indignation. "'It is time indeed to put them down when it has come to this,' he exclaimed. "'The idea of their daring to attack a man of your standing, an old family like this, of the best blood in the country. I say it's downright insolence, and I'll come over myself and help chastise them for their temerity.' "'Then you counsel resistance, sir,' queried his son. "'Counsel it? Of course I do.' "'Nobody but a coward and a poltroon would think of anything else. "'But what are your plans, Traveller? "'To barricade the verandas with sandbags and bales of cotton, "'leaving loopholes here and there, "'and post ourselves behind these defences, "'and do what execution we can upon the assailants. "'Good. Who's your captain? "'Your son, sir. Very good. "'He has had little or no experience in actual warfare, "'but I think his maiden effort will prove a success. "'If on seeing our preparations they depart peaceably, well and good remarked Travilla, but if they insist on forcing an entrance, we shall feel no scruples about firing upon them. Hmph! I should think not indeed, grunted the old gentleman. Self-defense is the first law of nature. And we are told by th our Lord, all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword, observed his son. The arrangements completed, the Dinsmores returned to their home for the rest of the day. About dark, the work of barricading was begun. All the able-bodied men upon the plantation, both house servants and field hands, being set to work at it. The materials had been brought up to the near vicinity of the house during the day. The men's hearts were in the undertaking. Not one of them but would have risked his own life freely in defense of their loved master and mistress, and many hands made light and speedy work. While this was in progress, old Mr. Dinsmore and the whole family from the Oaks arrived. 
rose and her daughter preferring to be there rather than left at home without their natural protectors elsie welcomed them joyfully and at once engaged their assistance in loading for the gentlemen the little ones were already in bed and sleeping sweetly secure in the love and protecting care of their earthly and their heavenly father little elsie now ten years old was no longer required to retire quite so early but when her regular hour came she went without a murmur she was quite ready for bed and had just risen from her knees when her mother came softly in and clasped her in a tender embrace mamma dear mamma how i love you and papa too whispered the child twining her arms about her mother's neck don't let us be afraid of those wicked men mamma i'm sure god will not let them get papa because we have all prayed so much for his help all of us together in worship this morning and this evening and we children up here for jesus said if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything they shall ask it shall be done for them of my father which is in heaven yes darling and he will fulfil his word he will not suffer anything to befall but what shall be for his glory and our good now dear daughter lie down and take that promise for a pillow to sleep upon and if waked by the sounds of conflict lift up your heart to god for your dear father and mine and all of us i will mamma i will leaving a loving kiss on the sweet young lips and another on the brow of her sleeping violet the mother glided noiselessly from the room what is it mammy she asked on finding her faithful old nurse waiting to speak to her in the outer room miss elsie honey is you willin to let us scald them cluxes wid boilin soap and lye scold them mammy she exclaimed with a slight shudder i can hardly bear the thought of treating a dog so cruelly but they's worse than dogs miss elsie dogs never come and attack folks that sleep quietly in their beds does they now no and these men would take my husband's life you may fight them with all and any weapon you may lay hands on aunt chloe returned her thanks and proceeded to give an account of the plan concocted by aunt dicey and uncle joe elsie returning to the dining-room repeated it there excellent exclaimed her brother come hart let's hang a bell in the kitchen and attach a string to it taking the other end up to the observatory the suggestion was immediately carried out it had been previously arranged that the two young men should repair to the observatory and their watch for the coming of the foe and on their first appearance probably a mile or more distant give the alarm to those below by pulling a wire attached to that from which the front door bell was suspended thus setting it to ringing loudly now they were prepared to sound the tocsin in the kitchen also thus giving time for the removal of the boiling lye from the fire to the second story of the mansion where it was to be used according to uncle joe's plan the detective had reported the assailing party as numbering from thirty-five to forty but the ion force although much inferior in point of numbers even with the addition of eight or ten negro men belonging to the oaks and ion who were tolerably proficient in the use of firearms certainly had the advantage of position and of being on the side of right and justice the gentlemen seemed full of cheerful courage the ladies calm and hopeful yet they refused to retire though strongly urged to do so insisting that sleep would be simply impossible it was but ten o'clock when all was ready yet the young men deemed it most prudent to betake themselves at once to their outlook since there might possibly have been some change in the plans of the enemy the others gathered in one of the lower rooms to while away the tedious time of waiting as best they could conversation flagged they tried music but it had lost its charms for the time being they turned away from the piano and harp and sank into silence the house seemed strangely silent and the pattering of bruno's feet as he passed slowly down the whole length of the corridor without came to their ears with almost startling distinctness then he appeared in the doorway where he stood turning his eyes from one to another with a wistful questioning gaze then words seemed to come from his lips in tones of wonder and inquiry what are you all doing here at this time of night when honest folk should be abed just what i've been asking myself for the last hour gravely remarked the statue in a niche in the opposite wall the effect was startling even to those who understood the thing more so to the others rosie screamed and ran to her father for protection why 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 cried old mr densmore in momentary perplexity and astonishment don't be afraid miss rosie i'm a faithful friend and the woman over there couldn't hurt you if she would said bruno 
going up to the young girl wagging his tail and touching his cold nose to her hand she drew it away with another scream dear child said her sister it is only a trick of ventriloquism meant to amuse not alarm added mr Lilburn. rosie nestling in her father's arms drew a long breath of relief and half laughing half crying looked up saucily into mr Lilburn's face and it was you sir oh how you scared me i beg your pardon my bonny lassie he said i thought to relieve somewhat the tediousness of the hour for which accept our thanks said mr dinsmore but i perceive it is not the first time that elsie and traveller have been witnesses of your skill no said elsie laughing my dear you are good at a story tell them what happened at breakfast this morning mr traveller complied with the request he was an excellent story-teller and made his narrative very interesting but in the midst of their mirth a sudden awe-struck silence fell upon them there was a sound as of rattling of stiffly starched ropes then a gruff voice from the hall exclaimed there he is the old scalawag didn't more too now take good aim bill and let's make sure work rosie was near screaming again but catching sight of mr lowburn's face laughed instead a little hysterical nervous laugh oh tis you again sir she cried please don't frighten me any more ah oh, no i will not he said and at that moment a toy man and woman on the table began a vastly amusing conversation about their own private affairs in the kitchen and the domiciles of the house servants there was the same waiting and watching old and young all up and wide awake gathered in groups and talked in undertones of the doings of the ku klux and of the reception they hoped to give them that night aunt dicey glorying in the prospect of doing good service in defence of her family as she proudly termed her master and mistress and the children kept her kettles of soap and lye at a boiling point and two stalwart fellows close at hand to obey her orders aunt chloe and dinah were not with the others but in the nursery watching over the slumbers of the chillins uncle joe was with mr leland who was not yet able to use the wounded limb and was to be assisted to his hiding-place upon the first note of alarm in the observatory the two young men kept a vigilant eye upon every avenue of approach to the plantation there was no moon that night but the clear bright starlight made it possible to discern a moving white object at a considerable distance horace was full of excitement and almost eager for the affray arthur calm and quiet this waiting is intolerable exclaimed the former when they had been nearly an hour at their post how do you stand it art i find it tedious and there is all probability at least an hour of it yet before us but my impatience is quelled by the thought that it may be to me the last hour of life true and to me also a solemn thought art and yet might not the same be said of any day or hour of our lives from that they fell into a very serious conversation in which each learned more of the other's inner life than he had ever known before both were trusting christ and seeking to know and to do his will and from that hour their hearts were knit together as the hearts of david and jonathan gradually their talk ceased till but a word or two was dropped now and then while the vigilance of their watch was redoubled for the hour of midnight had struck the silver chimes of a clock in the hall below coming distinctly to their ears and any moment might bring the raiders into view below stairs too a solemn hush had fallen upon each with the first stroke of the clock and hearts were going up in silent prayer to god horace was gazing intently in the direction of fairview but at a point somewhat beyond look hart he cried in an excited whisper do my eyes deceive me or are there really some white objects creeping slowly along yonder road i-i think yes yes it is they returned arthur giving a vigorous pull to the string attached to the bell in the kitchen while horace did the same by the wire connected with the other then springing to the stairway they descended with all haste loudly the alarm pealed out at both places bringing all to their feet and paling the cheeks of the ladies mr dinsmore's orders were given promptly in calm firm tones and each repaired to his post aunt dicey assuming command in the kitchen delivered her orders with equal promptness and decision yo ben and jack tote does your pot of light up the stairs quick as lightning and set it while aunt chloe tells you and yo venus stand by the pot of soap with a dipper in your hand and fire away at the fust clucks that shows his devil horns and tongue at the door 
Mind now, you'll take him in the eye, and he never come round here no more trying to kill Mars Edward. Mr. Leland had fallen asleep in the early part of the evening, but woke with the ringing of the alarm bells. Ah, they must be in sight, Uncle Joe, he said. Help me to my hiding place and leave me there. You will be needed below. Yes, Master Leland, they's coming, said the old man, instantly complying with his request. And this nigger's to demand the boiling lie compartment of the Army of Defense. A narrow couch had been spread in the little concealed apartment, and in a trice Mr. Leland found himself stretched upon it. There, I'm quite comfortable, Uncle Joe, he said. Lay my pistols here, close to my hand. Then close the panel with all care, and when he leaves the room, lock the door behind you, and hide the key in the usual place. Yes, saw, and please, you saw, as you's got nothing else for to do, keep asking the Lord to help the armies all right. That I will, answered Leland heartily. Uncle Joe, moving with almost youthful alacrity, obeyed the orders given, and hastened to join his wife and Dinah, whom he found on the upper veranda in front of the nursery windows, standing ladle in hand, one by the kettle of lye, the other leaning over the railing, watching for the coming of the foe. The old man, arming himself also with a ladle of large capacity, took his station beside the ladder. Aunt Chloe, he said, you'll better go back to de chillins, for fear they might wake up and be powerful scared. Yes, back I better. Dare old mammy do de best with de darlings, she replied, resigning her ladle to Prilla, who joined them at that moment, and hurrying back to her charge. She found her mistress bending over the crib of the sleeping babe. I am so thankful they were not roused by the noise, mammy, she said softly, glancing at the bed where the two older lay in profound slumber. But don't leave them alone, even for a moment. Deed I won't, darling, the breasted little lambs. Dare old mammy fight the cluxes to her last breath, fo they should hurt a hair of their heads. But don't you fret, Miss Elsie, honey. They'll not come here. The good Lord'll net not let them get into the house, she added big tears filling her old eyes, while she clasped her idolized mistress in her arms, as if she were still the little girl she had so loved to caress and fondle years ago. Elsie returned to the embrace, gave a few whispered directions, and glided into the next room, there to linger a moment by the couch of her little girls, who were also sleeping sweet, then hastened to rejoin Mrs. Densmore and Rosie, in one of the rooms opening upon the lower front veranda. They sat at a table covered with arms and ammunition, Rose was a little pale, but calm and composed, as was Elsie also. Rosie, making a great effort to be brave, could not still the loud beating of her heart as she sat listening intently for sounds from without. Elsie, placing herself beside her younger sister, and taking her hand, pressed it tenderly, whispering with a glad smile, They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth for ever. Rosie nodded a half-tearful assent. Horace looked in. They are just entering the avenue. Mother and sisters, be brave and help us with your prayers, he said, low and earnestly, and was gone. The ladies exchanged one swift glance, then bent forward in a listening attitude, and for the next few moments every other sense seemed lost in that of hearing. The raiders, as was their usual custom, had dismounted at the gate, and leaving their horses to the care of two of their numbers, approached the house on foot. They came on, three abreast, but as they neared the dwelling, one line branched off and passed round it in the direction of the kitchen, and an instant more the double column, headed by the leader of the troop, had reached the steps of the veranda, where it came to a sudden halt, a sort of half-smothered grunt of astonishment coming from the captain, as he hastily ran his eye along the barricade, which till that moment had been concealed from himself and his comrades by the semi-darkness and profusion of flowering vines. The darkness and silence of death seemed to reign within, yet each one of the little garrison was at his post, looking through a loophole, and covering one or another of the foe with his revolver, while his finger upon the trigger, he only waited the word of command to send the bullet to its mark. Young Horace found it hard to restrain his impatience. What a splendid opportunity his father was letting slip! Why did he hesitate to give the signal? For perhaps the first time in his life, the young man thought his father unwise. But Mr. Dinsmore knew what he was about. Blood should not be shed till the absolute necessity was placed beyond question. A moment of suspense, of apparent hesitation on the part of the raiders. Then, in stentorian tones, the leader, stepping back a little, called, Edward Jarvis! 
No answer. An instant of dead silence. Then the call was repeated. Elsie shuddered and hid her face, faltering out a prayer for her husband's safety. Still no reply, and the third time the man called, adding with a volley of oaths and curses, We want you, sir. Come out at once, or it'll be the worse for you. Then Mr. Dinsmore answered in calm, firm tones, Your purpose is known. Your demand is unreasonable and lawless, and will not be complied with. Withdraw your men at once, or it will be worse for you. Boys, cried the leader, turning to his men, up with your axes and clubs. We've got to batter down this breastwork, and it must be done. With a yell of fury, the hideous forms rushed forward to the attack. Fire! rang out Mr. Dinsmore's voice in clarion tones and instantly the crack of half a dozen revolvers was heard. A light blaze ran along the line of loopholes, and at the same instant a sudden scalding shower fell upon the assailants from above. Several of them dropped upon the ground, and as many more threw away their clubs and ran screaming and swearing down the avenue. But the others rallied and came on again, yelling with redoubled fury, while simultaneously similar sounds came from the sides and rear of the dwelling. The scalding shower was descending there also. Uncle Joe and his command were busy, and bullets were flying and doing some execution, though sent with far less certain aim than from the front. Aunt Dicey, too, and her satellites were winning the laurels they coveted. As she had expected, several of the assailants came thundering at her door, loudly demanding admittance. At the same time, the attack was made in front. "'Who dar? What you want?' she called. "'We want in. Open the door instantly.' No, sir. This child don't do no such thing. This Mars Edwards kittens and Miss Elsie's. Then in an undertone, now Venus and Liz, feel your dippers quick. And when this nigger says fire, slam the contentions. That's the violent soap, mind you, into dour ugly faces. And Sally Ann, you creep up them stairs quick, quick as lightning, and hide under the bed. As the old days after, somebody must have told them you sleeps in the kitchen since the night that bloody hand been laid on your shoulder. These orders were scarcely issued and obeyed when the door fell in with a loud crash, and a hideous horned head appeared in the opening, but only to receive three ladles full of the boiling soap full in its face, and fall back with a terrible, unearthly yell of agony and rage into the arms of its companions, who quickly bore it shrieking away. "'Tank the Lord, that shot toll!' ejaculated Aunt Dicey. "'Now, stand ready for the next!' The party in front were received with the same galling fire as before and at the same moment a sound, coming apparently from the road beyond the avenue, a sound as of the steady tramp, tramp of infantry, and the heavy rumbling and rolling of artillery, smote upon their ears. There had been a report that Federal troops were on the march to suppress the outrages, and protect the helpless victims, and, seized with a panic terror, the raiders gathered up their dead and wounded, and fled. End of chapter 17 of Elsie's Motherhood Recording by Elena May Chapter 18 of Elsie's Motherhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Elsie's Motherhood by Martha Finley. Chapter 18. Thus far our fortune keeps an onward course, and we are graced with reefs of victory. Victory! shouted Horace Jr., waving his handkerchief above his head. Victory! and an end to the reign of terror. Hooray for the brave troops of Uncle Sam that came so opportunely to the rescue. Come, let us sally forth to meet them. Elsie, unlock your stores and furnish the refreshments they have so well earned. They draw nearer, cried Arthur, who had been listening intently. Haste! They must be about entering the avenue. They will meet the raiders. Travilla, uncle, Shall we make an opening here in our breastworks? Yes, answered both in a breath. Then, as if struck by a sudden thought, No, no, let us reconnoitre first, cried Mr. Dinsmore. Horace, run up to the observatory, take a careful survey, and report as promptly as possible. Horace bound away, hardly waiting to hear the conclusion of the sentence. I counsel delay, said old Mr. Dinsmore, who was peering through a loophole. 
the troops have not entered the avenue the ku klux may return though i do not expect it after the severe repulse we have twice given them but discretion is the better part of valor right sir said mr lilburn let us give them no chance for a more successful onslaught oh yes do be careful cried the ladies joining them don't tear down the least part of our defences yet have they really fled are you all unhurt asked rose in trembling tones edward papa faltered elsie safe and sound they both answered thank god thank god she cried as her husband folded her into his arms and her father took her hand in his while with the other arm he embraced rose we have indeed cause for thankfulness said arthur returning from a hurried circuit of the verandas not one of our side has received a scratch but i have ordered the men to remain at their posts for the present horace came rushing back i cannot understand it i see no sign of troops though the darkness suggested his mother hark hark the bugle call they are charging on the ku klux exclaimed arthur as a silvery sound came floating on the night breeze oh they have come they have come cried rose clapping her hands and dancing up and down with delight now our troubles are over and there will be no more of these dreadful raids and in the exuberance of her joy she embraced first her mother then her sister and lastly threw herself into her father's arms ah i wish it were so he said caressing her but i begin to fear that the sounds we have heard with so much relief and pleasure were as unreal as bruno's talking a while ago oh was it you mr lilburn she cried in a tone of sore disappointment ah well my bonny lass the ku klux are gone at all events let us be thankful for that he answered what what does it all mean asked the other two young men in a breath what strange deception has been practised upon us my cousin is a ventriloquist replied elsie and has done us a good service in using his talent to help in driving away the ku klux he instantly received a unanimous vote of thanks and the young people began pouring out eager questions and remarks another time my work is but half done i must pursue he cried hastily leaving them to seek an exit from the house elsie hurried away to see if her little ones still slept all did but little elsie and she was full of joy and thankfulness that her dear papa's cruel foes had been driven away ah mamma god has heard our prayers and helped us out of this great trouble she said receiving and returning a tender embrace indeed he has daughter let us thank him for his goodness and ever put our trust in him have you been long awake it was their dreadful screams that awakened me mamma i couldn't help crying for one man it seems as if he must be in such agony of pain uncle joe says aunt dicey and the others threw boiling soap into his eyes and all over his face and head mamma aren't you sorry for him yes indeed and the child felt a great tear fall on her head resting on her mother's bosom poor poor fellow he finds the way of transgressors hard as the bible says it now darling lie down again and try to sleep i think the danger is all over for tonight returning she met her husband in the hall i have been to tell leland the good news he said he is happy over it and now dear wife go to bed and sleep if you can you are looking very weary and i think need no fear further disturbance your grandfather mrs dinsmore and rosie have yielded to our persuasions and retired and you and papa can easily stand the loss of one night's sleep but may perhaps get an hour or so of repose upon the sofa but we will keep a constant watch till sunrise arthur and horace are going up to the observatory again while the rest of us will pace the veranda by turns morning found the ian mansion wearing much of the appearance of a recently besieged fortress 
how many of the clan had lost their lives it was impossible to tell but probably only a small number as the aim of the party of defense had been by mutual agreement to disable and not to slay but it was thought the assailants had suffered a sufficiently severe punishment to deter them from a renewal of the attack also mr lilbourne's pursuit keeping up the delusion that the troops were at hand had greatly frightened and demoralized them so the barricades were presently taken down and gradually the dwelling and its surroundings resumed their usual aspects of neatness order and elegance all the friends remained at breakfast and their presence did not exclude the children from the table while the guests were being helped there was a momentary silence broken by a faint squeal that seemed to come from under eddie's plate mousy at the table cried harold then o me dot a bird as the notes of a canary came from underneath his plate pick up your plates and let us see the mouse and the bird said their papa smiling they obeyed ah i knew there was nothing there said eddie laughing and looking at cousin ronald while harold gazing at the tablecloth in disappointed surprise cried ah it's gone it must have flewed away cahorn conley knowing nothing but suspecting a great deal and full of anxiety repaired to ian directly after breakfast blood stains on the ground without and within the gate and here and there along the avenue as he rode up to the house confirmed his surmise that his friends had been attacked by the ku klux the previous night he found them all in the library talking the matter over ah sir like a brave man and a true friend you come when the fight is over was his grandfather's sarcastic greeting it was my misfortune sir to be unable in this instant to follow my inclination returned the young man coloring to the very roots of his hair with mortification but glancing around the circle heaven be thanked that i find you all unhurt he added with a sigh that told a great load had been taken from his heart may i hear the story i see the men are tearing down a breastwork and i suppose the attacking party must have been a large one not too large however for us to beat back and defeat without your assistance growled his grandfather ah grandpa he would have helped if he could said mrs travilla sit down cal we are very glad to see you his uncle and travilla joined in the assurance but horace and arthur regarded him rather coldly and cousin ronald thought he deserved some slight punishment as he attempted to take the offered seat squeal 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 came from his coat pocket causing him to start and redden again with renewed embarrassment oh cousin cal has you dot a wee little piggy in your pocket let me see him cried harold running up and trying to get a peep at it then starting back with a cry of alarm at a sudden loud barking as of an infuriated dog at calhoun's heels bruno came bounding in with an answering bark calhoun thrusting his hand into his pocket with purpose to summarily eject the pig and at the same time wheeling about to confront his canine antagonist looked utterly confounded at finding none there while to add to his confusion and perplexity a bee seemed to be circling around his head now buzzing at one ear now at the other he tried to dodge it he put up his hand to drive it away then wheeled about a second time as the furious bark was renewed in his rear but turned a pale and looked absolutely frightened at the discovery that the dog was still invisible then reddened again at perceiving that everybody was laughing his cousin elsie was trying to explain but could not make herself heard above the furious barking she looked imploringly at mr lilburn and it ceased on the instant calhoun dropping into a chair and glanced inquiringly from one to another his uncle answered him in a single word ventriloquism sold exclaimed the youth joining faintly in the mirth strange i did not think of that and how could i suppose there was a ventriloquist here 
an excellent one is he not you must hear what good service he did last night said mr travilla and went on to tell the story of the attack and defense elsie and eddie listened to the account with keen interest vi who had been devoting herself in motherly fashion to a favorite doll laid it aside to hear what was said but harold was playing with bruno who seemed hardly yet to have recovered from his wonder at not finding the strange canine intruder who had so roused his ire harold had climbed upon his back and with his arms around his neck was talking to him in an undertone now use my horse bruno let's go riding like papa and pippo the dog started toward the door with all my heart little master which way shall we go why bruno you surprise me can you talk cried the little fellow in great delight why didn't you begin sooner mamma oh mamma did you hear bruno talk mamma smiled and gently said be quiet son while papa and the rest are talking or else take bruno out to the veranda cousin ronald was amusing himself with the children vi's doll presently began to cry and call upon her to be taken up and she ran to it in surprised delight till she remembered that it was only cousin ronald and not dolly at all but cousin ronald had a higher object than his own or the children's amusement he was trying to divert their thoughts from the doings of the ku klux lest they should grow timid and fearful End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of elsie's motherhood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org elsie's motherhood by martha finley chapter nineteenth revenge at first though sweet bitter ere long back on itself recoils milton george boyd who is of most vindictive temper had laid his plans for the night of the raid upon ian to wreak his vengeance not upon travilla only but also upon the woman whose clothing he had left the impress of his bloody hand within this view he went first to the kitchen department where as he had learned through the gossip of the servants she now passed the night intending afterward to have a hand in the brutal flogging or to be meted out to mr travilla he headed the attacking party there and it was he who received upon his person the full broadside from aunt dicey's battery of soap ladles the pain was horrible the scorching mass clinging to the flesh and burning deeper and deeper as he was born shrieking away in the arms of his comrades oh take it off take it off i'm burning up i tell you he yelled as they carried him swiftly down the avenue but they hurried on seemingly unmindful of his cries mingled though they were with oaths and imprecations nor paused till they had reached the shelter of the woods at some little distance on the opposite side of the road curse you he said between his clenched teeth as they laid him down at the foot of a tree curse you for keeping me in this agony help me off with these duds unbutton it quick quick i am burning up i tell you and my hands are nearly as bad as my face oh oh you fiends do you want to murder me outright you're bringing all the skin with it he roared writhing in unendurable torture as they dragged off the disguise oh kill me bill shoot me through the head and put me out of this torment will you no i daren't come come pluck up the courage and bear it like a man bear it indeed i only wish you had to bear it i can tell you it can't be borne water water for the love of heaven carry me to the river and throw me in my eyes are put out they burn like balls of fire stop that yelling will you cried a voice from a distance you'll betray us we're whipped and there's troops coming up too sure smith yes heard their tramp tramp distinctly ramble of artillery too can't be more than a mile off if that hurry boys no time to lose who is this groaning at such an awful rate 
what's the matter scalded horribly scalded he ain't the only one though maybe he's the worst and blake's killed outright two or three more i believe some with pretty bad pistol shot wounds tell you they've made warm work for us there's been a traitor among us betrayed our plans and put them on their guard he concluded with a torrent of oaths and fearful imprecations upon the traitor whoever he might be hist cried the one boyd had addressed as bill hist boys the bugle call they're on us stop your noise boyd can't you as the latter seized and borne onward again not too gently yelling and roaring with redoubling vigor be quiet or you'll have em after us in no time shoot me through the head then it's the only thing that will help me to stop it mr lilbourne keeping well in the shadow of the trees had hurried after the retreating foe and concealed himself behind a clump of bushes close to the gate caused his bugle note to sound in their ears as if coming from a point some half a mile distant convinced that a detachment of united states troops were almost upon them those carried the dead and wounded dashed into the woods with their burdens while in hot haste the others mounted and away never drawing rein until they had put several miles between them and the scene of their attempted outrage meantime those in the wood moving as rapidly as possible under the circumstances, were plunging deeper and deeper into its recesses. There was an occasional groan or half-suppressed shriek from the others of the wounded, but boys' cries were incessant and heart-rending, till a handkerchief was suddenly thrust into his mouth with a muttered exclamation. Necessity knows no law. It's to save your own life and liberty as well as ours. At length, well-nigh spent with their exertions, the bearers paused, resting their burdens for a moment upon the ground, while they listened intently for the sounds of pursuit. We've baffled them, I think, panted Bill. I don't hear no more of that. Tramp, tramp, and the bugles stop, too. That's so, and I reckon we're pretty safe now, returned another voice. But what's to be done with these fellows? Where'll take em? To Rude Stillhouse was the answer. It's about half a mile further on, and deep in the woods. And I say you, Tom Arnold, pull off your disguise and go after Dr. Savage as fast as you can. Tell him to come to the Stillhouse on the fleetest horse he can get a hold of, and bring along everything necessary to dress scalds and pistol-shot wounds say there's no time to lose or boil die on our hands now up with your load boys and on again the voice had a tone of command and the orders were instantly obeyed the still house was an old dilapidated frame building whose rude accommodations differed widely from those to which save during his army life boyd had been accustomed from infancy they carried him in and laid him down upon a rough pallet of straw furnished with coarse cotton sheets in an army blanket or two not over clean but in his dire extremity of pain heeding naught of this and his blinded eyes could not see the bare rafters overhead the filthy uncarpeted floor the few broken chairs and rude board seats or the little unpainted pine table with its bit of flickering flaming towel candle stuck in an old bottle his comrades did what they could for his relief but it was not much and their clumsy handling was exquisite torture to the raw quivering flesh and his entreaties that they would put him out of his misery at once by sending a bullet through his brain were piteous to hear they had taken his arms from him or he would have destroyed himself the room was filled with doleful sounds the groans and sighs of men in sore pain but his rose above all others 
Dr. Savage arrived at length, but half drunk, and an unskillful surgeon at his best, made but clumsy work with his patients on this occasion. Get the applications brought in time, some slight alleviation of even Boyd's unendurable agony. His cries grew fainter and less frequent, till they ceased altogether, and like the other wounded, he relieved himself only with an occasional moan or groan. The doctor had finished his task, and lay in a drunken sleep on the floor. The uninjured raiders had followed his example. The candle had burned itself out, and all was darkness and silence save the low, fitful sounds of suffering. To Boyd, sleep was impossible. The pain of his burns was still very great, especially in his eyes, the injury to which he feared he must result in total blindness. How could he bear it, he asked himself, to go groping his way through life in utter darkness? Horrible, horrible. He would not endure it. They had put the means of self-destruction out of his way now, but on the first opportunity to get hold of a pistol, he would blown his own brains out and be done with this agony. The Bible was a fable, death and eternal sleep. He had been saying it for years, till he thought his belief, or more correctly, unbelief, firmly fixed. But now the early teachings of a pious mother came back to him, and he trembled with the fear that they might be true. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after that the judgment. Every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. These shall go away into everlasting punishment, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Fire, fire, oh, how unendurable he had found it. Dare he risk its torment throughout the endless ages of eternity? Self-destruction might be but a plunge into deeper depths of anguish, from which there could be no return. For days and weeks he lay in his miserable hiding place, almost unattended save for the doctor's visits and the bringing of his meals by one or another of his confederates, who would feed him with a rough sort of kindness, then go away again, leaving him to the solitary companionship of his own bitter thoughts. He longed for the pleasant society and gentle ministrations of his aunt, and he knew that if sent for, she would come to him, and that his secret would be safe with her, but alas, how could he bear that she would know of his crime and its punishment? She, who had earnestly besought him to forsake his evil ways and live in peace and love with all men, she who had warned him again and again that the way of transgressors is hard, and that, though hand joined in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished, she, who had loved, cared for, and watched over him, with almost a mother's undying, unalterable tenderness and devotion. How ungrateful she would deem his repeated attempts against the home and husband of one whom she had loved as her own child. She would not reprove him, she would not betray him, but he would know that in her secret heart she condemned him as a guilty wretch a disgrace to her and all his relatives, and that would be worse, far worse to his proud spirit than the dreary loneliness of his present condition and the lack of the bodily comforts she would provide. No, he would bear his bitter fate as best he might, and though he had proved the truth of her warning words, she should never know it, if he could keep it from her. Troops had arrived in the neighborhood the day after the raid on Ian, so to Boyd's other causes of distress was added the constant fear of dejection and apprehension. 
this was one reason why the visits of his confreres were few and short the clan was said to have disbanded and outrages had ceased but an investigation was going on and search being made for the guilty parties also united states revenue officers were known to be in quest of illicit distilleries to which class this one of rude's belonged what's the bad news asked boyd one morning while savage was engaging in dressing his hurts very bad you'll have to get out of this at once if you don't want to be nabbed a jail might be more comfortable in some respect eh old boy but i suppose you prefer liberty better to sit in freedom's hall with a cold damp floor and a mouldering wall than to bend the neck or bow the knee in the proudest place of slavery fine settlement eh boyd the doctor was just drunk enough to spout poetry without knowing or caring whether it was exactly a propos or not very fine though i'm not quite to the point it strikes me answered boyd wincing under the not too gentle touch of the inebriate's shaking hand but how am i to get out of this blind and nearly helpless as i am well sir we've planned it all out for you never forsake a brother in distress you know there's a warrant out for bill dobbs and he has to skedaddle too he starts for texas tonight and will take charge of you savage went on to give the details of the plan and left with a promise to return at nightfall he did so bringing dobbs and smith with him boyd's wounds were attended to again dobbs looking on to learn the modus operandi then the invalid aided by smith on one side and dobbs on the other was conducted to an opening in the woods where a horse and wagon stood in readiness placed in it dobbs taking a seat by his side and supporting him with his arm and driven a few miles along the unfrequented road to a little country station where they took the night train going south the conductor had no questions merely exchanged glances with dobbs in seeing him apparently in search of a pin in the inside of his coat opened his own and handed him one then passed on through the car boyd was missed from the breakfast table at ashland's on the morning after the raid upon ian his aunt sent a servant to his room to see if he had overslept himself the man returned that the report that Mas george was not there and that his bed had certainly not been occupied during the night still his movements were at all times rather uncertain and the ladies having no communication with the oaks or ian on the previous day were in ignorance of all that transpired there his absence occasioned them no particular anxiety or alarm the meal went on enlivened by a cheerful chant mamma said herbert it's a lovely morning do give us a holiday and let us drive over to the oaks we haven't seen aunt rose and the rest for ever so long the other children joined in the petition grandma put in a word of approval and mamma finally consented if the truth were told nothing loath to give or to share the treat the carriage was ordered at once and they set out shortly after leaving the table arrived at their destination they found mrs murray on the veranda looking out with an eager anxious face ah she said coming forward as the ladies alighted i didn't expect my sight is not so keen as in my younger days and i thought till this morning twas mr dinsmore's carriage bringing them home again after the dreadful night at ian both ladies turned pale and old mrs carrington leaned heavily upon her daughter-in-law for support 
her lips moved but no sound came from them and she gasped for breath oh tell us cried sophie what what has happened the children too were putting the same question in varied tones and words the ku klux faltered the housekeeper and he hadn't heard about it my ladies no no not a word exclaimed sophie but see my mother is fainting help me carry her into the house no no i can walk i am better now thank you said mrs carrington in low faltering tones just give me the support of your arm mrs murray they led her between them and laid her on a sofa and that's where george was she sighed closing her eyes wearily then half started up tell me oh tell me was was mr travilla injured no my lady he had been warned and was ready for them thank god thank god came faintly from the white quivering lips as she sank back upon her pillow again and two great tears stealing from beneath the closed eyelids rolled slowly down the furrowed cheeks you have heard the particulars then said sophie addressing the housekeeper and my brother and sister were there yes ma'am and master horace and miss rosie too yes and some of the men servants mr dinsmore's man john was one of em and he's come back and for him i learn was a rich with our friends call him in and let me hear what he can tell entreated the old lady the request was immediately complied with and john gave a graphic and in the main correct account of the whole affair his tale was to his auditors one of intense thrilling painful interest they lost not a word and when he had finished his story the old lady cross-questioned him closely did he know who had warned mr travilla were any of the raiders recognized both of these questions john answered in the negative at least he corrected himself he had not heard that any one was recognized they were all completely disguised and they had carried away their dead and wounded both the shot and the scalded at that moment mr dinsmore's family carriage drove up and john bowed and retired there were tearful embraces between the sisters and other relatives and between rose and the elder mrs carrington i feel as if you had been in terrible danger said sophie wiping her eyes john has just been telling us all about it what a mercy that mr travilla was warned in time by whom horace if it is not an improper question asked the old lady turning to mr dinsmore by a detective mrs carrington who was secretly present at their meeting and heard all the arrangements he then knew who were the members appointed to be of the attacking party mr dinsmore bowed assent was george one my dear madame i did not see the detective but their raids are usually made by men coming from a distance you are evading my question i implore you to tell me all you know george did not come down to breakfast had evidently not occupied his bed last night and this seems to explain his absence i know too that he has bitterly hated travilla since since his arrest and imprisonment will you not tell me any certainty is to be preferred to this this horrible suspense i would know the worst thus adjured mr dinsmore told her george had been appointed one of the party but that he could not say that he was actually there also he suppressed the fact that the appointment had been by george's own request she received the communication in silence but the anguish in her face told that she felt little doubt of her nephew's guilt and as days and weeks rolled on bringing no news of him her suspicions settled into a sad certainty with the added sorrowful doubt 
whether he was living or dead. End of chapter 19《Chapter Twenty of Elsie's Motherhood》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Elsie's Motherhood by Martha Finley Chapter Twentieth Before we end our pilgrimage, tis fit that we should leave corruption and foul sin behind us. But with washed feet and hands, the heathen dared not enter their profane temples and for me to hope my passage to eternity can be made easy till i have shook off the burden of my sin in free confession aided with sorrow and repentance for them is against reason massinger it began to be noticed that wilkins foster also had disappeared it was said that he had not been seen since the raid upon fairview and the general supposition was that he had taken part in the outrage received a wound in the fray and on the advent of the troops had fled the country his mother and sisters led a very retired life seldom going from home except to attend church and even there they had been frequently missing of late Elsie had been much engaged in efforts to comfort her old friend, Mrs. Carrington, and to entertain Mr. Lilbourne, who was still at Ian. Little excursions to the point of interest in the vicinity, and visits to the plantations of different families of the connection, who vied with each other in doing him honor, filled up the time to the exclusion of almost everything else except the home duties which she would never allow herself to neglect. Baskets of fruit and game, accompanied by kind messages, had found their way now and again from Ian to the cottage home of the Fosters. But weeks had passed since the sweet face of Ian's mistress had been seen within its walls. Elsie's tender conscience reproached her for this, when, after an absence of several Sabbaths, Mrs. Foster again occupied her pew in the church, of which both were members. The poor lady was clad in rusty black, seemed to be aging fast, and the pale, thin face had a weary, heartbroken expression that brought tears to Elsie's eyes. When the service closed, she took pains to intercept Mrs. Foster, who was trying to slip away unnoticed, and taking her hand in a warm clasp, kindly inquired concerning the health of herself and family about as usual mrs travilla was the reply i'm glad to hear it i feared you were ill you are looking weary and no wonder after your long walk you must let us take you home there is plenty of room in the carriage as the gentleman came on horseback and it will be a real pleasure to me to have your company. The sincere, earnest, kind tone and manner quite disalarmed the pride of the fallen gentlewoman, and a momentary glow of grateful pleasure lightened up her sad face. But it will take you fully a mile out of your way, she said, hesitating to accept the proffered kindness. Ah, that is no objection. It is so lovely a day for a drive, said Elsie, leading the way to the carriage. This seems like a return of the good old times before the war, sighed Mrs. Foster, leaning back upon the softly cushioned seat as they bowled rapidly along. Ah, Mrs. Travilla, if we could but have been content to let well enough alone, I have grown weary inexpressibly weary of all this hate bitterness and contention in the poverty ah well i will not complain as she closed her lips resolutely it was a sad mistake elsie answered echoing the sigh and it will take many years to recover from it yes i shall not live to see it nor i perhaps not here 
but yonder in a better land elsie answered with a smile of hope and gladness mrs foster nodded assent her heart too full for utterance nor did she speak again till the carriage drew up before her own door then repeating her thanks you have not been here for a long time mrs travilla she said i know i have not returned your calls but she paused seemingly again overcome with emotion ah that shall not keep me away if you wish me to come returned elsie we would be very glad hardly any one else so welcome i fear i have neglected you but shall try to come soon and shall be pleased at any time to see you at Ian, elsie answered as the carriage drove on a day or two afterward she fulfilled her promise and was admitted by annie the eldest daughter she too looked pale and careworn and had evidently been weeping oh mrs travilla she exclaimed and burst into a fresh flood of tears elsie her own eyes filling with sympathetic drops put her arm about her whispering my poor dear child what can i do to comfort you nothing nothing sobbed the girl resting her head for a moment on elsie's shoulder but come to the parlor dear mrs travilla and let me call mamma oh stay a moment elsie said detaining her are you sure quite sure that i can do nothing to help you annie shook her head this trouble is beyond human help yes yes you can pray for us and for him the last words were almost inaudible from emotion and she hurried away leaving the guest sole occupant of the room involuntarily elsie glanced about her and a pang went to her heart as she noticed that every article of luxury almost of comfort had disappeared the pictures were gone from the walls the pretty ornaments from the mantel and center table coarse cheap matting covered the floor in lieu of the costly carpet of other days and rosewood and damask had given place to cottage furniture of the simplest and most inexpensive kind how they must feel the change she thought within herself and yet perhaps just now these minor trials are probably shallowed up in a greater one mrs foster came in looking shabbier and more heartbroken than at their last interview my dear mrs travilla this is kind she said making a strong effort to speak with composure but failing utterly as she met the tender sympathizing look in the sweet soft eyes of her visitor elsie put her arms about her and wept with her some one is ill i fear she said at length yes my son oh mrs travilla i am going to lose him and she was well nigh convulsing with bitter choking sobs while there is life there is hope whispered elsie who can say what god may do for us in answer to our prayers the mother shook her head in sad hopelessness the doctor is given up says nothing more can be done dr barton no no savage oh if we could but have had barton at first the result might have been different i have no confidence in savage even when sober and he's drunk nearly all the time oh then things may not be so bad as he represents them let me send over for dr barton at once thank you but i must ask wilkins first he was wounded some weeks ago injured internally and has been suffering agonies of pain ever since i wanted dr barton sent for at once but he would not hear of it said the risk was too great and he must trust to savage but now the greater risk is doing without him suggested elsie may i not send immediately excuse me one moment and i will ask the mother said leaving the room she returned shortly to say that wilkins had consented that dr barton should be summoned accepted mrs travilla's kind offer with thanks 
Elsie at once sent her servant and carriage upon the errand, and meanwhile engaged in conversation with her hostess. It was principally an account by the latter of her son's illness. His sufferings, she said, had been intense, at first borne with fierce impatience and muttering imprecations upon the hand that inflicted the wound. He had likened himself to a caged tiger. So unbearable was the confinement to him almost more so than the torturing pain but of late a great change had come over him he had grown quiet and submissive and the bitter hate seemed to have died out of his heart as it has out of mine i hope continued the mother the big tears rolling down her cheeks i am now sensible that the feelings i have indulged against some persons the lelands principally were most unchristian and i hope the lord has helped me to put them away it has been hard for us to see strangers occupying our dear old home and yet it was certainly no fault of theirs that we were compelled to give it up that is true elsie said i think i can understand both your feelings and theirs but they are good dear christian people and i assure you bear no ill will ah is that so I am told Leland has not really gone north, as supposed, but has returned to the plantation since, since the coming of the troops. He has, and he has nearly recovered from his wound. He was wounded then? Yes, pretty badly. And was hidden somewhere, and his wife staying on alone with her children and servants? I wonder she had the courage. She has put her trust in the Lord as I believe both you and I do, my dear Mrs. Foster, and he has not failed her. Mrs. Foster mused sadly for a moment. I have felt so hard to her, she murmured, at length, in low, trembling tones. Is she a Christian, whom I love for the Master's sake? And it was quite natural for her to defend her and her children. I should have done the same for mine. She had not mentioned when or where Wilkins had received his wound, but Elsie knew now that it was at Fairview, and that Mrs. Leland or Archie's hand had sped the bullet that had done such fearful work. Dr. Barton came. Mrs. Foster went with him to the sick room, and Elsie lingered, anxious to hear his opinion of the case. But Annie came hurrying in with her tear-swollen face, Dear Mrs. Travilla, won't you come too? She sobbed. Mamma will be so glad, and, and Wilkins begs you will come. Elsie rose and put her arm around the waist of the weeping girl. I will gladly do all I can for him, your mamma, or any of you, she whispered. There was no want of comfort or luxury in the sick room. Mother and sisters had sacrificed every such thing to this idol of their hearts, this only son and brother. He lay propped up with pillows, his face pale as that of a corpse, and breathing with great difficulty. Dr. Barton sat at the bedside with his finger on his patient's pulse, while he asked a few brief questions, then relapsed into a thoughtful silence. All eyes were turned upon him with intense anxiety, waiting in almost breathless suspense for his verdict, but his countenance betrayed nothing. "'Oh, doctor,' sighed the mother at length, "'have you no word of hope to speak?' "'Let us have none of false hope, doctor,' grasped the sufferer. "'I would know <clears throat> the worst.' "'My poor lad,' said the kind-hearted old physician in tender fatherly tones, I will not deceive you. Whatever preparation you have to make for your last long journey, let it be made at once. With a burst of uncontrollable anguish, the mother and sisters fell upon their knees at the bedside. How long, doctor, faltered the sick man. You will hardly see the rising of another sun. The low, gently spoken words pierced more than one heart as with a dagger's point was this wound mortal 
In the first place? asked Wilkins. I think not, if it had had prompt and proper attention. But that is a question of little importance now. You are beyond human skill. Is there anything in which I can assist you? Yes, yes, pray for my guilty soul. It was no new thing for Dr. Barton to do. An earnest Christian, he ministered to the souls as well as the bodies of his patients. He knelt and offered up a fervent prayer for the dying one, that repentance and remission of sins might be given him, and that he might have a saving faith in the Lord Jesus, and trusting only in his imputed righteousness, be granted an abundant entrance into his kingdom and glory. Thanks, doctor, gasped Wilkins. I, I've been a bad man, a very bad, wicked man. Can there be any hope for me? Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. He that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. Isn't it too late? The hollow eyes gazed despairingly into the doctor's face. Whosoever will, you may come if you will, so long as death has not fixed your eternal state. I will. Lord, help. Save me. Give me a poor, lost, vile help, sinner, he cried, lifting his eyes and clasping hands to heaven, while great tears coursed down his silken cheeks. I cast myself at thy feet. Oh, pardon, save me, or I am lost, lost forever. The eyes closed, the hands dropped, and for a moment they thought he had passed away with that agonizing cry for mercy and forgiveness. But a deep sigh heaved his breast, his lips moved, and his mother bent over him to catch the words. Leland send for him with streaming eyes she turned to elsie and repeated the words adding do you think he will come i am quite sure of it i will go for him at once the white eyes were moving again the mother explained amid her choking sobs he says the wife too and your husband and father oh will they come tell them my boy is dying and will go at peace with all the world i will and they will come elsie answered weeping and hurried away she drove directly to fairview and was so fortunate as to find her husband and father they were conversing with mr and mrs leland her sad story was quickly told and listened to by all with deep commiseration for the impoverished and afflicted family you will not refuse the poor dying man's request papa edward she said in conclusion certainly not they answered speaking both together we will set out immediately and you leland will gladly accompany you i bear the poor man no malice and would rejoice to do him any good in my power what do you say mary she looked at him a little anxiously is it quite safe for you Quite, I think, he replied, appealing to the other gentlemen for their opinion. They agreed with him, Mr. Dinsmore adding, I have no doubt the man is sincere, and I have still more confidence in his mother, whom I have long looked upon as a truly Christian woman. Besides, remarked Mr. Travilla, the Ku Klux would hardly dare to venture an outrage now. The most desperate have fled the country, and the rest stand in wholesome awe of the troops. I am quite, quite sure there is no risk in going, said Elsie earnestly, but whatever is done must be done quickly, for Wilkins is evidently very near his end, may perhaps expire before we arrive, even though we make all haste. At that there was a general, hurried movement and in less time than it takes to tell it 
they were on their way mrs leland in the carriage with elsie and the gentleman on horseback under the influence of the restoratives administered by dr barton great apparent improvement had taken place in wilkins's condition he was in less pain breathed more freely and spoke with less difficulty at the sight of his visitors his pale face flushed slightly and an expression of regret and mortification swept over his features thank you all for coming he said feebly please be seated i am at the very brink of the grave and and i would go at peace with all men i i've hated you every one and you leland i would have killed if i could i was in the attempt to do so that i received my own death wound at the hands of your wife mrs leland started trembled and burst into tears that part of the story elsie had omitted and she heard it now for the first time don't be disturbed he said you are doing right in defending yourself husband and children yes yes she sobbed but oh i would save you now if i could can nothing be done he shook his head sadly will you can you all forgive me he asked in tones so faint and low that only the death-like silence of the room made the words audible with all my heart poor fellow as i hope to be forgiven my infinitely greater debt to my lord mr leland answered with emotion taking the wasted hand and clasping it warmly in his foster was deeply touched god bless you for the words he whispered how i've been mistaken in you sir his eyes sought the faces of dinsmore and travilla and drawing near the bed each took his hand in turn gave him the same assurance he had received from leland then the last named said i ask your forgiveness foster for any exasperating word i may have spoken or anything else i have done to rouse unkind feelings toward me in reply the dying man pressed leland's hand and moved to silence mrs leland rose impetuously and dropped upon her knees at the bedside and me she cried with a gush of tears will you forgive me your death i cannot bear to think it was my work even though it was done in lawful self-defense and to save my dear ones it is all right between us he murmured and relapsed into unconsciousness we are too many here said the physician dismissing all but the mother elsie remained in the adjoining room trying to comfort the sisters while mrs leland and the gentlemen repaired to the veranda where they found mr wood who had just arrived having been sent for to converse and pray with the dying man how does he seem he asked can i go at once to the room not now he is unconscious said mr dinsmore and went on to describe foster's condition mental moral and physical as evidenced in his interview with them in the earlier one with dr barton of which elsie had given them an account ah god grant he may indeed find mercy and be enabled to lay hold upon christ to the saving of his soul even at this eleventh hour ejaculated the pastor a deathbed repentance is more ground for hope i have seen many of them in my fifty years of ministry but of all those who had recovered from what had seemed mortal illness but one held fast to his profession the others all went back to their formal evil ways showing convulsively that they had been self-deceived and theirs but the hope of the hypocrite which shall perish whose hope shall be cut off and whose trust shall be a spider's web 
yet with our god all things are possible and the invitation is to all who are yet on praying ground whosoever will at this moment elsie glided into their midst and putting her hand into that of her pastor said in low tearful tones i am glad you have come he is conscious again and asking for you he went with her to the bedside the glazing eyes grew bright for an instant you have come oh tell me what i must do to be saved i can only point you to the lamb of god that taketh away the sins of the world returned the pastor deeply moved only repeat his invitation look unto me and be saved all ye ends of the earth i am trying trying came faintly from the pale lips while the hands moved slowly feebly from side to side as if groping in the dark lord save a deep hush filled the room broken presently by the mother's wail as she fell on her knees at the bedside and taking the cold hand in hers covered it with kisses and tears with the last word the spirit had taken its flight to him time should be no longer eternity had begun few and evil had been his days he was not yet thirty and possessed of fine constitution and vigorous health had every prospect of long life had he been content to live at peace with his fellow men but by violent dealing he had passed away in the midst of his years bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days the wages of sin is death end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of elsie's motherhood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org elsie's motherhood by martha finley chapter twenty first kindness has resistless charms rochester through all the trying scenes that followed elsie was with the fosters giving aid and comfort such as the tenderest mercies and the most delicate kindness could give she and her husband and father took upon themselves the care and trouble of the arrangements for the funeral quietly settling the bills and afterwards sent them receipted to mrs foster wilkins had been the chief support of the family the ladies earning a mere pittance by the use of the needle and sewing machine nothing had been laid by for a rainy day and the expenses of his illness had to be met by the sale of the few articles of value left from the wreck of their fortunes and now but for the timely aid of these kind friends absolute want had stared them in the face they made neither complaint nor parade of their poverty but it was unavoidable that elsie should learn much of it at this time and her heart ached for them in this accumulation of trials the girls were educated and accomplished but shrank with timidity and sensitive pride from exerting themselves to push their way in the world i think they could teach mrs poster said to elsie who calling the day after the funeral had with delicate tact made known her desire to assist them in obtaining some employment more lucrative and better adapt to their taste and social position i think they have the necessary education and ability and i know the will to earn an honest livelihood is not lacking but where are pupils to be found are you willing to leave that to mr travilla and me asked elsie with gentle kindliness ah you are too good too kind said mrs foster weeping no no my dear friend returned elsie does not the master say this is my commandment that ye love one another as i have loved you now tell me please what sort of situations they would like and what branches they feel competent to teach annie is a good musician and draws well she would be glad indeed to get a class of pupils in the neighborhood to whom she might give lessons here or at their homes in drawing and on the piano and harp lucinda thinks she could teach english branches the higher mathematics and french 
but indeed my dear mrs travilla they will be thankful for anything especially if it does not take them away from me we will see what can be done my husband papa and i elsie said rising to take leave and do not be anxious remember those precious words casting all your care upon him for he careth for you do not go yet entreated mrs foster taking and holding fast the hand held out to her if you only knew what a comfort your presence is ah dear kind friend god has made you a daughter of consolation to his bereaved afflicted ones elsie's eyes filled it is what i have prayed that he would do for me she whispered but i think i must go now my husband was to call for me and i see him at the gate elsie repeated the conversation to her husband as they rode homeward and consulted him in the regard to a plan which had occurred to her he approved and instead of stopping at ian they rode on to roselands arrived there mr travilla joined the gentleman in the library where elsie sought her aunts in the pretty parlor usually occupied by them when not entertaining company after a little desultory chat on ordinary topics she spoke of the fosters their indigent circumstances and her desire to find employment for the girls in teaching always concerning yourself in other people's business remarked edna why don't you do like the rest of us and leave them to mind their own affairs because i see they need help and we are told look not every man on his own things but every man also on the things of others and again as we have therefore opportunity let us do good unto all men especially unto them who are of the household of faith i heard you not long since aunt louise wishing you could afford a day governess and knew of a suitable person would you would you be willing to employ one at my expense and give the situation to lucinda foster and let her give it out among our acquaintance that you are paying for the education of my children exclaimed louise coloring angrily no i thank you not at all she need not know nothing of the arrangement except that you employ her and instruct her children and pay her for it you and edna if she will accept the same from me for herself dear me exclaimed edna how you're always spending money on strangers when your own relations could find plenty of use for it elsie smiled slightly at this peculiar view taken of her generous offer but only added i would if you would accept i am no object of charity interrupted louise coldly certainly not elsie said coloring yet why should you object to giving so near a relative the pleasure of but in this instance tis i who am asking a favor of you i want to help the fosters and cannot do so directly without wounding their honest pride of independence you will of course employ lucinda to teach your own no i am not in want of a governess would you like to have anna give lessons to your girls in music and drawing is she to teach yours asked edna no mr robot has them under his instruction and as he gives entire satisfaction i could not feel it right to turn him away hm teachers that are not good enough for your own children are not good enough for ours if i were in want of teachers i should employ the mrs foster was elsie's quiet reply nothing more was said for a moment then rising to go i am then to consider my proposition declined she remarked inquiringly well no since you put it on the ground of a favor to yourself i should be sorry to refuse to gratify you said louise thank you and you edna she can teach mine if she wants to and if i could afford it annie should give music lessons to molly drawing too but if i can't i can't it need be no expense to you said elsie very well then you can arrange her and fix the terms to suit yourself thank you i shall enjoy their pleasure in hearing that they have so many pupils already secured elsie's benevolent kindness did not stop here she called on a number of families in the vicinity and succeeded in obtaining almost as many pupils for the girls as they could well attend to then another difficulty arose the distances were too great for the young ladies to traverse on foot and they had no means of conveyance but this was obviated for the present by giving them the use of prince and princess either with or without the phaeton 
during the hours of the day that such help was needed the ponies were sent over to the cottage every morning after the children had their ride by an ian servant who returned for them in the afternoon mrs leland heard of her friend's efforts and going over to ian asked why did you not call me my children need instruction i hardly liked to ask it of you and i feel delicately about proposing the thing to the fosters but i would be very glad to help them and if you can learn that they would not mind coming to fairview for the sake of several more scholars i authorize you to make the engagement for me elsie undertook the errand and did it so well that the fosters were deeply touched by this kindness on the part of one whom they had formerly hated and reviled and whose husband their brother had tried to kill the offer was gratefully accepted the young lelands became the pupils of these former foes little courtesies and kind offices were exchanged and in the end warm friendship took place of enmity end of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of elsie's motherhood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Elsie's Motherhood by Martha Finley. Chapter 22. The mother in her office holds the key of the soul, and she it is who stamps the coin of character, and makes the being who would be a savage, but for her gentle cares, a Christian man. Then crown her queen of the world. Old Play The families from the Oaks and Ashlands had been spending the day at Ion. It was late in the afternoon, and while awaiting the call to tea, they had all gathered in the drawing-room, whose windows overlooked the avenue and lawn on one side, on the other a very beautiful part of the grounds, and a range of richly wooded hills beyond. A pause in the conversation was broken by Mr. Travilla. "'Wife,' he said, turning to Elsie, "'Cousin Ronald should see Viamede. Our old friend here, Mrs. Carrington, needs change of scene and climate.' two good things that would not hurt any one present shall we not invite them all to go and spend winter with us there oh yes yes indeed what a delightful plan she cried with youthful enthusiasm ah i hope you will all accept the place is almost a paradise upon earth and we would do all in our power to make the time pass agreeably cousin ronald don't refuse papa dear don't try to hunt up objections aha um hum i've not the least idea of it cousin said the one i am not said the other smiling fondly upon her but must be allowed a little time to consider oh papa don't say no cried rosie mamma coax him quick before he has time to say it i think there's no need laughed rose can't you see that he is nearly as eager as the rest of us and how could he do a whole winter without your sister how could any of us for that matter you have advanced an unanswerable argument my dear said mr dinsmore and i may as well give consent at once thank you mamma said elsie thank you both now if the rest of you will only be as good and she glanced persuasively from one to another as good said sophie smiling if to be ready to accept the kindest and most delightful of invitations be goodness then i am not at all inclined to be bad mother shall we not go oh grandma you will not say no cried the young carringtons who had listened to the proposition with eager delight no please don't added little elsie putting her arms coaxingly about the old lady's neck mamma papa grandpa and mammy all say it is so lovely there and we want you along thanks dear thanks to your papa and mamma too said the old lady clasping the little girl close while tears filled her aged eyes yes yes i'll go we will all go how can i reject such kindness the children from rosie dinsmore who would hardly have consented to be put into that list down to harold travilla were wild with delight and for the rest of the evening could scarce speak or think of anything else than viamede and the pleasures they hoped to enjoy there now all have spoken but you brother mine elsie said turning to horace jr you surely do not intend to reject our invitation 
not entirely sister but papa seems to have left the considering for me and i've been at it there should be someone to look after the plantations here and upon whom but myself should that duty devolve we all have good overseers yes but there should be someone to take a general supervision over them i think i will go with you make a short visit in return if you all like to trust me with the care of your property you're welcome to take care of ashlands cousin horace and i'll be obliged to you too spoke up young herbert carrington and so will mother and grandma i know indeed we will said the old lady and it will leave us quite free from care you good boy added the younger mr travilla expressed similar sentiments in regard to horace's offer as it concerned ion and mr dinsmore was quite as willing to leave the oaks in his son's care as it was now late in the fall and no very extensive preparations were needed it was agreed that they would start in a few days we shall make a large party remarked sophie are you sure elsie that you will have room for so many abundance the house is very large and the more the merrier i wish i could persuade aunt wealthy may and harry to come with their babies too of course i shall write to lansdale to-night that would be a delightful addition to the party remarked mr dinsmore but aunt is now in her eightieth year and i fear will think herself much too old for so long a journey ah yes papa but she is more active than most women of seventy and can go nearly all the way by water down the ohio and the mississippi and along the gulf at all events i shall do my best to persuade her and you are so great a favorite that your eloquence will not be wasted i think said mr travilla he was right the old lady could not resist the urgent entreaties of her dearly loved grandniece joined to the pleasant prospect of spending some months with her and the other relatives and friends each of whom held a place in her warm loving heart an answering letter was sent from lansdale by return of mail promising that their party would follow the other to viamede at an early day may too was enchanted with the thought of winter in a lovely spot and the society of her two sisters and elsie who was almost as near but to return as soon as the children learned that the winter was really to be spent at viamede and that they would set off in a few days the whole flock leaving their elders to settle the dry details hastened in quest of mammy they found her in the nursery seated before a crackling wood fire with little herbert in her arms quickly their news was told and gathering round her they plied her with questions about her old louisiana home well chillins she said her old eyes growing bright with joy at the thought of soon seeing it again for of course she would be included in the party it's just lovely as lovely can be de grand old house and de lawn and de shrubbery and de gardens and fields and orchards and everything yes it am de loveliest place dis child ever see horses to ride said eddie yes mars eddie hosses to ride and carriages to drive out in sides a beautiful boat on de bayou and fish dare dat ye can catch wid a hook and line Ole Uncle Joe, he cotch dem most every day for de table, and Massa Eddard and Miss Elsie say dey's very fine. And what else? asked the eager voice of little Daisy Carrington. Oranges! Ripe oranges growing out of doors on the trees, cried her brother Harry, clapping his hands and capering about the room, smacking his lips in anticipation of the coming feast. Yes, chillins, orange trees on de lawn an immense orchard with hundreds and millions of dem on de branches and on de ground and den de gardens full of roses and all lovely flowers and vines climbing over de verandas and round de pillars and de windows and clar up to de roof oh how sweet cried the children their eyes dancing with delight but aunt chloe will there be room for us all asked meta carrington who was next to herbert in age yes child dere's rooms and rooms and rooms in dat house a playroom mammy asked eddie yes chillins a big room where your grandma used to play when she was a little child mammy's voice grew low and husky for a moment and great tears stood in her eyes but she struggled with her emotion and went on her dolls are dar yet and de baby house old marster have made for her and de beautiful sets of de little dishes and a great many things mo for she have lobs a toy and never destroyed nothin ain't nobody ever goes dar but aunt phyllis when she have a clar in time in that part of de house yes said little elsie who had been as silent and intent a listener as though the tale were quite new to her 
mamma has told us about those things and that they are always to be kept very carefully because they belong to her dear mamma and we can't ever play with them exclaimed vi but mamma will show them all to us she said she would when she takes us to viamede oh i'd like to play with them exclaimed meta doesn't anybody ever no child said mammy shaking her head gravely there ain't nobody ever allowed to go in dat room but aunt phyllis when miss elsie not dar but run away now chillins there's de tea bell a ringin mamma too on coming up at the usual hour to see her darling safe in bed had many questions put to her on the same subject they were all patiently answered some further details given and sweet sympathy shown in their gladness over the pleasant prospect before them then with the accustomed tender good-night kiss and with a parting injunction not to lie awake talking she left them did anybody ever have such a dear mamma as ours exclaimed vi nestling close to her sister no i think not replied elsie in a tone of grave consideration but now we mustn't talk any more because she bade us not and i've come to bed early to-night to please you yes you dear good sister you very dearest girl in all the world interrupted vi rising on her elbow for a moment to rain a perfect shower of kisses upon the sweet face by her side elsie laughed low and musically and hugging her tight returned the caresses then went on but i mustn't keep you awake so now let's lie down and not say one word more no not a single one returned vi cuddling down again mamma said eddie coming into the schoolroom next morning with a slight frown on his usually pleasant face why do you call us to lessons can't we have holidays now that we are going away so soon no my son i think it best to attend now to our regular duties you will have a rest from study while taking the journey and for a few days after we reach viamede will that not be better she asked with a motherly smile as she softly smoothed back the dark clustering curls from his broad open brow but i don't want to say lessons to-day he answered with a pout and resolutely refusing to meet her glance my little son she said with tender gravity were we sent into this world to please ourselves no mamma no even christ pleased not himself and we are to try to be like him whose will did he do his father's mamma yes and whose will are you to do god's will you've taught me mamma but well son mamma will you be angry if i say my thought i think not let me hear it mamma isn't isn't it your will this time about the lessons i mean please mamma don't think i want to be naughty asking it she drew him closer and bending down pressed her lips to his forehead no my son you want it explained and i am glad you told me your thought yes it is my will this time but as god bids children honor and obey their parents is it not his will also i s'pose so mamma but i wish it didn't be your will to have me learn lessons to-day elsie was forced to smile in spite of herself with another slight caress she asked do you think i love you eddie oh yes yes mamma i know you do and i love you too indeed i do dearly dearly he burst out throwing his arms about her neck and i know you just want to make me good and happy and that your way's always best so i won't be naughty any more at that there was a general exclamation of delight from the other three who had been silent but deeply interested listeners and all crowded round mamma vying with each other in bestowing upon her tender caresses and words of love each had felt more or less disinclination for the regular routine of work but that vanished now and they went through their allotted tasks with more than usual spirit and determination ah what a sweetener of toil is love love to a dear earthly parent and still more love to christ there is no drudgery in the most menial employment where that is the motive power End of chapter twenty two Chapter Twenty Three of Elsie's Motherhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elena May. Elsie's Motherhood, Chapter Twenty Three. Put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to appetite. Proverbs Twenty Three Two. The happy day came full soon to the fathers and mothers at long last to the expectant children 
old mr dinsmore had accepted a pressing invitation from his granddaughter and her husband to join the party and with the addition of servants it was a large one as they were in no haste and the confinement of a railroad car would be very irksome to the younger children it had been decided to make the journey by water it was late in the afternoon of an unusually warm bright november day that they found themselves comfortably established on board a fine steamer bound for new orleans there were no sad leave-takings to mar their pleasure the children were in wild spirits and all seemed cheerful and happy as they sat or stood upon the deck watching the receding shore as the vessel steamed out of the harbor at length the land had quite disappeared nothing could be seen but the sky overhead and a vast expanse of water all round and the passengers found leisure to turn their attention upon each other there are some nice-looking people on board remarked mr travilla in an undertone to his wife besides ourselves added cousin ronald laughing yes she answered that little group yonder a young minister and his wife and child i suppose and what a dear little fellow he is just about the age of our herald i should judge yes mamma chimed in the last named young gentleman he's a nice little boy may i go and speak to him may i papa permission was given and the next moment the two stood close together each gazing admiringly into the other's face papa remarked the little stranger looking up at his father i very much wish i had a face like this little boy's do you son was the smiling rejoinder he certainly looks like a very nice little boy suppose you and he shake hands frank yes sir said the child holding out a small plump hand what's your name little boy harold traveller and yours is frank yes frank daly don't you like this nice big boat yes i do won't you come with me and speak to my papa and mamma frank looked inquiringly at his father yes you may go if you wish returned the latter and the two started off hand in hand mamma see isn't he a dear little boy asked harold leading his new friend up before her with an air of proud ownership yes indeed she said bending down to kiss frank and stroke his hair i think he's a good boy cause he didn't come till his papa told him to continued harold a very good way to judge of a boy said cousin ronald his name is frank said harold frank that's cousin ronald and this is papa and this is grandpa and so on leading him from one to another till he had introduced him to the whole party not even omitting baby herbert and mammy then frank's papa came for him saying the air was growing very cool and it was time to go in our friends were of the same opinion and all repaired to the ladies saloon where through the children they and the dailies soon made acquaintance mr daly was a minister going south for the winter for the sake of his own and his wife's health cousin ronald took frank on his knee and asked what are you going to do my little fellow when you get to be a man preach the gospel sir aha aha mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and what will you say i'll tell the people we'll sing the twenty-third piece of ham how will that sound rather comical i think my man are you no afraid folk might laugh no sir they don't laugh when papa says it aha mm -hmm. mr daly smiled i never knew before said he that my boy intended to follow my profession the ladies were weary and retired to their state rooms shortly after tea but the gentlemen sought the open air again and paced the deck for some time have a cigar sir asked mr lilburn addressing mr daly thank you no i don't smoke aha mm -hmm. in that you seem to be of one mind with my friends here the dinsmores and traveller remarked lilburn lighting one for himself and placing it between his lips i wonder now if you know how much you miss by your abstinence well sir as to that i know what some of my friends and acquaintance would have missed if they had abstained from the use of the weed one have, would have missed a terrible dyspepsia that laid him in his grave in the prime of life another cancer of the lip which did the same by him after years of horrible suffering aha mm-hmm aha but surely those were rare cases i think not very you don't think that the majority of those who use it feel no ill effects i do indeed the probably comparatively few are aware that tobacco is the cause of their ailments 
doubtless that is the case remarked mr dinsmore i was a moderate smoker for years before i discovered that i was undermining my constitution by the indulgence at length however i became convinced of that fact and gave it up at once for that reason and the sake of the example to my boy here who has been willing to profit by his father's experience and abstain altogether i have never used the weed in any way said horace jr and i remarked traveller abandons it to use about the same time that dinsmore did and for the same reasons by the way i met with a very strong article on the subject lately which i cut out and placed in my pocket-book aha mm -hmm. suppose you give us the benefit of it suggested lilburn good-naturedly i'm open to conviction with all my heart if you will step into the gentleman's cabin where there's a light he led the way the others all following and taking out a slip of paper read from it in a distinct tone loud enough to be heard by those all about him without disturbing the other passengers one drop of nicotine extract of tobacco placed on the tongue of a dog will kill him in a minute <clears throat> The hundredth part of a grain pricked under the skin of a man's arm will produce nausea and fainting. That which blackens old tobacco pipes is infrarheumatic oil, a grain of which would kill a man in a few seconds. The half dozen cigars which most smokers use a day contain six or seven grains, enough, if concentrated and absorbed, to kill three men, and a pound of tobacco, according to its quality, contains from one quarter to one and a quarter ounces. Is it strange, then, that smokers and chewers have a thousand ailments, that German physicians attribute one half of the deaths among the young men of that country to tobacco, that the French Polytechnic Institute had to prohibit its use on account of its ex effects upon the mind, that men go grow dyspeptic, hypochondriac, insane, and delirious from its use? One of the direct effects of tobacco is to weaken the heart. Notice the multitude of sudden deaths, and see how many are smokers and chewers. In a small country town, seven of these mysterious providences occurred within the circuit of a mile, all directly traceable to tobacco, and any physician, on a few moments' reflection, can match this fact by his own observation. And then such powerful acids produce intense irritation and thirst, thirst which water does not quench, hence a resort to cider and beer. The more this thirst is fed, the more insatiate it becomes, and more fiery drink is needed. Out of seven hundred convicts examined at the New York State Prison, six hundred were confined for crimes committed under the influence of liquor, and five hundred said that they had been led to drink by the use of tobacco. Footnote J. E. Vos of the Family Christian Almanac for 1876 Aha! Aha! Mm-hmm! Mm-hmm! Aha! that's strongly put remarked mr lilburn reflectively i'm afraid i'll have to give it up what say you sir turning to mr daly has a man a right of choice in such a matter as this a right to injure his body to say nothing of the mind by a self-indulgence the pleasure of which seems to overbalance to him the possible or probable suffering it may cause no sir what know ye not that your body is the temple of the holy ghost which is in you which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, and in your spirit, which are God's. Right, sir, I was thinking of those words of the Apostle, and also of these other. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. We certainly have no right to injure our bodies, either by neglect or self-indulgence. Know ye not that your bodies are members of Christ? And again, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It must require a good deal of resolution for one who has become fond of the indulgence to give it up, remarked Mr. Daly. No doubt, no doubt, returned Mr. Lilburn. But, if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. There was a pause, broken by young Horace, who had been watching a group of men gathered about a table at the further end of the room. They're gambling yonder, 
and I'm afraid that young fellow is being badly fleeced by the middle-aged man opposite. The eyes of the whole party were at once turned in that direction. "'I'm afraid you're right, Horace,' said Mr. Travilla, recalling with an inward shudder the scene he had witnessed in a gambling hell many years ago, in which the son of his friend Beresford so nearly lost his life. "'What can be done to save him? Some effort must be made.' And he started up, as if with the intention of approaching the players. "'Stay a moment,' exclaimed Lilburn, in an undertone, and laying a detaining hand upon Traveller's arm, but with his gaze intently fixed upon the older gamester. "'Aha! Mm-hmm! That fellow is certainly cheating. I saw him slip a card from his coat-sleeve.' The words had scarcely passed his lips, when a voice spoke, apparently close at the villain's side. "'Aha! I see you well, how your honesty got sleep down with the guards.' And sheets that poor boy vat is blame at you. Yo, sir, you is one big sheet. How dare you, sir? Who are you? cried the rascal, starting up white with rage and turning to face his accuser. <clears throat> who was it? Where is that Dutch scoundrel who dared to accuse me of cheating? he cried, sending a fierce glance about the rim. What is that you calls me? Von Dutch scoundrel. Your man met the broken nose. I say it again. You is one pig sheep. This time, the voice seemed to come from a stateroom behind the gambler. Towering with rage, he rushed to the door and tried to open it. Failing in that, he demanded admittance in loud, angry tones, at the same time shaking the door violently, and kicking against it with a force that seemed likely to break in the panels. There was an answer, a yell, a sound as of someone bouncing out of his berth upon the floor. The key turned hastily in the lock. The door was thrown wide open, and a little Frenchman appeared on its threshold in night attire, bowie knife and pistol in hand, and black eyes flashing with indignant anger. Sir, monsieur, I will know for what is this disturbance of my slumbers. Sir, said the other, stepping back, instantly cooled down at the sight of the weapons. I beg pardon, I was looking for a scoundrel of a Dutchman who has been abusing me, but I see he is not here. "'No, sir, he is not here.' And the door was slammed violently, too. "'Ah! Men met the broken nose. You wake up the wrong passenger. Ha ha! I tells you again, you is one big sheet.' Now the voice came from the skylight overhead, apparently, and with a fierce imprecation, the irate gamester rushed upon deck and ran hither and thither in search of his tormentor. His victim, who had been looking on during the little scene, and listening to the mysterious voice in silent, wide-eyed wonder and fear, now rose hastily, his face deathly pale, with trembling hands gathered up the money he had staked, and hurrying to his stateroom, locked himself in. The remaining passengers looked at one another. "'What does it mean?' cried one. "'A ventriloquist aboard, of course,' returned another. "'Let's follow and see the fun.' "'I wonder which of us it is,' remarked the first, looking hard at our party." I don't know, but come on. That fellow Nick Ward is a noted black lag and ruffian, had his nose broken in a fight, and is sensitive on the subject. Was cheating, of course. They passed out, our party close in the rear. Where's that Dutch villain? Ward was screaming, following up his question with a volley of oaths. Who? asked the mate. I've seen none up here, though there are some in the steerage. Down to the steerage flew the gambler without waiting to reply and, bounding into a group of German immigrants seated there, quietly smoking their pipes, angrily demanded which of them it was who had been on the upper deck just now, abusing him, and calling him a cheat and a man with a broken nose. They heard him in silence, with a cool, phlegmatic indifference most exasperating to one in his present mood. Drawing his revolver, Speak! he shouted. Tell me which one of you it was, or I'll, I'll shoot every mother's son of you. His arms were suddenly pinioned from behind, while a deep voice grunted, You will, will you? I think not. You are my prisoner. There is no party here as they call your names, and you will put up that little gun. A man of giant size and Herculean strength had laid aside his pipe, and, slowly rising to his feet, seized the scoundrel in his powerful grasp. Let me go, yelled Ward, making a desperate effort to free his arms. Aha! Men with the broken nose, you wish wake up the wrong passenger again, came mockingly from above. It is me as calls you one big sheet, 
and I does you it again. There, the villain's up on the deck now, cried Ward, in impotent rage, grinding his teeth. Let go my arms. Let go, I say, and I'll teach him a lesson. I thinks no. I thinks I did you one lesson, returned his captor, not relaxing his grasp in the least. But the captain's voice was heard in stern tones, asking, What's the cause of all this disturbance? What are you doing down there, Ward? I'll have no fighting aboard. The German released his prisoner, and the latter slunk away with muttered threats and imprecations upon the head of his tormentor. Both that night and the next there was much speculation among the passengers in regard to the occurrence, but our friends kept their own counsel, and the children, cautioned not to divulge Cousin Ronald's secret, guarded it carefully, for all had been trained to obedience, and were anxious not to lose the fun he made for them. Mr. Lilburn and Mr. Daly, each at a different time, sought out the young man, Ward's intended victim, and tried to influence him for good. He thought that he had been rescued by the interposition of some supernatural agency, and solemnly declared his fixed determination never again to approach a gaming table, and, throughout the voyage, adhered to his resolution, in spite of every influence Ward could bring to bear upon him to break it. Yet there was gambling again the second night, between Ward and several others of his profession. They kept it up till after midnight. Then Mr. Lilburn, waking from his first sleep in a stateroom nearby, thought he would break it up once more. A deep stillness reigned in the cabin. It would seem that every one on board the vessel, except themselves and the watch on deck, were wrapped in profound slumber. An intense, voiceless excitement possessed the players, for the game was a close one, and the stakes were very heavy. They bent eagerly over the board, each watching with feverish anxiety his companion's movements each casting, now and again, a gloating eye upon the heap of gold and greenbacks that lay between them, and at times half stretching out his hand to clutch it. A deep groan startled them, and they sprang to their feet, pale and trembling with sudden terror, each holding his breath and straining his ear to catch a repetition of the dread sound. But all was silent, and after a moment of anxious waiting, they sat down to their game again trying to conceal and shake off their fears with a forced, unnatural laugh. But scarcely had they taken the cards into their hands again, when a second groan, deeper, louder, and more prolonged than the first, again started them to their feet. "'I tell you, this is growing serious,' whispered one, in a shaking voice, his very lips white with fear. "'It came from under the table,' gasped Ward. "'Look what's there. Look yourself.' both together, then, and simultaneously they bent down and peered into the space under the board. There was nothing there. "'What can it have been?' they asked each other. "'Oh, nonsense, what fools we are. Of course someone's ill in one of the staterooms.' And they resumed their game for the second time. But a voice of full of unutterable anguish came from beneath their feet. "'Father Abraham, have mercy on me!' And send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And in mortal terror they sprang up, dashed down their cards, and fled, not even waiting to gather up the filthy lucre for which they were selling their souls. It was the last game of cards for that trip. The captain, coming in shortly after the sudden flight of the gamblers, took charge of the money, and the next day restored it to the owners. To Elsie's observant eyes, it presently became evident that the dailies were in very straitened circumstances. They made no complaint, but with her warm sympathy and delicate tact, she soon drew from the wife all the information she needed to convince her that here was a case that called for the pecuniary assistance Providence had put in her power to give. She consulted with her husband, and the result was a warm invitation to the dailies to spend the winter at Via Mead where they would have all the benefit of the mild climate, congenial society, use of the library, horses, etc., and be at no expense. "'Oh, how kind, how very kind,' Mrs. Daly said, with tears of joy and gratitude. "'We have hardly known how we should meet the most necessary expenses of this trip, but have been trying to cast our care upon the Lord, asking Him to provide, and how wonderfully He has answered our petitions. But... It seems too much, too much for you to do for strangers. Strangers, my dear friend, 
Elsie answered, pressing her hand affectionately. Are we not sisters in Christ? Ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Ye are all one in Christ Jesus. We feel, my husband and I, that we are only the stewards of his bounty, and, because he has said, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. It is the greatest privilege and delight to do anything for his people. Mr. Traveller had already expressed the same sentiments to Mr. Daly, so the poor minister and his wife accepted the invitation with glad and thankful hearts, and Harold and Frank learned with delight that they were to live together for what seemed to their infant minds an almost interminable length of time. The passage to New Orleans was made without accident or detention. As our party left the vessel, a voice was heard from the hold, crying in dolorous accents and a rich Irish brogue, Oh, Captain dear, help me out, help me out! I've got fast between these boxes here, bad cess to em. I can't help myself at all, at all. Help you out, you passage thief, roared the captain in return. Yes, I'll help you out with a vengeance, and put you into the hands of the police. Aha, aha, mm hmm, mm hmm. You shall have to catch him first, remarked Mr. Lilburn, with a quiet smile stepping from the plank to the wharf as he spoke. "'Ah, cousin, you are incorrigible,' said Elsie laughingly. End of chapter 23 of Elsie's Motherhood Recording by Elena May Chapter 24 of Elsie's Motherhood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Elsie's Motherhood by Martha Finlay. Chapter 24. The trees did bud and early blossoms bear, and all the choir of birds did sweetly sing and told that garden's pleasures in their caroling. Spencer's Fairy Queen. Nothing could be lovelier than was Viamede as they found it on their arrival. The children, one and all, were in an ecstasy of delight over the orange orchard with its wealth of golden fruit, glossy leaves, and delicate blossoms, the velvety lawn with its magnificent shade trees, the variety and profusion of beautiful flowers, and the spacious lordly mansion. They ran hither and thither, jumping, dancing, clapping their hands, and calling to each other with shouts of glee. The pleasure and admiration of the older people were scarcely less, though shown after a soberer fashion but no check was put upon the demonstrations of joy of the younger ones. They were allowed to gamble, frolic, and play, and to feast themselves upon the luscious fruit to their heart's content. Nor was the gladness all on the side of the new arrivals. To the old house-servant, many of whom still remained, the coming of their beloved young mistress and her children had been in revenge looked forward to with longing for years. They wept for joy as they gathered about her, kissed her hand, and clasped her little ones in their hand, fondling them and calling them by every endearing name known to the negro vocabulary. And their children, having heard a great deal, both from Mamma and Mammy, about these old people and their love and loyalty to the family, were neither surprised nor displeased, but quite ready to receive and return the affection lavished upon them. The party from Lansdale arrived only a few days after the others, and were welcomed with great rejoicings, in which even Bruno must have a share. He jumped and gambled about Harry and May, tried to kiss the babies, and finally put his nose into Aunt Wilfie's lap, saying, "'You're an old lady, ma'am, and I'm glad you've come.' ah she answered patting his head and laughing her low sweet silvery laugh you betray your scotch accent my fine fellow and i'm too old a chaff to be caught with a bird mr mason was still chaplain at viamede and with his wife and children occupied a pretty and commodious cottage that had been built on the estate expressly for their use when he and Mr. Daly met, they instantly and delightedly recognized each other as former classmates and intimate friends, and the Dalys, by urgent invitation, took up their abode for the winter in the cottage, but Mr. and Mrs. Travilla were careful that it should still be entirely at their expense. A suite of apartments in the mansion was appropriated to each of the other families, and it was unanimously agreed that each should feel at perfect liberty to withdraw into the privacy of these, having their meals served to them there, if they so desired, or at their pleasure to mingle with the others in the breakfast parlour, dining-room, drawing-rooms, library, etc. 
the first fortnight was made a complete holiday to all the days being filled up with games walks rides drives and excursions by land and water in consequence of the changes occasioned by the war they found but little society in the neighbourhood now yet scarcely missed it having so much within themselves but at length even the children began to grow somewhat weary of constant play harry duncan and horace jr announced their speedy departure to attend to business and the other adults of the party felt that it was time to take up again the ordinary duties of life mr daly anxious to make some return for the kindness shown him offered to act as tutor to all the children who were old enough for school duties but rosie put her arms around her father's neck and looking beseechingly into his eyes said she preferred her old tutor at which he smiled and stroking her hair said that she should keep him then for he would be quite as loath to give up his pupil and elsie's children clinging about her entreated that their lessons might still be said to mamma so they shall my darling she answered for mamma loves to teach you the young carringtons too and their mother preferred the old way so mr daly's kind offer was declined with thanks and perhaps he was not sorry being weak and languid and in no danger of suffering from ennui with horses to ride and plenty of books at hand a schoolroom was prepared but only the Travillas occupied it sophie preferred to use her dressing-room and rosie studying in her own room and reciting to her papa in his or the library elsie expected her children to find it a little hard to go back to the old routine but it was not so they came to her with bright happy faces were quiet and diligent and when the recitations were over gathered about her for a little chat before returning to their play mamma said eddie we've had a nice long holiday and it's really pleasant to get back to lessons again so it is said vi don't you think so elsie yes indeed nice to get back to our books but we've had lessons almost every day grandpa and papa and mamma teaching us so much about the birds insects and all sorts of living things and the flowers and plants trees stones and oh i don't know how many things that are different here from what we have at home at home why this is home isn't it mamma exclaimed eddie yes my son one of our homes yes and so beautiful said vi but iron appears the homiest to me does it darling asked mamma giving her a smile and a kiss yes mamma and i love iron dearly via made most as well though because you were born here and your dear mamma and because that dear grandma is buried here remarked her sister and because of all those dear graves mamma i do like those lessons i was speaking of and so do eddie and vi but herbert and meta and harry don't they say they think them very stupid and dull i'm glad my children that you love knowledge their mother said because it is useful the more knowledge we have the more good we can do if we will and then it is a lasting pleasure god's works are so wonderful that we can never learn all about them while we live in this world and i suppose throughout the endless ages of eternity we shall be ever learning yet always finding still more to learn mamma how pleasant that will be said elsie thoughtfully and oh mamma cried vi that reminds me that we've been out of doors most all the daytimes and haven't seen grandma's playroom and things yet won't you show them to us yes we will go now me too mamma asked harold yes all of you come i want you all to see everything that i have that once belonged to my dear mother aunt rosie wants to see them too said vi and herbert and meta and the others added elsie they shall see them afterward i want no one but my own little children now replied mamma taking harold's hand and leading the way she led them to the room a large and very pleasant one light and airy where the flowers were blooming and birds singing vines trailing over and about the windows lovely pictures on the walls cosy chairs and couches work tables well supplied with all the implements for sewing others suited for drawing writing or cutting upon standing here and there quantities of books games and toys nothing seemed to have been forgotten that could give pleasant employment for their leisure hours or to minister to their amusement there was a burst of united exclamations of wondering delight from the children as the door was thrown open and they entered now they understood why mamma had put them off when several times they had asked to be brought to this room she was having it fitted up in a way to give them a joyful surprise do you like it my darlings she asked with a pleasant smile oh yes 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 indeed they cried jumping dancing and clapping their hands dear dear mamma how good how good you are to us and they nearly smothered her with caresses releasing herself she opened another door leading into her adjoining room which to eddie's increased delight was fitted up as a workroom for boys with every set of tool used by carpenters and cabinet-makers he had such at iron and was somewhat acquainted with their use 
oh what nice times herbert and harry and i shall have he exclaimed what pretty things we'll make mamma i don't know how to thank you my dear father he added catching her hand and pressing it to his lips with passionate affection be good and obedient to us kind and affectionate to your brothers sisters and playmates she said stroking his hair that is the kind of thanks we want my boy we have no greater joy than to see our children good and happy if we don't be it's just our own fault and we're ever so wicked and bad cried vi vehemently mamma smiled at a little girl's impetuosity and then in grave tender tones said and is there not some one else more deserving of love and thanks than even mamma and papa god our kind heavenly father murmured little elsie happy grateful tears shining in her soft eyes yes it is from his kind hand all our blessings come i love god said harold so does frank mamma can frank come up here to play with me yes indeed frank is a dear good little boy and i like to have you together mamma unlocked the door of a large light closet as she spoke and the children looking eagerly in saw that its shelves were filled with beautiful toys grandma's thing they said softly yes these are what my dear mother played with when she was a little girl like elsie and vi said mamma you may look at them there was a large baby house beautifully furnished there were many dolls of various sizes and little chests and trunks full of nicely made clothes for them to wear night clothes morning wrappers gay silks and lovely white dresses bonnets and hats shoes and stockings too and ribbons and laces for the lady dolls and for the gentlemen coats hats vests cravats and everything that real grown-up men wear and for the baby dolls there were many suits of beautiful baby clothes and all made so they could be easily taken off and put on again there were cradles to rock the babies in and coaches for them to ride in there were dinner and tea sets of the finest china and of solid silver indeed almost anything in the shape of toys that the childish heart could desire the lonely little girl had not lacked for any pleasure that money could procure but she had hungered for the best earthly gift the love of father mother brothers and sisters which can be neither bought nor sold the children examined all these things with intense interest and a sort of wondering awe then begged their mother to tell them again about dear grandma they had heard the story all that mamma and mammy could tell many times but it never lost its charm yes dears i will i love to think and speak of her elsie said sitting down in a low chair while they gathered closely around her the older two one on each side the others leaning upon her lap mamma it is a sad story but i love it little elsie said drawing a deep sigh as the tale came to an end yes poor little girl playing up here all alone said eddie except mammy corrected vi yes with mammy to love her take care of her but no brother or sister to play with and no dear mamma or papa like ours yes poor dear grandma sighed little elsie and it was almost as hard for you mamma when you were a little girl didn't you feel very sad ah daughter had jesus to love me and help me in all my childish griefs and troubles the mother answered with a glad smile and mammy to hug and kiss and love me just as she does you but oh didn't you want your mamma and papa yes sorely sorely at times but i think no little child could be happier than i was when at last my dear father came home and i found that he loved me dearly ah i am so glad so thankful that my darlings have never suffered for lack of love i too mamma and i and i they exclaimed clinging about her and loading her with caresses hark she said i hear your dear grandpa's step there he is knocking at the door eddie ran to open it ah i thought i should find you here daughter this mr dinsmore said coming in i too want to see these things it is long since i looked at them she gave him a pleased look and smile and stepping to the closet he stood for some moments silently gazing upon its treasures you do well to preserve them with cares as mementos of your mother he remarked coming back and seating himself by her side oh grandpa you could tell us more about her and dear mamma too when she was a little girl said little elsie seating herself upon his knee twining her arms about his neck and looking coaxingly into his face ah what a dear little girl your mamma was at your age he said stroking her hair and gazing fondly first at her and then at her mother the very joy of my heart and the light of my eyes they are not dearer than she is now elsie returned the loving glance and smile while her namesake daughter remarked mamma couldn't be nicer or sweeter than she is now nobody could no no indeed chimed in the rest of the little flock grandpa please tell the story you never did tell it to us no he said half sighing but you shall have it now then went on to relate how he had first met their mother's mother then a very beautiful girl of fifteen an acquaintance took him to call upon a young lady friend of his to whom elsie grayson was paying a visit and the two were in the drawing-room together when the young man entered 
what did you think the first minute you saw her grandpa asked eddy that she had the sweetest most beautiful face and perfect form i had ever laid eyes on and that i would give all i was worth to have her for my own love at first sight his daughter remarked with a smile and it was mutual yes she told me afterward that she had loved me from the first though the longer i live the more i wonder that it should have been so for i was a wild wildwood youth but she poor thing had none to love and cherish her but her mammy grandpa i think her very nice put in vi leaning on his knee and gazing affectionately into his face i'm glad you do he said patting her soft round cheek but to go on with my story i could not keep away from my charmer and for the next few weeks we saw each other daily i asked her to be my own little wife had she consented then one early morning we went to a church and were married no one being present except the minister the sexton and her friend and mine who were engaged to each other and her faithful mammy her guardian was away in a distant city and knew nothing about the matter he was taken sick there and did not return for three months and during that time elsie and i lived together in a house she owned in new orleans we thought that now we were safely married no one could ever separate us and we were very very happy but one evening her guardian came suddenly upon us as we sat together in her boudoir and in a great passion ordered me out of the house elsie was terribly frightened and i said i will go to-night for peace's sake but elsie is my wife and to-morrow i shall come and claim her as such and i think you'll find i have the law on my side elsie clung to me and wept bitterly but i comforted her with the assurance that the parting was only for a few hours mr dinsmore's voice faltered he paused a moment and then went on in tones husky with emotion we never saw each other again when i went back in the morning the house was closed and quite deserted not even a servant in it and i knew not where to look for my lost wife i went back to my hotel and there found my father waiting for me in my room he was very angry about my marriage the news of which had brought him from home he made me go back with him at once and sent me north to college i heard nothing of my wife for months and then only that she was dead and had left me a little daughter and that was our mamma cried the children once more crowding about her to lavish caresses upon her they thanked their grandfather for his story and vi looking in at the closet door again said in her most coaxing tones mamma i should so so like to play a little with some of those lovely things and i would be very careful not to spoil them not now daughter though perhaps i may allow it some day when you're older but see here will not these do quite as well and rising mrs travilla opened the door of another closet displaying to the children's delighted eyes other toys as fine and in as great profusion and variety as those she considered sacred to her mother's memory oh yes yes mamma how lovely how kind you are are they for us he exclaimed in joyous tones yes she said i brought them for you while we were in new orleans and you shall play with them whenever you like and now we will lock the doors and go down to dress for dinner the first bell is ringing after dinner the playroom and the contents of the two closets were shown to mrs dinsmore rosie and the carringtons and then mrs travilla locked the door of the one that held the treasured relics of her departed mother and carried away the key after dinner the playroom and the contents of the two closets were shown to mrs dinsmore rosie and the carrington then mrs travilla locked the door of the one that held the treasured relics of her departed mother and carried away the key End of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of elsie's motherhood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Elsie's Motherhood by Martha Finley. Chapter 25th. She'd lift the teapot lid to peep at what was in it, or tilt the kettle if you did, but turn your back in a minute. Meta Carrington had many excellent traits of character, was frank, generous, unselfish, and sincere but these good qualities were offset by some very serious faults she was prying and full of desire for whatever was forbidden the other children played contentedly with the toys provided for them but meta secretly nursed a great longing for those mrs travilla had chosen to withhold she was constantly endeavouring to devise some plan by which to get possession of them she attempted to pick the lock with a nail then with a knife but failing in that seized every opportunity of doing so unobserved to try the keys from other doors in different parts of the house till at length she found one that would answer her purpose 
then she watched her chance to use it in the absence of her mates at length such a time came the ladies had all gone out for an airing the little ones too in charge of their nurses vi and the boys were sporting on the lawn and elsie was at the piano practising certain faithful little worker that she was not to leave it till the allotted hour had expired having satisfied herself of all this meta flew to the playroom and half trembling at her own temerity admitted herself to the forbidden treasures there was no hesitancy in regard to her further proceedings for weeks past she had had them all carefully arranged in her mind she would have a tea-party though unfortunately there could be no guests present but the dolls yet at all events she could have the great pleasure of handling that beautiful china and silver and seeing how a table would look set out with them a pleasure doubled by the fact that she was enjoying it in opposition to the known wishes and commands of her mother and the owner for in meta's esteem stolen waters were sweet indeed she selected a damask tablecloth from a pile that lay on one of the lower shelves several napkins to match slipping each of these last into a silver ring she had taken from a little basket that stood alongside and proceeded with quiet glee to deck a table with them and the sets of china and silver she most admired beautiful beautiful i never saw anything so pretty she exclaimed half aloud as her task finished she stood gazing in rapt delight at the result of her labours oh i think it's real mean in aunt elsie to say we shan't play with these and to lock them up away from us but now for the company and running into the closet again she brought out several of the largest dolls i'll dress them for dinner she said still talking to herself in an undertone that'll be fun what lots of lovely things i shall find in these trunks i'll look them over and select what i like best to have them wear i'll have time enough it isn't at all likely anybody will come to disturb me for an hour and as she opened the first trunk she glanced hastily at the clock on the mantel she was mistaken time flew away much faster than she was aware of and scarce half an hour had passed when a pair of little feet came dancing along the hall the door which in her haste and preoccupation meta had forgotten to lock flew open and vi stood before her the great blue eyes turning toward the table opened wide with astonishment why why meta meta's face flushed deeply for a moment but thinking the best plan would be to brave it out isn't it pretty she asked as unconcernedly as she could yes oh lovely but where did you aren't they my grandma's things oh meta how could you ever dare pooh i'm not going to hurt them and why should you think they were hers can't other people have pretty things yes but i know their grandmas i rec rec recognize them oh what shall we do i wouldn't venture to touch them even to put them back what a big word that was you used just now said meta laughing it most choked you well when i'm bigger it won't returned vi still gazing at the table oh how lovely they are i do wish mamma would let us play with them so do i and these dolls too it's just delightful to dress and undress them here vi help me put this one's shoes on the temptation to handle the tiny dainty shoes and see how well they fitted the feet of the pretty doll was great and not giving herself time to think violet dropped down on the carpet by meta's side and complied with the request just to slip on those lovely shoes now that they were there right before her that's not much so said the tempter then now having done a little what difference if she did a little more thoughtless and excitable she presently forgot mamma and her commands and became as eagerly engaged as meta herself in the fascinating deployment of looking over the contents of the trunks and trying now one and now another suit upon the dollies now this one's dressed and i'll set her up at the table said meta jumping up oh my something fell with a little crash on the lid of the trunk by vi's side and there at her feet lay one of the beautiful old china plates broken into a dozen pieces the child started up perfectly aghast the whole extent of her delinquency flashing upon her in that instant oh oh what have i done what a wicked wicked girl i am what will mamma say and she burst into an agony of grief and remorse 
"'You didn't do it, nor I either,' said Meta, stooping to gather up the fragments. "'The doll kicked it off. There, Vi, don't cry so. "'I'll put the things all back just as they were, "'and never, never touch one of them again. "'But you can't, because this one's broken. "'Oh, dear, oh, dear, I wish you had let them alone, Meta. "'I wish, I wish I had been a good girl and obeyed Mamma. "'Never mind. If she goes to whip you, I'd tell her it was most all my fault.' "'But she needn't know. It won't be a story to put them back and say nothing about it. "'And most likely it won't be found out for years and years. Maybe never. "'You see, I'll just put this plate between the others in the pile, "'and it won't be noticed at all that it's broken, unless somebody takes them all down to look.' "'But I must tell Mamma," sobbed Violet. "'I couldn't hide it. I always tell her everything, and I'd feel so wicked.' "'Violet Travilla. "'I'd never have believed you'd be so mean as to tell tales,' remarked Meta severely. "'I'd never have played with you if I'd known it.' "'I'll not. I didn't mean that. I'll only tell on myself.' "'But you can't do that without telling on me, too, and I say it's real mean. "'I'll never tell a story about it, but I don't see any harm in just getting the things away and saying nothing. "'Taint as if you were throwing the blame on somebody else.' pursued meta gathering up the articles abstracted from the closet and replacing them as nearly as possible as she had found them come dry your eyes vi she went on or somebody'll see you've been crying and ask what it was about but i must tell mamma reiterated the little girl sobbing anew and make her feel worried and sorry because the plate's broken when it can't do any good and she needn't ever know about it i call that real selfishness this to vi was a new view of the situation she stopped crying to consider it. It certainly would grieve Mamma to know that the plate was broken, and perhaps even more to hear of her child's disobedience, and if not told she would be spared all that pain. But on the other hand, Mamma had always taught her children that wrongdoing should never be concealed. The longer Vi pondered the question, the more puzzled she grew. Meta perceived that she wavered and immediately seized her advantage. "'Come now, Vi, I'm sure you don't want to give pain to your mamma "'or get me into trouble, do you?' "'No, Meta, indeed I don't, but—' "'Hush, somebody's coming,' exclaimed Meta, "'locking the closet door, having just finished her work, "'and hastily dropping the key into her pocket. "'Come, girls, come quick, we're sending up a balloon from the lawn,' "'cried Eddie, throwing open the door to make his announcement, "'then rushing away again. "'The girls ran after him in much excitement, and forgetting for the time the trouble they were in, for spite of Meta's sophistry, her conscience was by no means easy. The ladies had returned, and in dinner dress were gathered on the veranda. Mr. Travilla seemed to be managing the affair, with Mr. Dinsmore's assistance, while the other gentlemen, children, and servants were grouped about them on the lawn. Meta and Violet took their places with the rest, and just at that moment the balloon, released from its fastenings, shot up in the air. There was a general shout and clapping of hands, but instantly hushed by a shrill, sharp cry of distress from overhead. "'Oh, oh, pull it down again! Pull it down! Pull it down! I only got in for fun, and I'm so frightened! I shall fall out! I shall be killed! Oh, oh, oh!' The voice grew fainter and fainter, till it quickly died away in the distance as the balloon rose rapidly higher and higher into the deep blue of the sky." A wild excitement seized upon the little crowd. Oh, 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 wi I wi which of de chillins am up there? The mummies were asking, each sending a hasty glance around the throng to assure herself of the safety of her own particular charge. Who is it? Who is it? asked the children, the little girls beginning to sob and cry. Oh, it's Fank, it's Fank, screamed Harold. Papa, papa, please stop it quick. Fank, don't cry any more. Papa will get you down, won't you, papa? and he clung to his father's arm, sobbing bitterly. "'Son, Frank is not there,' said Mr. Travilla, taking the little weeper in his arms. "'There is no one in the balloon. It is not big enough to hold even a little boy like you or Frank.' "'Isn't it, Papa?' returned the child, dropping his head on his father's shoulder with a sigh of relief. "'Oh, it's Cousin Ronald! It's just Cousin Ronald!' exclaimed the children, their tears changing at once to laughter. Ah, yeah, um, yeah, so it is, Ben is. Just Cousin Ronald at his old tricks again, laughed Mr. Lilburn. Oh, there's nobody in it, so we needn't care how high it goes, 
cried Eddie, jumping and clapping his hands. See, see, it's up in the clouds now, and it doesn't look as big as my cap. Not half so big, I should say, remarked Herbert, and there, it's quite gone. The dinner bell rang, and all repaired to the dining room. End of chapter 25「Chapter twenty six of Elsie's Motherhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Elsie's Motherhood by Martha Finley. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs twenty two six. As naturally as the Helianthus to the sun. Did the faces of Elsie's little ones turn to her when in her loved presence? At the table, at their sports, their lessons, everywhere, and however employed, it was always the same. The young eyes turning ever and anon to catch the tender, sympathetic glance of mamma's. But at dinner today, Vi's great blue orbs met hers but once and instantly dropped upon her plate again, while a vivid blush suffused the fair face and neck. And when the meal was ended and all gathered in the drawing-room, Vi still seemed to be unlike her usual gay, sunny self, the merriest prattler of all the little crowd of children, the one whose sweet, silvery laugh rang out the oftenest. She stood alone, at a side table turning over some engravings, but evidently with very little interest. The mother, engaged in conversation with the other ladies, watched her furtively, a little troubled and anxious, yet deeming it best to wait for a voluntary confidence on the part of her child. Longing yet dreading to make it, Vi was again puzzling her young brain with the question whether Meta was right in saying it would be selfish to do so. Ah, if she could only ask Mamma which was the right way to do. It was the first perplexity she had not been able to carry to her for disentanglement. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Elsie had been careful to store her children's minds with the blessed teaching and precious promises of God's holy book. She had also taught them to go to God, their Heavenly Father, with every care, sorrow, doubt, and difficulty. I'll ask Jesus, thought Vi. He'll help me to know. Because the Bible says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. She slipped into an adjoining room, where she was quite alone, and kneeling down, whispered softly, with low sobs and many tears, Dear Father, in heaven, I've been a very, very naughty girl. I've disobeyed my dear mamma. Please forgive me, for Jesus' sake, and make me good. Please, Lord Jesus, help me to know if I ought to tell Mama. A text, one of the many she had learned to recite to her mother in that precious morning half hour, came to her mind as she arose from her knees. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. I did not cover them, she said to herself. I told God. But then God knew all about it before. He sees and knows everything, but Mamma does not know. Perhaps it means I mustn't cover them from her. I think Jesus did tell me. Wiping away her tears, she went back to the drawing room. The gentlemen were just leaving it, her father among the rest. A sudden resolution seized her as she ran after them. Papa! He turned at the sound of her voice. Well, daughter, I I want to ask you something. Another time, then, pet, Papa's in a hurry now. But seeing the distress in the dear little face, he came to her and laying his hand on her head in tender fatherly fashion, said, Tell Papa what is it that troubles you. 
I will wait to hear it now. Papa, she said, choking down a sob. I, I don't know what to do. About what, daughter? Papa, suppose, suppose I've done something naughty, and, and it would grieve dear mamma to hear it. Ought I to tell her, and, and make her sorry? My dear little daughter, he said, bending down to look with grave, tender eyes into the troubled face. Never, never conceal anything from your mother. It is not safe for you, pet, for she would far rather bear the pain of knowing. If our children knew how much, how very much we both love them, they would never want to hide anything from us. Papa, I don't. But somebody says it would be selfish to hurt Mama so. The selfishness was in doing the naughty thing, not in confessing it. Go, my child, and tell Mama all about it. He hastened away, and Violet crept back to the drawing room. The other children were leaving it. Come, Vi, they said. We're going for a walk. Thank you. I don't wish to go this time, she answered with gravity. I've something to attend to. What a grown-up way of talking you have, you little midget, laughed Meta, then putting her lips closer to Vi's ear. Violet Travilla, she whispered. Don't you tell tales, or I'll never, never play with you again as long as I live. Mama says it's wicked to say that, returned Vi, and I don't tell tales. Then as Meta ran away, Violet drew near her mother's chair. Mama was talking, so she must not interrupt. So she waited, longing to have the confession over, yet feeling her courage almost fail with the delay. Elsie saw it all, and at length seized an opportunity, while the rest were conversing among themselves, to take Vi's hand and draw her aside. I think my little girl has something to say to mother she whispered softly smoothing back the clustered curls and looking tenderly into the tear-stained face violet nodded assent her heart was so full she could not have spoken a word without bursting into tears and sobs mamma understood and rose and led her from the room led her to her own dressing-room where they could be quite secure from intrusion then seating herself and taking the child on her lap what is wrong with my dear little daughter she asked oh mamma mamma i'm so sorry so sorry cried the child bursting into a passion of tears and sobs putting her arms about her mother's neck and hiding her face on her breast mamma is sorry too dear sorry for anything that makes her vi unhappy what is it? What can mother do to comfort you? Mamma, I don't deserve for you to be so kind, and you will have to punish instead of comforting. But I just want to tell about my own self. You know I can't tell tales, Mamma. No, daughter, I do not ask or wish it, but tell me about yourself. Mamma, it will make you sorry, ever so sorry. Yes, dear, but I must bear it for your sake. Oh, Mamma, I don't like to make you sorry. I, I wish I hadn't, hadn't been so naughty. Oh, so naughty, Mamma, for I played with some of your Mamma's things that you forbade us to touch, and, and one lovely plate got all broken up. I am very sorry to hear that, returned the mother, yet far more grieved by my child's sin but how did you get the door open and the plates off the shelf i didn't mamma they were out someone else did it yes mamma but you know i can't tell tales it wasn't any of our children though none of them were naughty but just me were you playing with the plate did you break it no mamma i didn't touch the plates but i was dressing one of the dollies they are all locked up again now, Mama, and I don't think anybody will ever touch them any more. A little tender, serious talk about sin and danger of disobedience to parents, and the mother knelt with her child. 
in a few simple words ask god's forgiveness for her then telling vi she must remain alone in that room till bedtime she left her not one harsh or angry word had been spoken and the young heart was full of passionate love to her mother that made the thought of having grieved her a far bitterer punishment than the enforced solitude though that was at any time irksome enough to one of vi's social fun-loving temperament it cost the mother a pang to inflict the punishment and leave the darling alone in her trouble but elsie was not one to weakly yield to inclination when it came in conflict with duty hers was not selfish love she would bear any present pain to secure the future welfare of her children she rejoined her friends in the drawing-room apparently as serenely happy as her wont but through all the afternoon and evening her heart was with her little one in her banishment and grief yearning over her with tenderest mother love little elsie too missed her sister and returning from her walk went in search of her she found her at last in their mamma's dressing-room seated at the window her cheek resting on her hand the tears coursing slowly down while her eyes gazed longingly out over the beautiful fields and the lovely orange groves oh my own vi my darling little sister what is the matter asked elsie clasping her in her arms and kissing the wet cheek a burst of bitter sobs while the small arms clung about the sister's neck and the golden head rested for an instant on her shoulder then the words ah oh, i tell you but i can't now for you must run right away because mamma said i must stay here all alone till bedtime then i must go pet but don't cry so if you've been naughty and are sorry jesus and mamma too will forgive you and love you just the same elsie said kissing her again then releasing her and hurried from the room crying heartily in sympathy on the upper veranda whither she went to recover her composure before rejoining her mates she found her mother pacing slowly to and fro is my elsie in trouble too mrs travilla asked pausing in her walk and holding out her hand for my fie mamma sobbed elsie taking the hand and pressing it to her lips yes poor little pet mother's heart aches for her too mrs travilla answered her own eyes filling i am glad my little daughters love and sympathize with each other mamma i would rather stay with vi than be with the others may i no daughter i have told her that she must spend the rest of the day alone yes mamma she told me so and wouldn't let me stay even one minute to hear about her trouble that was right time crept very slowly to violet she thought that afternoon the longest she had never known after a while she heard a familiar step and almost before she knew it papa had her in his arms with a little cry of joy she put hers around his neck and returned the kiss he had given her oh i'm so glad she said but papa you have to go away because nobody can stay with me i'm papa may he said sitting down with her on his knee so you told mamma about the naughtiness yes sir i'm glad you did always tell mamma everything if you have disobeyed her never delay a moment and go and confess it yes papa but if it's you then come to me in the same way i want you to be a happy child and have no concealment from father or mother shall i tell you about it now papa you may do as you like about that since your mother knows it all papa i'm afraid you wouldn't love such a naughty girl any more mamma loves you quite as well and so shall i because you are our own own little daughter there were tears in mamma's eyes when she told me that she had to punish our little vi oh i'm so sorry to have made mamma cry sobbed the child sin always brings sorrow and suffering sooner or later my little girl 
remember that and that is because jesus loves us that he would save us from our sins after a little more talk in which violet repeated to him the same story of her wrongdoing that she had already told her mother her papa left her and she was again alone till mammy came with her supper a bowl of rich sweet milk and bread from the unbolted flour that she might have tempted the appetite of an epicure come honey dry those wet eyes and eat your supper said mammy setting it out daintily on the little table which she had placed before the child and covered with a fine damask cloth fresh from the iron de milks de all clean and de bread good as can be and you can have as much as er as you want aboard dem did mamma say so mammy yes child and don't shed no more tears now old mamma's loves you like her life but i've been very naughty mammy sobbed the little girl yes miss little honey and we's all been naughty but de good lord forgive us for jesus sake if we sorry and don't tend never to do so no more yes mammy oh i wish you could stay with me but you mustn't for mamma said i must be all alone yes darlin and if you wants more supper just ring and mammy will come she placed a small silver bell on the table beside vi and with a tender compassionate look at the tear swollen face went away the young travillas were sometimes denied dainties because of misconduct but always allowed to satisfy their youthful appetites with an abundance of wholesome nourishing food vi ate her supper with a keen relish and found herself greatly comforted by it how much one's views of life are brightened by a good comfortable meal that does not overtax the digestive organs vi suddenly remembered with a feeling of relief that the worst of her trouble the confession was over and the punishment nearly so it was only a little while till mamma came and took her on her lap and kissed her and forgave her mamma i'm so so sorry for having disobeyed and grieved you whispered the child weeping afresh for i do love you very very much my own mamma i know it dearest but i want you to be far more sorry for having disobeyed god who loves you more a great deal than your parents do and has given you every good thing you have yes mamma i've asked god many times to forgive me for jesus sake and i think he has yes if you've asked him with your heart i am sure he has for jesus said verily verily i say unto you whosoever shall ask the father in my name he will give it you there was a little pause vi nestling close in her mother's arms then with a quiver in her voice mamma she sighed will you ever trust me again just the same as before my child because i believe you are truly sorry for your sin against god and against me thank you dear dear mamma oh i hope god will help me to keep from ever being naughty any more end of chapter twenty six Chapter Twenty Seven of Elsie's Motherhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Elsie's Motherhood by Martha Finley. Chapter Twenty Seven. Conscience makes cowards of us all. Meta was not in a cheerful or companionable mood during the walk that afternoon. The stings of conscience goaded her, and she was haunted by the fear that Violet, so young and innocent, so utterly unused to concealments, would betray her share in the mischief done, even without intending to do so. "'Meta, what's the matter with you?' Herbert asked at length. "'You haven't spoken a pleasant word since we came out.' "'I'm not ill,' was the laconic reply. 
then you must be in the sulks and ought to have stayed at home returned the plain-spoken brother oh don't tease her said little elsie perhaps she has a headache and i know by myself that that makes one feel dull and sometimes even cross you cross i don't believe you ever were in your life said herbert i've never seen you anything but pleasant as a may morning don't quarrel children but help me gather some of these lovely flowers to scatter over the graves up there on the hill said rosie dinsmore our grave said eddie softly yes i'd like to but aunt rosie i don't believe we can get in yes we can she answered uncle joe's up there at work weeding and trimming the rose bushes then i'll gather plenty of these beauties said eddie stooping to pluck the lovely many-hued blossoms that spangled the velvety grass at their feet in every direction how beautiful how beautiful they are and some of them so fragrant exclaimed elsie rapidly filling a pretty basket she carried in her hand how good god is to give us so many lovely things yes returned rosie it seems a pity to pluck them from their stems and make them wither and die but there is such a profusion that what we take can hardly be missed and it's honoring our graves to scatter flowers over them isn't it aunt rosie eddie asked why do you say our graves just as if you were already buried there laughed herbert come said rosie i think we have enough now oh aunt rosie down in that little dell yonder they are still thicker than here and more beautiful i think exclaimed elsie but we have enough now your basket is full we'll go to that dell as we come back and gather some to take home to our mammas. oh yes that will be best elsie said with cheerful acquiescence i shall go now and get some worthy to honor the dead said meta starting off in the direction of the dell meta likes to show her independence said rosie smiling we won't wait for her they climbed the hill pushed open the gate of the little enclosure and passed in very quietly for their youthful spirits were subdued by the solemn stillness of the place and a feeling of awe crept over them at the thought of the dead whose dust lay sleeping there silently they scattered the flowers over each lowly resting place reserving the most beautiful for that of her who was best known to them all the first who had borne the name of elsie dinsmore our dear grandma whispered elsie and eddie softly i can't help feeling as if she was some relation to me too said rosie because she was my sister's mother and papa's wife the breeze carried the words to the ear of uncle joe who was at work on the farther side of the enclosure and had not till that moment been aware of the vicinity of the young people he rose and came hobbling toward them pulling off his hat and bowing respectfully dat's so miss rosie ef you lubs de lord like she did de dear young missus dat lays here for don't de apostle say ob de lord's chillin dat days all one in christ jesus all one miss rosie heirs of god and joint heirs with christ yes uncle joe that is true ah she was lovely and loved de master well he went on leaning upon his staff and gazing fixedly at the name engraved on the stone she's not dead chillin her soul's with de lord in dat land of light and glory and de body planted here till de morning of de resurrection and then she will rise more beautiful than ever said little elsie mamma has told me about it the dead in christ shall rise first then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the lord repeated rosie yes miss rosie breast hope and uncle joe hobbled back to his work here look at thee said meta hurrying up heated and out of breath with running aren't they beauties she emptied her apron upon the grave as she spoke then pulled out her handkerchief with a jerk to wipe the perspiration from her face something fell against the tombstone with a ringing metallic sound a key a door key cried herbert stooping to pick it up why meta what key is it and what are you doing with it i never heard that it had any particular name she answered tartly snatching it from him and restoring it to her pocket while her cheeks flushed crimson the others exchanged surprised glances but said nothing but what door does it belong to and what are you doing with it persisted herbert talk of the curiosity of women and girls sneered meta men and boys have quite as much but it's against my principles to gratify it your principles laughed herbert you 
prying meddling meta talking about other people's curiosity well that's a good one you insulting boy i'll tell mamma of you retorted meta beginning to cry ha ha i wish you would tell her my remarks about the key and she'll soon make you explain where it belongs and how it came into your possession at that meta deigning no reply put her handkerchief to her eyes and hurried away toward the house there she's gone to tell mamma said harry not she said herbert she knows better she'd only get reproved for telling tales and be forced to tell all about that key she's been at some mischief i haven't a doubt she's always prying and meddling with what she's been told not to touch mamma says it's her besetting sin and what does she say is yours asked rosie looking him steadily in the eye herbert colored and turned away his mother had told him more than once or twice that he was quite too much disposed to domineer over and reprove his younger brothers and sisters well, i don't care he muttered to himself tisn't half so mean a fault as meta's i am the oldest and harry and the girls ought to be willing to let me tell them of it when they go wrong the key which belonged to a closet in mr lilburn's dressing-room seemed to burn in meta's pocket she was frightened that herbert and the others had seen it they all looked as if they knew something was wrong she said to herself and to be sure what business could i have with a door key dear me why wasn't i more careful but it's like murder will out or what the bible says be sure your sin will find you out she was afraid to meet her mother with the key in her possession so took a circuitous route to reach the house and walked so slowly that the others were there some time before her her mother was on the veranda looking out for her why how late you are meta she said make haste to your room and have your hair and dress made neat for the tea bell will soon ring yes ma'am and meta flew into the house and up to her room only too glad of an excuse for not stopping to be questioned she was down again barely in time to take her seat at the table with the others she glanced furtively at the faces of her mother grandmother and aunt elsie and drew a sigh of relief as she perceived that they had evidently learned nothing yet of her misconduct after tea she watched mr lilburn's movements and was glad to see him step into the library seat himself before the fire and take up a book he's safe to stay there for a while she thought so fond of reading as he is and ran up to her room for the key which she had left there hidden under her pillow she secured it unobserved and stole cautiously to the door of his dressing-room she found it slightly ajar pushed it a little wider open crept in gained the closet door and was in the act of putting the key into the lock when a deep groan coming from within the closet apparently so startled her that she uttered a faint cry and dropped the key on the floor then a hollow voice said if you ever touch that again i'll but meta waited to hear no more fear seemed to lend her wings and she flew from the room in a panic of terror aha aha mm -hmm, aha you were at some mischief no doubt my lassie the wicked flee when no man pursueth the good book tells us said the occupant of the room stepping out from the shadow of the window curtain he had laid down his book almost immediately remembering that he had some letters to write and had come up to his apartments in search of one he wished to answer it was already dark except for the light of a young moon but by some oversight of the servants the lamps had not yet been lighted here he was feeling about for matches when hearing approaching footsteps he stepped behind the curtain and waited to see who the intruder was he recognized meta's form and movements and sure that no legitimate errand had brought her there at that time resolved to give her a fright tearing down the hall meta suddenly encountered her mother who coming up to her own apartments had reached the head of the stairs just in time to witness meta's exit from those of mr lilburn oh i'm so frightened so frightened mamma said the child throwing herself into her mother's arms as you richly deserve to be said mrs carrington taking her by the hand and leading her into her dressing-room what were you doing in mr lilburn's apartments meta hung her head in silence speak meta i will have an answer her mother said with determination i wasn't doing any harm only putting away something that belonged there what was it a key meddling again 
prying even into the affairs of a strange gentleman groaned her mother meta what am i to do with you this dreadful fault of yours mortifies me beyond everything i feel like taking you back to ashlands at once and never allowing you to go from home at all lest you should bring a lifelong disgrace upon yourself and me mother i wasn't prying or meddling with mr lilburn's affairs said meta bursting into sobs and tears what were you doing there tell me all about it without any more ado knowing that her mother was a determined woman and seeing that there was now no escape from a full confession meta made it mrs carrington was much distressed meta you have robbed your aunt elsie your aunt elsie who has always been so good so kind to me and to you and i can never make good her loss never replace that plate just that one tiny plate couldn't be worth so very much muttered the offender its intrinsic value was perhaps not very great replied mrs carrington but to my dear friend it was worth much as a memento of her dead mother meta you shall not go with us to-morrow but shall spend the day locked up in your own room at home an excursion had been planned for the next day in which the whole party adults and children were to have a share they were to leave at an early hour in the morning travel several miles by boat and spend the day picnicking on a deserted plantation one meta had not yet seen but had heard spoken of as a very lovely place she had set her heart on going and this decree of her mother came upon her as a great blow she was very fond of being on the water and of seeing new places and had pictured to herself the delights of roaming over the large old house which she had heard was still standing peeping into the closets pulling open drawers perhaps discovering secret stairways and oh delightful thought possibly coming upon some hidden treasure forgotten by the owners in their hasty flight she wept bitterly coaxed pleaded and made fair promises for the future but all in vain her mother was firm you must stay at home meta she said it grieves me to deprive you of so great a pleasure but i must do what i can to help you overcome this dreadful fault you have chosen stolen pleasures at the expense of disobedience to me and most ungrateful wicked behavior toward my kind friend and as a just and necessary punishment you must be deprived of the share you were to have had in the innocent enjoyments planned for to-morrow you shall also make a full confession to your aunt elsie and ask her forgiveness i won't exclaimed meta angrily then catching the look of pained surprise in her mother's face she ran to her and throwing her arms about her neck oh mamma mamma forgive me she cried i can't bear to see you look so grieved i will never say that again i will do whatever you bid me mrs carrington kissed her child in silence then taking her by the hand come and let us have this painful business over she said and led the way to mrs travilla's boudoir elsie had no reproaches for meta but kindly forgave her and even requested that she might be permitted to share in the morrow's enjoyment but mrs carrington would not hear of it End of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of elsie's motherhood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson elsie's motherhood by martha finley chapter twenty eight mature i'll court in her sequestered haunts by mountain meadow streamlet grove or cell smollett mr dinsmore was pacing the front veranda enjoying the cool fresh morning air when little feet came pattering through the hall and a sweet child voice hailed him with good morning my dear grandpa ah grandpa's little cricket where were you last evening he asked sitting down and taking her on his knee it was his pet name for vi because she was so merry the fair face flushed but putting her arms about his neck her lips to his ear i was in mamma's dressing-room grandpa she whispered i was obliged to stay there cause i'd been naughty and disobeyed mamma ah i am sorry to hear that but i hope you don't intend to disobey any more no indeed grandpa are you considered good enough to go with us today yes grandpa 
Mamma says I was punished yesterday, and I don't be punished twice for the same thing. Mamma is quite right, he said, and Grandpa is very glad she allows you to go. I don't think I deserve it, Grandpa, but she's such a dear, kind Mamma. So she is, pet, and I hope you will always be a dear, good daughter to her, said Grandpa, holding the little face close to his. Mita was not allowed to come down for breakfast. Vi missed her from the table and at prayers, and going up to Mrs. Carrington, asked, Is Mita sick, Aunt Sophie? No, dear, but she has been too naughty to be with us. I have said she must stay in her own room all day. And not go to the picnic? Oh, please let her go, Auntie. The other children joined their entreaties to Vi's, but without avail and with streaming eyes Mita at her window saw the embarkation and watched the boats glide away till lost to view in the distance too bad she sobbed it's too too bad that i must stay here and learn long hard lessons while all the rest are having such a good time then she thought remorsefully of her mother's sad look as she bade her good-bye and said how sorry she was to be obliged to leave her behind and as some atonement set to work diligently at her tasks the weather was very fine the sun shone the birds filled the air with melody and a delicious breeze danced in the treetops rippled the water and played with the brown and golden ringlets of little elsie and vi and the flaxen curls of daisy carrington the combined influences of the clear pure air the pleasant motion as the rowers bent to their oars and the lovely scenery meeting the eye at every turn were not to be resisted and all young and old were soon in gayest spirits they sang songs cracked jokes told anecdotes and were altogether a very merry company after a delightful row of two hours or more the rounding of a point brought suddenly into view the place of their destination the boats were made fast and the party stepped ashore followed by the men servants bearing rugs and wraps and several large well-filled hampers of provisions with joyous shouts the children ran hither and thither the boys tumbled on the grass the girls gathered great bouquets of the beautiful flowers twisted them in their curls and wore garlands for their hats walk up to de house ladies and gentlemen massa and missus not at home now but be very glad to see you when de gets back says a pleasant voice close at hand all but mr lilburn looked about for the speaker wondered at seeing no one then laughed at themselves for being so often and so easily deceived suppose we accept the invitation said mr travilla leading the way the two old ladies preferred a seat under a wide spreading tree on the lawn but the others accompanied him in a tour of the deserted mansion already falling rapidly to decay they climbed the creaking stairs passed along the silent corridors looked into the empty rooms and out of the broken windows upon the flower gardens once trim and gay now choked with rubbish and overgrown with weeds and sighed over the desolations of war Plenty of dry branches strewed the ground in a bit of woods, but a few rods distant Some of these were quickly gathered and a brightly blazing fire presently crackled upon the hearth and roared up the wide chimney Leaving the house which in its loneliness and dilapidation inspired only feelings of sadness and gloom Our party wandered over the grounds still beautiful even in their forlornly neglected state the domain was extensive and the older boys having taken an opposite direction from their parents were presently out of their sight and hearing the house being directly between Uncle Joe however was with the lads so no anxiety was felt for their safety Wandering on they came to a stream of limpid water flowing between high grassy banks and spanned by a little rustic bridge Let's cross over said Herbert that's such a pretty bridge and it looks lovely on the other side No, no, tain't safe boys. Don't you go for to try it exclaimed uncle Joe Pooh, what do you know about it returned Herbert who always had great confidence in his own opinion? If it won't bear us all at once it certainly will one at a time 
what do you say ed i think uncle joe can judge better whether it's safe than little boys like us don't you believe it his eyes are getting old and he can't see half so well as you or i i can see dat some of de planks is gone mas herbert and de old timbers look shaky shaky nonsense they'll not shake under my weight and i'm going to cross now herbie don't you do it said his brother you know mamma wouldn't allow it if she was here twon't be disobedience though as she isn't here and never has forbidden me to go on that bridge persisted herbert mamma and papa say that truly obedient children don't do what their parents would forbid if they were present said eddie i say nobody but a coward would be afraid to venture on that bridge said herbert ignoring eddie's last remark suppose it should break and let you fall the worst would be a ducking the water's deep mas herbert and you might get drownded said uncle joe or maybe some of dem timbers fall on you and break your leg or your back they were now close to the bridge it's very high up above the water said harry and a good many boards are off i'd be afraid to go on it coward sneered his brother are you afraid too ed yes i'm afraid to disobey my father because that's disobeying god did your father ever say a word about not going on this bridge no but he's told me never to run into danger needlessly that is when there's nothing to be gained by it for myself or anybody else before i'd be such a coward muttered herbert deliberately walking on to the bridge the other two boys watched his movements in trembling breathless silence while uncle joe began looking about for some means of rescue in case of accident herbert picked his way carefully over the half rotten timbers till he had gained the middle of the bridge then stopped looked back at his companions and pulling off his cap waved it around his head hooray here i am who's afraid who was right this time then leaning over the low railing oh he cried you ought just to see the fish splendid big fellows come on boys and look at em but at that instant the treacherous railing gave way with a loud crack and with a wild scream for help over he went head foremost falling with a sudden plunge into the water and disappearing at once beneath the surface oh he'll drown he'll drown shrieked harry wringing his hands while eddie echoed the cry for help run to the house ma said and fetch some of the boys to get him out said uncle joe hurrying to the edge of the stream with an old fishing rod he had found lying among the weeds on its bank but a dark object sprang past him plunged into the stream and as herbert rose to the surface seized him by the coat collar and so holding his head above water swam with him to the shore good bruno brave fellow good dog said a voice near at hand and turning to look for the speaker uncle joe found mr daly standing by his side leaving his gayer companions the minister had wandered away book in hand to this sequestered spot together he and uncle joe assisted the dog to drag herbert up the bank and laid him on the grass the fall had stunned the boy but now consciousness returned i'm not hurt he said opening his eyes but don't tell mother she'll be frightened half to death we'll save her as much as we can and i hope you've learned a lesson young sir and will not be so foolhardy another time said mr daly perhaps he'll tink old folks not such fools next time remarked uncle joe bless de lord that he didn't get drownded the men and boys came running from the house bringing cloaks and shawls to wrap about the dripping boy they would have carried him back with them but he stoutly resisted declaring himself quite as able to walk as anybody let him do so the exercise will help to prevent his taking cold provided he is well wrapped up said mr daly throwing a cloak over the lad's shoulders and folding it carefully about him ill news flies fast says the proverb mrs carrington met them upon the threshold pale and trembling with affright she clasped her boy in her arms with a heart too full for utterance never mind mother he said i've only taken a ducking that's all but it may not be all you may get your death of cold she said i've no dry clothes for you here 
By this time the whole party had hurried to the spot Here's a good fire suppose we hang him up to dry before it said old mr. Dinsmore with a grim smile His clothes rather rolling him up in cloaks and shawls in the meantime Suggested Herbert's grandmother let us ladies go back to the lawn and leave his uncle to oversee the business Herbert had spoiled his holiday so far as the remainder of the visit to this old estate was concerned He could not join the others at the feast presently spread under the trees on the lawn or in the sports that followed But had to pass the time lying idly on a pallet beside the fire with nothing to entertain him But his own thoughts and watching the servants until their work done they too wandered away in search of amusement most of the afternoon was spent by the gentlemen in fishing in that same stream into which Herbert's folly and self-conceit had plunged him. Eddie had his own little fishing rod, and with it in his hand sat on a log beside his father, a little apart from the rest, patiently waiting for the fish to bite. Mr. Travilla had thrown several out upon the grass, but Eddie's bait did not seem to attract a single one. He began to grow weary of sitting still and silent and creeping closer to his father whispered Papa I'm tired and I want to ask you something. Do you think the fish will hear if I speak low? Perhaps not you may try it if you like returned mr. Travilla looking somewhat amused Thank you papa. Well Herbert said nobody but a coward would be afraid to go on that bridge Do you think he was right papa? No, my boy but if you had gone upon it to avoid being laughed at or called a coward I should say you showed a great lack of true courage He is a brave man or boy who dares to do right without regard to consequences But papa if you'd been there and said I might if I wanted to Hardly a supposable case my son Well if I'd been a man and could do as I chose Men have no more right to do as they please than boys they must obey God if his will is theirs They may do as they please just as you may if it is your pleasure to be good and obedient Papa I don't understand does God say we must not go into dangerous places He says thou shalt not kill we have no right to kill ourselves or to run the risk of doing so merely for amusement or to be considered brave or dexterous But if somebody needs us to do it to save them from being hurt or killed papa Then it becomes quite a different matter It is brave generous and right to risk our own life or limbs to save those of others Then I may do it papa. Yes, my son Jesus laid down his life to save others and in all things he is to be our example a hand was laid lightly on the shoulder of each and a sweet voice said may my boy heed his father's instructions in this and in everything else Wife mr. Travilla said turning to look up in the fair face bent over them Mamma dear mamma. I do mean to said Eddie Is it not time to go home she asked the little ones are growing weary? Yes, the Sun is getting low in a few moments the whole party had re-embarked in less exuberant spirits than in the morning yet perhaps not less happy Less disposed to talk but with hearts filled with a quiet peaceful content Viamede was reached without incident a bountiful supper awaiting them there partaken of with keen appetites and the little ones went gladly to bed returning from the nursery to the drawing-room Elsie found her namesake daughter sitting apart in a bay window Silently gazing out over the beautiful landscape sleeping in the moonlight She looked up with a smile as her mother took a seat by her side and passed an arm about her waist Isn't it lovely mamma see how the waters of our lakelet shine in the moonbeams like molten silver and the fields the groves the hills how charming they look in the soft light Yes, darling, and that was what you were thinking of sitting here alone Yes, mamma and of how good God is to give us this lovely home and dear kind father and mother to take care of us It is always so sweet to come back to my home when I've been away I was enjoying it all the way coming in the boat tonight that and thinking of the glad time 
when we shall all be gathered into the lovelier home Jesus is preparing for us God grant we may said the mother with emotion It's my heart's desire and prayer to God for all my dear ones especially my children I Have not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him End of chapter 28 End of Elsie's Motherhood by Martha Finley